Chapter 101. The Sword That Split the Heavens. Part 4. Jeffers was taken aback. Azel hadn't moved. Yet a beam of light came down at angle from the sky towards him. If Laura hadn't acted, he would have suffered a direct hit. When Jeffers realized this fact, he shuddered. Azel appeared in front of him like a phantom. Bastard. Jeffers lashed out with his sword in surprise. He was the descendant of Almeric, who was called, the sword that parts a storm. Instead of being a magician, he was a swordsman, who practiced the dragon arts. The sword strike infused with powerful dragon demon magic cut through Azel. Clone. However, it was a fake. In a flash, Azel was split into three. He attacked Laura, Kieran and Jeffers at the same time. None of the three dragon demon were able to locate Azel's real body, so they lashed out against the opponent in front of them with their full strength. Amongst the three, the real Azel was the one to attack Kieran. Or they were under that false assumption. The terrifying sound of flesh being cut rang out as blood fountained into the air. Before the first scream could die down, the sound of steel being used was heard continuously followed by the the sound of destruction. Then the screams rang out one after another. He wasn't aiming for us. Kieran was a beat late in assessing the situation. The one to attack Kieran had also been a clone. The magic was very intricate, and there been enough resistance in cutting the clone's flesh that he had mistaken it for the real body. However, while the three dragon demons were focused on the clones, Azel had attacked their subordinates in the rear. Kieran no longer hesitated. Dragon demon weapon. Bleeding star. A red light was emitted from him as Kieran revealed the dragon demon weapon passed down to him by Baldazark, who used to be one of the four great dragon demon generals. At a glance, it looked like a crystal ball, which was as big as a child's head. However, at the center of the weapon, one could see several thousand layer of threads made out of light. It was dizzying to see such a tangle of threads as they wriggled around. From the surface, it was letting out a blood-colored light, and the threads of light started to rapid flow into the surrounding. Duke Almeric. Understood. I order using the authority granted to me by my great name. Return form the eternal battlefield. Dragon demon weapon. Stormblade. Accompanying a blast of wind, a large sword appeared. It looked to be made from a transparent material like glass, and it started to burn with blue flame when Jeffers took hold of it. Azel didn't care if they brought out the drag demon weapons or not. He was creating havoc within the ranks of the dragon demon king worshippers. All the combatants gathered there had considerable amount of martial powers, but they were like scarecrows in front of Azel. The three dragon demons carrying dragon demon weapons went forth to stop Azel. However, they were also swept up into the chaos. Which one is the real one? Laura mumbled as if she was groaning. Azel was multiplying as time passed. Every time he used the instantaneous movement to evade, a new clone appeared. Moreover, all the clones possessed a presence that made it was impossible to tell which one was the real body. These clones were even able to use physical attacks to take down the enemies. What if they use the dragon demon weapon to discern the real body of Azel? This was another foolish idea. The dragon demon weapon called the the sword that split the heavens was freely being passed amongst Azel's real body and clones. Azel was using this special property to the fullest extent as he continuously moved the location of the dragon demon weapon as he continued his slaughter. I guess enough of you have gathered in one place. At some point, the dragon demon king worshippers heard Azel's low voice, and they felt terror wash over them. In a flash, Azel's clones collapsed on itself, and Azel appeared outside of the perimeter of the dragon demon king worshippers. He emitted a frightening lightning strike. Kieran was dismayed. We've been had. Everyone scatter. Azel had made several dozen clones, yet they hadn't been created to take down all the dragon demon king worshippers. Even Azel couldn't create and maintain such a high number of clones. There was a limit on how much offensive capability he could allocate to each clone. Moreover, the elite troops of the Dragon Demon King worshippers were doing quite well in weathering Azel's surprise attack. The only ones to be taken down were the ones that came across the Dragon Macon. In the end, only ten were taken out of battle, 
and the rest were injured. Azel had wanted to cause chaos. He used the chaos to control the movements of his enemies. Azel's plan was carried out perfectly. Kieran realized that his allies had been maintaining a perimeter for defense, but they were now concentrated in a single location. It is too late. Azel put on a smile of satisfaction as he brought down his sword. Horn of the Thunder Dragon. The intense thunder, which was reminiscent of a dragon's roar, swallowed up the dragon demon king worshippers. While her sight was burning white from the intense thunder strike, Laura was swept up by a strong sense of deja vu. Her mission had been a failure when Azel had interfered. After the failed mission, she had returned to her family house to meet someone. This being was the oldest elder within the plane of darkness. During the Dragon Demon War, this being caused fear and chaos within the ranks of humans just by appearing in front of them. She had talked to this being about Azel. Maybe this is the start of fate repeating itself again. At the time, Laura hadn't fully understood what this being was talking about. Even amongst the standard of dragon demons, this being had lived a very long life, and the way he saw and thought about the world was very alien. He smiled as he looked at the conflicted Laura. Unfortunately, you are a child, who had everything taken away to mold you into Ornsaurus's heir. When the day we've been waiting for come, I might be able to wake up from my sleep. At that time, you'll have all your answer. At this time, I cannot tell you everything. Instead, I'll show you a memory that you will need. Then he showed her the far distant past by showing her his memory of the Dragon Demon War. This knowledge wasn't passed down to her by words. It hadn't been shown through the records. He pushed the memory from his mind into Laura. She experienced it as a daydream. This allowed Laura to experience the past as if she was actually there. She had the memory of an experience she had never experienced before, but it made her feel a sense of deja vu right now. The man with the swirling red hair, the sword, and the overwhelming thunderstrike. It was identical to what she saw within the memory of the Dragon Demon War. Azel Karzak, the man who will have the chance reverse the fate of the king. Her mumbled words were drowned out by the explosion created by the thunderstrike. Even she couldn't hear her own words. The white explosion created by the thunder faded away. Kook. Shit. Kieran's fists were shaking. He had been barely able to block the attack. If he hadn't called out his dragon demon weapon, and if Laura hadn't used her Vitten's chalice, which had an insanely high defensive capability, their party would have been decimated from a single strike. However, he was only able to protect only his immediate vicinity. At that moment, Kieran hadn't realized it yet, but half of his troop of 100 was killed. Their corpses weren't even left behind. Moreover, even amongst the survivors, only half of them were able to fight. Kieran mumbled to himself as if he couldn't believe what had just happened. Could it be? Is he Azel Kazark reborn? From an early age, he had heard countless stories about the Dragon Demon War. He was actually fed up with it. He was told about how great his grandfather Baldazark was. Moreover, he was told stories about Azel Kazark, who had killed Baldazark. He was told how frightening and terrible Azel was. The Azel of right now reminded him of the Azel within the story. Each of the elements that had contributed to make Azel into such a powerful martial might could be seen now. It was as if the Azel of the past was reborn. At that moment, an explosion rang out from the side. Kieran looked towards the direction in surprise, and he saw Azel clashing with Jeffers. Him. It seems your mental fortitude isn't too bad. Azel hadn't let up after unleashing a calamity-level attack on his enemies. He had killed several survivors, who were standing there dumbfounded. Then he ambushed Jeffers. However, Jeffers blocked the attack as if he had expected an ambush. How dare you ambush me this way? Did you really think it'll work on me? Still, you'll say those bold words but your expression says otherwise. Azel taunted Jeffers. In truth, Jeffers was trying to hide his fear by using his bluster. Unlike his imposing voice, his expression was rigid as cold sweat ran down his body. Anyways, Azel suddenly tilted his head in puzzlement as he asked a question. I'm really curious about this, so please don't misunderstand my intentions. Just hear me out. I just want to confirm it again. 
Are you sure you are Almeric's descendant? Why are you spouting that nonsense again? Are you trying to insult me? No matter how I see it, it doesn't seem like you are lying about it. At the very least, you believe it is true. How strange. I'm having a hard time discerning the secret design behind this move. What did you just say? Kieran went over his thoughts as he looked at Azel. Is it a clone or the real body? The Azel, who was clashing violently with Jeffers, didn't hold the blue dragon maken anymore. He held the dragon sword. Its white blade was made from dragon bone. However, he had been tricked time and time again, so it stopped him from coming up with a swift judgment. At that moment, Kieran thought he was being cautious with his actions, but even this hesitation was induced by Azel. Before he could come up with a plan of action, Azel moved first. More clones with substance appeared as they attacked the Dragon Demon King worshippers. On top of it all, Kieran's worst-case scenario came to pass. What the hell? He can clone the Dragon Demon weapon. All of Azel's clones were holding the Dragon Maken. Each Dragon Maken was letting out a resonance of Dragon Demon magic, so one couldn't tell which one was the rarely one. Moreover, one of the clone was aiming for the fallen Niberus, who was being attended by one of her subordinate. Niberus. Kieran moved without any thoughts on his own self-preservation. He let his own dragon demon weapon block the attack heading towards him, and he stood in front of Niberus. Kieran felt a pain intense pain. He had received a deep wound. The pain was so intense that Kieran wasn't able to let out a scream. He used his dragon demon magic indiscriminately. He didn't even have the time to properly shape his magic. He just formed powerful image in his mind, and he let out dragon demon magic like a whirlwind. This choice of action might lead to his death, but he didn't have the luxury to be picky. At the same time, he recalled his dragon demon weapon, which was blocking Azel's attack from where Kieran's original location. If he had his dragon demon weapon, he would be able to block consecutive attacks from Azel. However, the expected follow-up attack never arrived. After a brief moment, Kieran was able to recover his senses, and he used magic to stop the bleeding. He assessed his surrounding. Azel was in a fight against Jeffers. Jeffers' dragon demon weapon and Azel's dragon sword was being swung in a splendid style. Sparks and shockwave exploded forth when their swords impacted on each other. At a glance, it looked like an even fight, but if one was more careful in one's observation, one could tell this wasn't so. Moreover, it was weird that these two beings were fighting in such a manner. Duke Almeric, why are you using your dragon arts? Chapter 102, The Sword That Split the Heavens. Part 5. Jeffers was a powerful dragon arts practitioner, and he was holding a dragon demon weapon in his hand. Therefore, he shouldn't be fighting a normal sword fight with Azel. Every swing should be flattening the surrounding as if a typhoon had descended upon the land. However, he wasn't able to do so. Since Kieran was a magician, he couldn't see through the problem, but he could tell something was wrong by looking at Jeffers' expression. Azel was perfectly controlling Jeffers' movements. Jeffers was somehow able to match each sword strike, but he was being overwhelmed in all other aspects. He tried to raise his dragon demon key, and it was as if Azel had been waiting for it. Jeffers' energy pulse was cut off. If he tried to use the power of the dragon demon weapon, it was interfered with. Jeffers was adept at using the flow of power. Most of his moves required amplification. It was needed to create burst damage, yet it was being sealed. This situation was a nightmare for Jeffers. Him. Who the hell is this bastard? Jeffers was a mystery he couldn't solve, so Azel furrowed his brows. Azel was trying to confirm something in this sword battle. Instead of focusing on killing his enemy, Azel was obsessing over the question he had. It was very foolish thing to do, yet Azel couldn't help himself. He decided he had to figure out if there was some secret design being carried out by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. However, Azel wouldn't be able to find the answer by fighting him. Jeffers Almeric's existence was a puzzle that couldn't be solved by Azel. Chiron sent a whispering towards Azel. How long are you going to play with him? It isn't the time to play around right now. Chiron was protecting Euron as he fought against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. 
Azel had blown away most of the enemy's forces, so it wasn't difficult for Chiron to face the remaining troops. However, Laura gave intermittent assistance to the troops, so Chiron was at a disadvantage. Azel sighed at those words. Yes, in the end, I can't solve this problem right now. What are you talking about about? While Jeffers furrowed his brows, Azel took a big leap backwards. The summon of the dragon Macon had reached its limit. At the very least, he wouldn't be able to summon it again in this battle. It would be impossible for him to kill all of them with overwhelming force. He had to incrementally cause confusion, and this would cause his opponents to reveal their weak points. At that moment, a being ran past Azel to attack Jeffers. It was Leticia. I'll take this guy. This bastard. No. I have a debt to settle with this bastard's bloodline. Him. Anyways, it seems you have your own opponent you will have to deal with. As if she didn't have any more words for him, Leticia turned her head away. While Azel was taken aback by her actions, someone rushed towards Azel as he brought down a black sword. The white dragon's sword and the black sword, which was a nexus of darkness magic, clashed against each other. A clear sound rang out. Azel looked at the black swordsman Duran, who was letting out a fearsome killing intent. Ah, I guess I have to settle my debt against you. In the previous battle with Niberus, Azel had suffered under the hands of Duran. It was an unforgettable memory. Azel's fighting spirit burned as he assessed Duran's battle capability. After the first clash, the two of them exchanged five moves in a flash. When they disengaged from each other, Zell had a decent idea about the other man's power level. He's a septuple master. He is the strongest spirit order practitioner I've met in this era. According to Chiron, the Rulan kingdom also possessed a high rank spirit order practitioner. Viscount Haven was the kingdom's greatest swordsman, and his skills were even acknowledged by Chiron. However, Azel hadn't had the opportunity to meet him. While he was staying at the Dukedom of Tarantos, the most accomplished spirit order practitioner he met was a sextuple master. Moreover, every time one added a ring the difficulty of progressing to the next ring increased. Duran was at a level where Azel considered him to be the top spirit order practitioner he had personally met in this era. On the other hand, Duran was shaken to the core when he looked at Azel. What did this runt do? Even if he did go through the dragon slayer's ritual, how could he have gone through such a rapid growth? Duran had never gone through the dragon slayer ritual before. However, as an officer living inside the plane of darkness, he was allowed access to the knowledge about the dragon slayer's ritual. Even if one did had experienced a successful dragon slayer's ritual, Azel's growth rate couldn't be explained. He can now rival my power. No, could it be higher than mine? Duran wasn't able to get a measure of Azel's fighting power. Since he assumed Azel wasn't able to see assess him either, Duran didn't consider this occurrence to be strange. It was something that happened quite often amongst spirit order practitioners of similar level. Duran shook off his confusion, and he yelled out in anger. How dare a sinner harm the Miss Precious Body? I'll send you to hell. You have such a great slave mentality that I'm in awe. You are a fool that doesn't know the truth. I won't forgive your transgression. Actually, I have a question I want to ask you. Azel asked his question as he blocked Duran's violent attacks. Azel wasn't being pressed into a corner. Azel didn't show any urgency, and his attitude made Duran's eyebrows twitch. Were you perhaps a talent grown from within the ranks of the Dragon Demon King worshippers? Azel still couldn't understand why humans of this era chose to become Dragon Demon King worshippers. However, if the person grew up from within the organization of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, he could somewhat understand how it could happen. Duran snorted at Azel's conjecture. I was saved by a benefactor, and he blessed me with the knowledge, which allowed me to find the correct path. Him. So you weren't originally a Dragon Demon King worshipper. You chose to become one. Why? The Dragon Demon War ended a long time ago, and it is the era where humans reign. So why do you worship a phantom from the past? His teaching is the real truth. Our God may be considered to be history after his death, but our worship for him hasn't ended yet. We have to fight in the darkness until our Savior returns. This is the tribulation the believers have to bear. 
How is his teaching the correct one? Do you really relish the idea where the dragon demons rule over the humans? Don't make me laugh. The evil that has to be fixed in the world is the humans' domination of this world. What? One's ability doesn't matter to humans. Good and evil doesn't matter either. The only thing that matter is bloodlines. Just because one is born from better parents. These irredeemable trashes look down and steps on the other humans based on their bloodlines. How is that just? We aren't talking about beings born from another race. Humans use other humans to build up their destiny. They do this by controlling, dominating and exploiting those of the same race. How can you say this world order is just? While Azel listened to Duran's words, he knew that he would never be able to bridge the emotional distance he felt with Duran. Duran's voice was filled with hate and sadness that won't be erased in his lifetime. Azel didn't know what kind of life Duran had led. However, spirit order practitioners dealt with the mind. Even amongst high-level spirit order practitioners, one could get a glimpse of the underlying truth of the other using one's will. Is it because he is a religious fanatic? Azel had seen countless variation of shortcomings expressed by humans. He saw humans betray each other in order to live. In front of reality that was unbearable, he saw the minds of humans break as they searched for refuge. No, he is different. This man, Azel had seen people like Duran before. During the Dragon Demon War, the environment made it easy for humans to hate on other humans. It wouldn't be too hard to become inflamed by the action of humans. It was easy to see why one could hate, scorn and give up on the humans. In extreme situations, humans had the capacity to become feeble-minded and unsightly. Azel also had despised many humans, and he had given up on them. However, he was also able to find humans he was able to love. How miraculous was that? A human, who didn't love the world made by humans, was standing in front of him. It wasn't strange to see such an occurrence. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had despised the system he was affiliated with. He had raged as he looked at the stupid and self-centered humans above him. In such an unreasonable situation, he had struggled for a solution to do away with the difficulty he faced. However, what if the difficulty and unreasonableness had been so huge that Azel hadn't been able to overcome it? What if Azel didn't have the power, talent or luck to cause change? He would basically be trampled by his own fate. What would he have been like in such a situation? I see. Azel finally received an answer to his question. During the Dragon Demon War, there were Dragon Demons, who had loved humans. They hadn't agreed with the will of the Dragon Demon King. They betrayed their own race to stand with the humans. Then there were the opposite case. There were humans who were filled with so much hate, that they agreed with the will of the Dragon Demon King. These humans joined the Dragon Demon Army. The Dragon Demon King was dead, and it had been 200 years since the end of the Dragon Demon War. However, the social composition hadn't changed. It was still too easy for the humans to hate other humans. When one faced an unreasonable amount of adversity in this world, it wasn't strange to see some people consider the worship of the Dragon Demon King as a solution. Didn't you say your name was Duran? It has been a long time I've seen someone like you. A long time. This is the first time I've seen someone like you, you sinner of a runt. I didn't mean it that way. It's just. It is a bit sad. Although, the whole situation is ridiculous. What are you talking about? If you want to understand, we'll need to have a long conversation. However, I'm sure that will never happen. I wanted to create a world where people no longer despaired. I fought hard for for the change, and the calamity in front of humanity was averted. However, human nature remained the same. Azel put on a bitter smile, and he became unyielding. Azel had barely moved, while blocking all of Duran's attack. However, his iron defense was slowly transitioning into offense. At a certain point, the white blade and the black blade was entwined with each other. Duran's shoulder guard was sent flying. Who is this runt? Duran was taken aback. He hadn't been able to see Azel's previous sword strike. By looking at the trajectory of the strike, their swords should have clashed against each other. However, Duran's sword strike hit empty air. In the next moment, it was as if time had skipped. 
The intermediate step was omitted, and Azul's sword was seeking out his neck. If he only relied on his reflex, his head would have been severed. However, he used a secret technique, which had been passed down to him from the plane of darkness. If his consciousness was messed with by an enemy, a defensive mechanism drilled into his body would activate to save his his life. Basically, while Azel was participating in a high-speed battle, he had attacked Duran's mind. Duran's consciousness was altered. Duran had thought he had a perfect defense against such an attack, yet Azel's technique was too intricate. Sparks flew as the tide of the battle changed. When Azel had been on defense, his speed had been slower than Duran. However, his incredible insight had allowed Azel to cut off the secret techniques of the spirit order being attempted to be used by Duran. Moreover, Azel was able to predict the destination of each sword strike, so he used the minimal amount of movement to deflect the sword strikes. However, Azel's movements were incrementally getting faster. In all facets of the battle, Azel was overtaking Duran, and he was slowly taking away Duran's options. No, I was mistaken. This is. Duran soon realized he was under a misperception. Azel wasn't moving faster. Duran was moving slower. Chapter 103. The Sword That Split the Heavens. Part 6. He hadn't realized he had suffered a mental attack up until a moment ago. He hardened his mental barrier in response, and he put a very skillful lock over this barrier. When he felt the movement of his body slacken a little bit, he continuously changed his mental defensive pattern to protect his mind. However, Azel started to slowly deceive his sense again. In all he did, Duran's reaction was incrementally getting slower. His eyes took in the sight. The information was processed, and he tried to decide on how to respond. Still, he still found that he was slightly slower than he ought to be, and Duran was at a disadvantage. Where is he attacking me from? He was sure his mind was being attacked from some angle. He had thought he had blocked every avenue that could be used to attack his mind. So how was Azel doing this? Azel spoke as Duran was gripped in his confusion. As expected, there are techniques that I don't know about. You used a technique that uses reflexive response, which doesn't require the control of the conscious mind. This technique didn't exist in the Dragon Demon War. Since it isn't a forgotten secret technique, I'm guessing it was developed afterwards. Giles and Bohr had also used similar techniques. The movement was independent from the order given by one's mind. The reflexive responses were engraved into the body, and it could be used to reach the state of detachment. One would be able to reach peak efficiency in one's movements. Azel didn't know any technique that dealt with such concepts. You were superb. You remind me of a spirit order practitioner I met a long time ago. However, you haven't completely mastered the meaning behind the concept of seeing. What? It was unbelievable, but Duran's side was split open as blood fountained forth. In a flash, Duran realized his sight had been narrowed to the extreme. It wasn't just his sight. All of his senses were hyper-focused on Azel, who was in front of him. This had created a blind spot in his senses. Normally, he wouldn't allow such a thing to happen. When his vision suddenly dimmed to a pin prick, he came to an understanding. It hadn't just been his sight. All his senses had been focused on the Azel in front of him. This act had created a blind spot in his senses that would have never existed in normal times. When his weak point was revealed, Azel's clone had appeared next to Duran, and it had stabbed him. Azel retracted his clone. He spoke as he walked past the falling Duran. You only focused on the opponent in front of you. This is the reason behind your death. Seeing. I see. Vision. No. You manipulated me into paying attention only to you. Duran was on his knees. His mumbled words sounded like a groan. He was also a high rank spirit order practitioner. Azel had given him a small hint, yet he was able to figure out why he had lost. When a person only focuses on a target in front of oneself, one's field of vision became narrowed. Even a person, who normally looks at his surrounding, would become preoccupied by a sword coming towards one's body from the front. If one frantically blocked the incoming sword strikes, one would have no idea what was going on in the back or the side of oneself. Azel had used this characteristic to his advantage. 
He used the fact that they were looking into each other's eyes, and he mixed in allusions to cause minor errors in how Duran perceived his movements. He used this tactic to fluster Duran, and at the same time, he ate away at Duran's sense using his mental wave. He made it so that Duran became solely focused in blocking his attack. When he confirmed there was a big blind spot formed in Duran's senses, Azel used his clone to deliver a critical blow. This man is a monster. I can't do anything. Duran shuddered when he realized the gulf between Azel and himself. However, he couldn't just fall like this. Even if it was a hopeless situation, he had to get up. No way. I cannot fall here. Miss. My mistress. His wound was too deep. The sword had cut through his bones, and it had even punctured his heart. He had no answer for this. Moreover, there had been a curse-like power within Azel's sword. It made a mess of the flow of his magical energy within his body. He couldn't even use spirit order to stem his bleeding. Sibane Nim. I was incapable of. Your daughter. I wasn't able to protect here. I'm sore. Duran crumpled before he could finish his words. Nibiris was lying on the floor, and she couldn't even move the tips of her fingers. She had suffered too serious of an injury. Even if she focused on healing, she wouldn't be healed enough to re-enter the battle. While she was in such a state, their situation was getting worse by the minute. Duran. When Duran died, Nibiris knew it. He had been a human saved by her father, Sibane. He had repeatedly distinguished himself in battle, and Duran had risen to a rank where all the dragon demons respected him. In truth, he wasn't someone she could order around as if he was an underling beneath her. However, he insisted on acting like a subordinate, because he wanted to repay the favor shown to him by Sibane. He tried his best to help her in any way. Since she was born to a noble bloodline, she had grown up with everything at her beck and call. She took his devotion for granted. Moreover, at times, he had an attitude of monitoring her as if she was a child playing near water. She had been annoyed by his mothering, and she considered him to be bothersome. However, her heart was hurting right now. This was the first time she had experienced something like this since she became an adult. This was the first time she had shed tears for losing someone. Don't be sorry. There is no reason why you should feel sorry. For the first time in her life, she hated her own incompetence. It wasn't as if this was the first time she found her abilities to be deficient. In the past, her pride had taken a big hit when she failed her mission thanks to Rizel. She became self-aware that her abilities were lacking, so she had dedicated to retraining herself. However, it hadn't been enough. She had lost again. If it was her past self, her pride would have gotten hurt again, and she would have lashed out in anger. However, she hated her own deficiency so much that she couldn't stand herself. It was the reality that she hadn't been able to do anything when someone devoted to her had lost his life. It hurt more than her impending death. Guardian shadows. Even they are here. While Azel was sweeping through his enemies like a gale, the guardian shadows appeared as they used the dragon sword duke as a marker they could trace. The dragon demon king worshippers were already in poor shape, yet they had lost the numerical advantage. They were now being trampled. Nibirus. Even in such a situation where she couldn't do anything, there was a voice murmuring towards her. Kieran Baldazark. He was the heir to the great dragon demon general Baldazark. He was the most talented of his generation to be produced from the plane of darkness. He was a competitor, who threatened her standing. You, at the very least, you must. She knew why he struggled to speak even as his voice was filled with pain. She even saw him shedding tears for her. She also knew why he hadn't hesitated in using his body to shield her. If she could speak, she wanted to say these words. Duke Baldazark, you were always a crier. After her coming-of-age ceremony, Nibiris treated Kieran with a cold heart. The elders tried to trigger her competitive spirit, so they had always compared her to Kieran. It chafed her so much that she couldn't bear it. However, she always knew what emotion was in his eyes as he looked at her. He was so open about it, so how could she not know? Moreover, the relationship between the two had been completely different before they went through their coming-of-age ceremonies. Don't cry. You look like an idiot. 
You are the descendant of the great Baldazar. You've inherited such noble blood, yet your actions will besmirch your rank. Currently, he was considered to be an outstanding individual, but when he was young, he had been a weak crybaby. Unlike Niberus, Kieran had a lot of siblings vying for the honor of being Baldazark's heir. Even if he had been a crybaby, Kieran had been very talented, so his siblings subjected him to all kinds of torment. Whenever he cried, Niberus gave a stern scolding, and she was able to correct his mindset. When they were in their childhood, the two of them researched magic, and they always talked about their future. They grew close to each other. Kieran, I've never truly hated you, not even once. Their positions required them to be antagonistic towards each other. However, after establishing themselves as heirs, she had thought the two of them might have a future together. However, the elder were gripped by the fear of the world and they were overtaken by the fanaticism towards the dragon demon king. The elders damaged the progress of their relationship. Niberus. Niberus suddenly heard another voice. At the same time, she felt a spike of anger and irritation. Laura. Laura had suddenly appeared from nowhere to become her competitor. Unlike Kieran, Niberus had never met Laura during childhood. After several years after her coming-of-age ceremony, Laura had suddenly appeared out of nowhere. She had appeared when her predecessor fell by the hands of the guardian shadows. The two of them had never gotten along. The fact that they were competitors wasn't the only reason. Of course, she was annoyed by the appearance of another competitor. But she was also annoyed by the fact that she didn't know what Laura was thinking. Niberus felt bad when she looked into her eyes. It was as if Laura was able to ignore all feelings. And it felt as if Laura's eyes didn't attach any value to Niberus. Please don't die. I don't like you. No, I don't like all of you. But, still, if you die, I'll feel bad for Duke Baldazar. Niberus became angry. Even now, Laura was making her feel annoyed. Could Laura not hold herself back from annoying her even in such a situation? However, unlike her words, what Laura did next was beyond imagination. Laura had never liked Niberus. In truth, this wasn't only limited to Niberus. She disliked Kieran, Jeffers, and the Plane of Darkness. She hated everything around her. She detested the beings, who had given birth to her. She detested her upbringing, and she hated that she had become Ornsaurus's heir. However, she only knew this way of life. She was a dragon demon king worshipper, and her role as the heir of Ornsaurus solely defined who she was. The first memory Laura could recall was around the time when she looked like a four-year-old human child. She opened her eyes in a large glass tube filled with special liquid made by the alchemists. She had been completely ignorant of her own self until she was pulled out of glass TBE. She had no idea what was going on as she looked at her surrounding. You are number 47. You should remember that. Well, there is no way you'll forget it. When she came out of the glass tube, she didn't have a name. At the time, she had exactly 139 siblings, and they were all called by their numbers. For reference, there were only 139 other beings that were labeled. When she first came out, she saw 10 of her siblings not receive any numbers, and they were sent away to never to be seen again. At the time, she hadn't known what had happened to them, but now she knew. They had failed to meet some requirement, so they were scrapped. You were all born with the blood of the great Ornsaurus within you. However, only one of you will inherit his name. All of her siblings were intelligent, and they had talent in magic. It had only been one year since they came out of the, the glass tubes, yet they had already learned how to speak and write. When they learned the basic knowledge, they started learning magic. Of course, a high amount of danger followed anyone who studied magic. They only had one year to learn the magic in peace. Afterwards, they were ordered to face monsters, and they were told to summon evil spirits using magic. They faced dangerous situations daily where it hadn't been surprising to see her siblings die. During this process, the number of siblings she had dropped steadily. Moreover, a variety of methods were used to measure their abilities and potential. If one failed several times at a task, one would be labeled a failed product. These beings were branded before they disappeared to an unknown location. After 10 years, 
half of their original number remained. At that point, all her sibling including herself was able to receive a name instead of a number. Laura Ornsaurus. On the day she was given her first name, Laura was swept up by an indescribable feeling. From the time she came out of the glass tube, she had always been called by a number. As her intelligence and wisdom increased, she realized how demeaning this practice was. This was why she always dreamed of the day when she received her name. She would be accepted as a legitimate and unique individual. On the day she received her name, Laura repeated her name several hundred times. It was the most she had spoken in a single day since her birth. Chapter 104 The Sword That Split the Heavens Part 7 The next day Laura realized almost half of her siblings were gone. The Chosen received their names, and the rest were culled. At that point, Laura had a good idea what they were doing. The Ornsaurus tribe had come up against their limitation. Ornsaurus was one of the four great dragon demon generals, and he was a first-generation dragon demon. Basically, he was born without parents, and his power couldn't be compared to the normal dragon demons. Even if his descendants were proud of carrying his blood, there was a clear limitation to their powers. It wasn't enough to intermarry between dragon demons. They needed a more surefire way to gain a talented successor. As expected of magicians, they came up with an insane solution. If marriage between good bloodlines weren't enough, they would just add magic to artificially make talented offsprings. This was how Laura and her siblings were born. In truth, the word, born, was an inadequate description. Artificial wombs were created using the secret arts of black magic. If one didn't use such a method, it would have been impossible to gather over 100 siblings of the same age. From the beginning, they were made to be the perfect successor of Ornsaurus. They were a product made with great care and effort. Their growth process was a period of time where their makers could check which product was defective or not. If it ended there, it would have great. However, the Orsaurus family wanted perfection. Even if there were no defects, they weren't satisfied. They merely wanted the one that transcended beyond all standards. In the end, they wanted a single exceptional being. The one that never fails will inherit his name. We don't want failures. The failures disappeared one by one. Laura knew what happened to them. In the initial phase, the unnamed ones were sent to the Black Magic Research Facility to be used as lab rats. If one had received a name, their fate was bound by black magic. They were forever forbidden to reveal themselves as they sacrificed their whole lives for the tribe. They became tools for battle. In the end, the last one standing was Laura. Congratulations. From now on, you are Laura Ornsaurus. On the day when all her siblings were gone and she was all alone, Laura became an Ornsaurus. She inherited the cursed dragon demon weapon called the Vitten's Chalice not too long after. Then she was officially introduced to the world through her coming-of-age ceremony. She had an identity in this world. Afterwards, Laura lived in an achromatic world. No, if she thought about it, she had exited her glass cage, and she had found the world to be grey. She hated everything that had surrounded her. There was nothing of worth around her. This was true for the bloodline of Ornsaurus, and it even extended to her life, which had been manufactured for her to become the heir. In such a world, the only thing that could move her hardened heart were her competition. She was unbelievably jealous of Niberus, who was able to display hate and a competitive spirit towards her. From the start of her life, Niberus never had to doubt her own existence, and she had been revered by everyone around her. Niberus had everything Laura never possessed. This was why she hated and envied Niberus. It was the same for Kieran. He grew up fighting with his numerous siblings for the honor of being the heir. This was where all the similarity ended. He was born into the world through a natural process, and he had experienced each steps of his life like a normal being. This was why Laura disliked Kieran too. However, Kieran was competent, yet in many ways, his heart was absurdly delicate. This was why she looked at him in a slightly more favorable light. He had everything he could want in this world, yet he ate his heart out as he looked at Niberus. Laura found the situation to be amusing and pitiful. Still, Kieran treated Laura like a person even though she had been thoroughly molded into being a tool. 
she had been able to feel human-like emotions through him. I'll repay my debt right now, Duke Baldazark. Laura opened her mouth as this thought crossed her mind. She walked towards the most dazzling being she had ever seen up until now. She headed towards the being that had stirred her heart. Azel Zestringer, I have a proposal for you. Laura dispersed her dragon demon weapon, and she walked towards Azel. It was as if she had a death wish. However, she had retracted her dragon demon weapon and her defensive magic. She was completely defenseless. As the white hem of her skirt fluttered, the guardian shadows charged towards her. It didn't matter what she said. They didn't show any signs of compromise in their actions. Wait a moment. Azel got in the way of the guardian shadows. When he swung his sword, the thunderbolt stretched out to stop the movement of the guardian shadows. In any battlefield, it isn't honorable to kill a defenseless person, who wants to talk. Enemy. Have to kill. At all cost. No forgiveness. That's your problem. I'll decide if I want to cut her down after I hear her story. Or are you willing to fight me to see if I'm serious? Azel spoke with a cold voice. The guardian shadows became confused as they looked at Azel. Why? We have to kill. But. He. If it was anyone other than Azel. The guardian shadows wouldn't have hesitated to carry out their attack. However. Azel might be the one they had been waiting for. He might be the one foretold in the prophecy. So they put a break to their actions. In the end. The guardian shadows whispered to each other in a heated discussion as they retreated backwards. Azel yelled out loud. Everyone stop. His voice rang out like a lion's roar. Everyone unconsciously stopped fighting. And as if it was a lie, a silence descended on the surrounding. In this unnatural silence, Laura's clear voice rang out. I'll surrender myself to you. Instead, I want you to let the rest of my group go. What? Azel was dumbfounded. Do you really think your proposal is reasonable? You may be from the bloodline of Ornsaurus, but this is revered only in the plane of darkness. Your bloodline is worthless here. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were already defeated. Their complete destruction was only a matter of time. In such a situation, why would he let everyone else go? Because Laura surrendered herself to him. The sensible move was to slaughter every Dragon Demon King worshippers. Laura spoke. I am well aware of that fact. This is why I'll give you something of equal value. What do you have that will make me spare their foolish lives? I'll give you my dragon demon weapon. Azel, who had been making sarcastic remarks, stopped breathing from the surprise he felt. It wasn't just him. All of the dragon demon king worshippers were taken aback. Duchess Ornsaurus. What are you saying? Nibirus and Kieran were in critical condition. The only one able to speak against her was Jeffers Almeric. He was so surprised that he didn't even maintain his guard against Leticia. He stared at Laura. It was a really stupid move. I just want to kill you right now. However, I'll wait and see how this turns out. How unfortunate. Leticia had used this opportunity to put the blade of her spear up against Almeric's neck. From Almeric's perspective, he had made a really silly mistake. Laura didn't pay attention to Almeric's advice as she continued to speak. I'll let you inherit my dragon demon weapon, Vitten's chalice. I believe that is more than enough to strike a bargain. Him. Azel labored over the decision. This proposal was really beyond his imagination. He had to admit it. This expressionless dragon demon girl got one over him. The dragon demon weapon could be transferred to another person only if the owner sincerely desires it. It was impossible to inherit the dragon demon weapon by killing or threatening the owner. The dragon demon weapons had a form of sentience, so it could discern the true feeling of its owner. If one stole it using threats, it would provoke an unpredictable reaction from the dragon demon weapon. Moreover, it wasn't a guaranteed she'll go through with the transfer even if Azel accepted her proposal. If she was willing to sacrifice her own life to kill Azel, the inheritance of the dragon demon weapon could. Laura spoke. I want to observe from your side. Maybe, you are the one that will give us the chance to turn back the fate of the king. What are you talking about? If you accept my proposal, I'll answer any questions you are curious about. Him. Duchess Orsaurus. Are you betraying us? Jeffers had heard enough. He grinded his teeth. From the perspective of a dragon demon king worshipper, 
Laura's proposal was unacceptable. This was a precious dragon demon weapon passed down from the dragon demon wars. How could she just give it away to an enemy? Moreover, she was planning to spill confidential information. It wasn't as if Laura knew all the secrets, yet the ones she knew could be lethal to them. All the young dragon demons here possessed the highest of pedigree. However, their duty was more important than their lives. Until the day their savior returns, they had to fulfill their duty even if it required the sacrifice of their lives. Jeffers yelled out, Don't make me laugh. This is do or die. Fight. Everyone. Kook. He couldn't finish the sentence. Leticia unhesitatingly hit his face with the flat of her spearhead. Her attack flowed like water to strike him, and Jeffers fell unconscious. Even if you fight to the death, there aren't many of you left. How ridiculous. Currently, there were only ten members of the Dragon Demon King worshippers that were in any shape to fight. If the fight started up again, they'll be slaughtered in an instant. Leticia snorted as she spoke. It does make me feel a little bit better. You there. I recommend you don't take this deal. I would love to kill this bastard right now. Him. Now that I've heard Mrs. Words, I feel the need to act in a more rational manner. Miss. Leticia had on an expression as if Azel had said something very offensive. From her appearance, she did look like a young woman. However, it had been very long, since she had been called by that term. Azel smirked as he asked her a question. Would you like to be called madam? He remember having a similar conversation before. At the time, he had been speaking to the dragon demon king worshipper named Regina. Leticia answered him. If you want to die, you can call me that. What a scary miss. Azel shrugged his shoulder then he looked at Laura. He looked at her to read her true intentions, but he couldn't. There was no expression on Laura's face, and there were barely any emotions revealed in her eyes. All right, I'll accept your proposal. However, I have a condition. What is your condition? I want you to incinerate all the dead bodies here with your hands. At those words, the dragon demon king worshippers became restless. Even Laura showed signs of unrest. However, Azel was adamant. If I let them take the intact corpses, won't your side bring back the useful members as undeads? I'm used to destroying beings returned from the dead, but it isn't as if I enjoy doing it. All right. Laura nodded her head slightly. Azel spoke. I want the survivors to be gathered, and they can run away like dogs with their tails lit on fire. I'll give you all three minutes for everyone to get out of my sight. Moreover, Azel looked at Kieran, who had wrapped his body around Niberus. If you want to say something, I want you to speak it out loud. I don't like little dragon demons talking in secret. This situation has deteriorated too much for me to feign ignorance. If you are recovered enough to use whispering, you should be able to speak it out loud. How? Kieran was surprised. He had been secretly whispering towards Laura, yet Azel seemed to have sensed it. Azel spoke. I accepted her proposal. Guardian Shadows. Will you disagree and go against my decision? We don't know. Don't. Understand. But. We won't stand against. In the end, the Guardian Shadows decided to give up on opposing Azel's will. Then the dragon demon worshippers retreated as if a fissure was about to swallow them from behind. Laura created fire as she burned every single corpse to ashes. Chapter 105. The one that chose the name soaked in sin. Part 1. The old Kazark castle lay in waste. As expected of a domain gifted to the man responsible for saving the world, Azul's castle had been well made. However, 200 years had passed, and the majesty and beauty of the castle was nowhere to be seen. It was merely a horrendously destroyed ruin. Azel watched the ruins, and he was swept up by emotions that were beyond expression. Azel opened the main door to the castle. He entered into the lounge, and there were stairs on either sides leading up to the second floor. The stairs made a circle. One of the stairway was completely destroyed, and the other one was half destroyed. An old memory overlapped this sight. Young masters, young mistresses, the stairs are meant to be walked on. The steward of Count Kazark was Bazik. He was an old knight, who had participated in the Dragon Demon War. Moreover, he was a big softy when it came to the children. It was, 
because he had lost all his sons and grandchildren in the war. Azel had adopted children, and most of them were not of noble birth. This was why they were a bit short on grace and manners. They treated the fancy castle as a playground. The guardrails on the stairways were treated as slides. Children screamed as they slid down the guardrails, and it troubled Bazik. However, he could bring himself to give them a strong scolding. Marquis, please give a scolding to the young masters and young mistresses. How will they be able to make their debut in society? A. Hey, it's okay. All children act that way as they grow up. Should I try it once? In the past, I always wanted to try it when I visited a castle or a mansion. If you want my old eyes to bleed tears of blood, you can go ahead and try it. Do you realize how much gossip goes around when the count jumps out the window or climb the wall, because it is annoying to climb up and down the stairs? They are probably jealous of me since they can't do what I do. Unfortunately, half of the opinions are on your side. However, how will it look to the other nobles? How do you think it will look? It'll look cool. Count, he had exchanged countless conversations just like that. When he walked up the unstable stairway, he thought he could hear the sounds of children laughing as they slid down the rails. Azel felt tears welling up, but he pressed it down as he went up to the second floor. My God, he kept harping about how I have to invest in a good desk. I can't believe it survived. Azel had entered his office on the second floor. It was a mess inside. The ceiling and walls had fallen, and there were debris piled everywhere. The floor was also half destroyed. However, to his surprise, Azel's desk was still there. It had been exposed to rain and wind over a long period of time, so it was all rotten. However, he recognized the desk he used 220 years ago, so he marveled at it. Count, please work inside your office. I have a hard time getting things done in there. It isn't as if I'm shirking my duties. I just want to work with a little wind on my face. You can't go up there with those documents. Azel hated working in his office. It was a large room, so it often felt a bit chilly. There was a big window inside the room, and the desk had been put in front of it. He had a hard time concentrating in such a setup. This was why Azel always took his documents up to the roof, and he worked as he heard the chirping of the birds. His subordinates developed headaches, because Azel's actions were far from being noble-like. However, in the end, they just accepted it as, our lord is just like that. Ha ha ha. A dry laugh flowed out of Azel's mouth. There was no section of the castle that had remained undamaged. It was understandable, since dragons had swept through here. Still, he could still see a little bit of the outline of its original shape, and his old memories kept washing over him. Before he knew it, Azel's eyes were flowing with tears. He didn't have the presence of mind to wipe his tears, and he walked without any destination in mind. His memories and the destroyed reality in front of him overlapped with each other, and he was swept up in his memories. Teacher. Azel arrived at a gravesite behind the castle. There was no way the graves would have been left untouched by the rampaging dragons. It was a mess back there. Still, Azel was able to locate a particular grave. If I knew things would turn out like this, it might have been better not to have moved you here. It was Balf's grave. He was the teacher, who had taught Azel about absolute sense. After the dragon demon war ended, Azel had moved his remains to his castle. 220 years had passed, and many more graves had been added to this site. It had evolved into a pretty big cemetery. Balf's tombstone was destroyed, and it had been scattered to the winds. Azel was only able to find the grave, because he was intimately familiar with where it was located at. Azel spoke, I can't do anything right now, but I'll once again provide a nice grave for you. I promise. Azel wiped his tears away, and he gave his respects towards his teacher's grave. Two Laura was completely subdued, and she was being watched by Chiron. Her legs, arms and fingers were all bound meticulously. Moreover, a bit was put in her mouth, so she wouldn't be able to use any spells. Then Azel used a secret technique of spirit order to form a magical wedge. These magical wedges were placed in various locations of her energy pulse to block the flow of magical energy. There was no way Laura would be able to use her magic. 
Azel had wanted a look through the ruins of the old castle by himself, so he had left Chiron behind. It wasn't a good time to be doing such an activity. Yet Azel's poor expression stopped Chiron from arguing with him. He just told Azel to do what he had to do. I'm back. Azel returned after an hour. Chiron spoke. You came back earlier than expected. It feels like I've spent enough time there. Your expression was too heartrending. So at the very least, I thought you were going to come back tomorrow. If you were ready for such a scenario, maybe I should have taken my time in getting back here. Azel hadn't said anything before he made himself scarce. He had been gone for a pretty long time. He was thankful for Chiron being considerate of him. So Azel smirked in thanks. Then he asked a question. How are they doing? They are still recovering. Azel was referring to Euron and Leticia. They had fought against the dragon demon king worshippers, so they weren't classified as enemies. However, both groups didn't trust each other. This was true for Azel and Chiron, and it was also true for Euron and Leticia. This was why they decided to stay in different locations. They would wait until Leticia and Euron were well enough to converse. Azel spoke. He didn't look like a healer. He is probably using black magic. I believe so. Black magic was the use of magic through taking the life of living beings. If they planned on using humans as a source for their magic, Azel and Chiron would have stopped them. However, the county of Kazakh had a surplus of monsters and beasts. Chiron asked a question. Can we trust them? I don't know. I'll have to talk to them first. Personally, I am a bit interested in the Miss Dragon Majin. She seemed to be quite strong. However, the mark against her is the fact that she seems to have some dealings with black magic. They had only briefly aligned themselves with Leticia, but in that short amount of time, they could tell she was a very talented fighter. Moreover, she was a dragon magian, yet here magical resonance was on par with Chiron. However, she was also saturated with the energy of black magic. Azel shook his head from side to side. No, that's not the part that interests me. Then what? I only saw it briefly, so I can't be sure. The way she used her dragon arts looked familiar to me. Hmm, I have to confirm it with her, then I'll have a better idea. She might have a connection with an acquaintance. An acquaintance. Now I'm curious. I'll explain it to you later. Anyways, we have to take care of the business in front of us. Azel looked at Laura. Laura was bound tight, yet she waited patiently with an expressionless face. Azel took the bit out of her mouth, and she took a deep breath. We'll question you now. I hope you'll answer my questions honestly. My magical wedge is deployed, so if you lie, I'll know it. Laura's expression was so neutral that it would be hard to tell if she was lying. However, spirit order dealt with the mind. The magical wedges were placed in her energy pulse, and it allowed him to fully control her. It was easy to tell if she was telling the truth or not. Laura nodded her head slightly. Yes. Before Azel could ask a question, Chiron suddenly spoke to him. So, Azel. Yes. Doesn't this make us look? Somehow, it feels like we are the bad guys. I get where you are coming from, and I agree. However, did you really have to say that out loud? I won't hesitate if it is a straight-up fight. However, you are threatening to torture a young lady. This kind of situation is a first. Chiron scratched his cheek. From her outer appearance, Laura looked like a beautiful girl around 17 or 18 years old. She had long blonde hair, and amethyst eyes. She had lily-white skin, and she looked like a doll. Moreover, the red dress she was wearing made her look like an innocent young lady from a noble house. Azel grumbled. How is she young? She probably is older than me. Well, I guess from the Duke's perspective she is young. How old are you? It is rude to ask for a woman's age. If you don't answer me correctly, I'll treat you roughly. It does make me feel shameful for even saying those words. I'm much younger than the Dragon Sword Duke. Laura unnecessarily confirmed their suspicion about her age. Azel grumbled. I understand how you feel but please don't take the wind out of my sail. We have to be serious right now. I'm sorry. I'll keep my mouth shut. I'll ask you again. We won't ask you for your age. Wait a moment. Laura cut off Azel's words. After I answer your question, 
Do you mind if I ask you a question in return? Do you really think you are in a situation to ask me questions? However, that was the reason why I surrendered to you. Well, all right. If I think the question is decent, I'll answer it. First, what miss said to me? Laura. Ha, huh, my name. It is Laura. Please call me by my name. Laura Ornsaurus. Please leave the Ornsaurus out. Your demands are getting quite numerous. All right, Laura. As Azel conversed with Laura, he could feel the tension starting to bleed away. If Chiron hadn't said such unnecessary words, the mood wouldn't have shifted this way. Still, he had to take this more seriously. I'll ask this first. You said I might be the one who might turn back the king's destiny. What did you mean by that? Our side is split on how we look at Azel Kazakh. One side looks as him as the being with the name soaked in sin. No, that isn't right. That is a title used for people with the name Azel. Would it be correct in saying the original Azel was the great sinner? Yes, he was the one who killed the great king. However, according to the Ornsaurus clan and some other minor clans, Azel Kazakh was called the being that granted the king the opportunity to turn back his destiny. Could you elaborate more? Chapter 106, The One That Chose the Name Soaked in Sin. Part 2. After the great king caused the dragon demon war, it was said that he came to a realization that he had made the wrong choice. However, at that point, he couldn't turn back on his course of action. As a counterbalance to his mistake, Azel Zestringer had appeared, and he corrected the king's wrong choice. This gave the king a chance to start anew. This is the interpretation. So, this particular interpretation implies a Tyne's defeat and death was planned. It was part of his fate. In the end, doesn't it look like thinly veiled attempt to leave a Tyne's divine status unblemished? I won't deny it. Then I'll ask the next question. Is Jeffers Almeric really the descendant of Almeric? Of course. Laura was puzzled by the question. Even during the battle, Azel refused to let this question go. Of course, she had thought it was part of a psychological warfare being waged by him. Had she been wrong, Azel furrowed his brows. At the very least, you believe he is. I don't know what your superiors were thinking. I'm not sure what you are talking about. The guy called Jeffers Almeric doesn't look at all like Almeric. Of course, if one went just by his appearance, one could overlook the inconsistencies. However, his dragon demon weapon differs from the original one. Isn't that a bit strange? Ha! Huh, Laura was surprised. Azel spoke as he looked at her reaction. Almeric's dragon demon weapon was called, Storm's Scream. However, Jeffers was using an entirely different weapon. Why is that? Was it lost over time? And a substitute dragon demon weapon was given to him. That story, where did you hear it? Laura couldn't hide her confusion. Azel had touched on a subject that she never knew about. Everyone within the Plane of Darkness considered Jeffers Almeric to be a direct descendant of Almeric. Moreover, the dragon demon weapon, Tempest's Blade, was also known as being the weapon used by the original Almeric. Azel spoke after seeing her reaction. It seems you didn't know about it. Him. Let me confirm one thing with you. How many of those, who had survived from the time of the Dragon Demon War, reside inside the Plane of Darkness? There are around 20 left. That is smaller than I thought. Who holds the highest position? A lot of Dragon Demons had survived the Dragon Demon Wars. However, time seemed to have drastically reduced those numbers. Dragon Demon Queen. Which consort are you talking about? Ain Sarah, Tedron, Kaalia, ah, there is no way Tedron is still alive. It is Ain Sarah Nim, the other two is dead. Ain Sarah, that woman is pretty useless in terms of battle capability, but her being able to lead an organization is a whole separate issue. I won't speak about Tedron, but I'm glad Kaalia is dead. No one knew if she was alive or dead, so I was worried. There had been three dragon demon queens married to Atain at the time. Kaalia was Atain's best pupil, and she possessed awesome combat ability. Aside from the four great dragon demon generals, she was considered to be the strongest magician. In the final battle, she had received a critical wound, but her death hadn't been confirmed. The news that she was dead brought relief to Azel. Do you know the names of the survivors? 
I don't know all of them. I don't know the names of three members. That means there are dragon demons, who are hiding their identities. Is it correct to say that the survivors of the dragon demon war rule over the plane of darkness? Correct. Give me their names. Azul's request was fulfilled by Laura. Azul's expression hardened as she listed their names. Some of the big shots are still alive. So the simpleton prince. Him. Is Cybane dead? He is missing. Missing. Around 20 years ago. After he fought the guardian shadows. His whereabouts became unknown. Him. Nibiris appeared to have inherited her dragon demon weapon within the past six months. This was why everyone went out to look for him. Afterwards. Everyone just assumed he was alive. But the elders refused to comment on this issue. Laura stopped at that point to ask a question of her own. May I ask a question too? I still have a lot of questions to ask you. Well, all right. You've been truthfully in why our answers, so I'll hear you out. Are you perhaps the actual Azel Kazark? Azel flinched inside at the question. However, he didn't show any indication outside. Why do you think so? You look exactly like the Azel Kazark I know. So you've been alive for that long? No. The Ornsaurus tribe possesses a lot of records regarding Azel Kazark. Amongst these records, there was a magical recording. You look too much like him to say that you are his descendant. However, there are cases where human descendants look surprisingly like their forefathers. Even if I take that into account, I find my assertion to be true. Moreover, you just spoke about the dragon demon wars as if you had experienced it. This point had intensified Laura's confusion. Azel hadn't even bothered hiding his choice of words as if it wasn't a big deal. Azel smirked. I see. Well, my answer is. You are free to believe whatever you want to. I'm not obligated to give you an answer. However, you are obligated to answer my questions. Understood. Her expression hadn't changed at all, but Laura's voice sounded like sulking teenage girl. Euron had drawn a magic circle with blood, and he was meditating in a lotus position on top of it. Leticia stood behind him, and she was on guard. Plenty of monster corpses were strewn around them. Each corpse looked as if it had been sucked dry. This bizarre sight pretty much confirmed what Azel and Chiron had assumed. Ooh, I feel much better now. How long had it been? Euron opened his eyes, and he let out a long breathe. Leticia asked him a question. How much have you recovered? I think I can walk around by myself. Running will be too taxing. If possible, I'll have to resolve this issue by traveling using magic. If you plan on floating around everywhere, it would be better for you to make a full recovery instead. It isn't healthy to recover one's body through stealing the life essence of others. It is a short-term solution, but in the long term, it could irreversibly break the balance of one's life energy. How stupid will it be if your struggle to live becomes the catalyst in you becoming an undead? If you have the choice, you shouldn't use black magic. You don't sound like a black magician. What choice did I have? The dragon demon king worshippers, who would be sent into the field, are taught the basics of black magic. I didn't become a black magician, because I wanted to. Euron grumbled. He started learning black magic at a very young age. He started to distance himself from black magic was only when he escaped the brainwashing of the dragon demon king's worship. It was thanks to the dreams he had of his spiritual guide. Leticia asked a question. So, do you know what your destiny is? I think it has to do with that man over there. Him. So the man named Azel is the man of your destiny. It really sounds weird when you phrase it like that. You can let my words go in one ear and out the other. Anyways, the man is so strong that it is hard to believe that he is human. Leticia, who was called the Ice Queen, was a figure of terror for the dragon demon king worshippers. Even she shuddered at the level of martial prowess shown by Azel. The officers, who had come out from the plains of darkness, were dealt as if they were children. I was surprised, too. His martial prowess looked inhuman. Moreover, no, I'll bring it up when I talk to him. Euron had followed the instruction of the guide within his dream to get here. He learned various truths. He also learned information and magic techniques that were never taught by the dragon demon king worshippers in the process. Leticia spoke. All right, we should go meet him. Are you ready? 
My heart is beating like a boy in puberty. Please I pray your beating heart doesn't evolve into love. At times, you sound like a person who had lived several dozen years in the human world. If it looks that way, it is thanks to the bad influence of my master. The two of them headed towards the location occupied by Azel, Chiron and Laura. It was deep into the night, but everyone was awake. Azel spoke. I want you guys to sit at a moderate distance away from us. It'll be best if we avoid antagonizing each other if possible. I'm thankful for the suggestion. However, if I do that, you'll be on edge. After speaking, Euron plopped down in front of the magical campfire made by Azel and Chiron. Azel was a bit surprised as he looked at Euron. Azel had suggested sitting a bit away from each other as a courtesy to the other group. If they did fight, it would be more advantageous for a warrior if the enemy was sitting nearby. Azel was aware of this, so he decided both groups should put a moderate distance between each other. However, Euron had unhesitatingly sat in front of Azel. I have no plans of going against you. I'm doing this, because I want that point to be made abundantly clear. However, I could turn hostile against you. Haven't you thought about such a scenario? Him. I don't think you will after hearing my story. I think. Euron wasn't confident, so he added those last words. Leticia snorted. You usually roast people with your words. Where did that guy go? Why are you showing such weakness? Is it because you met the man of your destiny? I want you to stop using that phrase. It is very misleading. Anyways, I'll introduce myself. My name is Euron Rizester. Rizester. Azel became surprised at his words. It wasn't just Azel. Chiron was surprised too. The reason why these two men reacted in such a manner was obvious. It was. Because. Is he a descendant of Carlos? Rizester was Carlos' family name. This explained why the Dragon Demon King worshippers were acting in such a sensitive manner. In some aspects, Carlos was hated more than Azel by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Before the shock passed, Laura spoke. Ah, so you are the traitor, who chose the name seeped in sin. Yes, heir of Ornsaurus. You probably came here in hopes to catch me. Azel perked up at Yuren's words. There is a slight difference in that turn of phrase. You are called the traitor, who chose the name seeped in Essen. Does this mean you chose to take up that name? Yes. Him. I see. You aren't the descendant of Carlos. Azel mumbled as if air had leaked out of him. However, Euron quickly spoke again. I chose to take up the name, but it is also true that I'm a descendant of Archmage Carlos. What? At the very least, I would like to think so. I look similar to what Carlos looked like in his early years. Of course, I don't want to look like him in the latter years. At his words, Azel narrowed his eyes. It was as he said. Niberus had messed up his face, but Uren's brown hair and blue-gray eyes. There is a clear resemblance. Chapter 107. The one that chose the name soaked in sin. Part 3. There was a part of him that resembled Carlos. It was undeniable. Normally, Carlos possessed a very cold demeanor, but when he was with Azel, Carlos acted a bit dopey. Euron, who was in front of him, gave off a similar impression. However, from Azel's perspective, Euron was an amalgamation of very troubling elements. He looked similar to Carlos, yet he used to be a dragon demon king worshipper. Moreover, he took on the name Rizester as an act of betrayal. Is he really Carlos' descendant? Unlike Hazel, Carlos accrued fame even into his latter years as an archmage. It wouldn't be weird to find out that he had descendants. However, Carlos didn't have any children. He didn't officially have any heirs. However, in the nature of things, affairs happen. Him. If that is true, what if it is so? You'll also go bald when you get old. Euron had a dumbfounded expression on his face. Then his face reddened and he started stuttering his words. T. That isn't true. My hair is very thick. Moreover, even if I am Carlos' descendant, there is a several generational gap between me and him. How can you say I'll go bald like him? It seems you've worried over this topic before. Azel chuckled. At the very least, this reaction proved that Euron himself believed he was a descendant of Carlos. Well, 
The problem of authenticity can't be determined right now. So let's push that aside for now. First, I would like to learn more about both of you. Him. Doesn't one normally introduce oneself when asking such a question? Leticia was a bit further away, and she asked in a cold manner. Chiron, who had been quiet, stepped forward when he heard her words. You were being too harsh. We rescued both of you. We can't deny what you did for us. It is a bit annoying, but I guess we are at a disadvantage. When Leticia grumbled, Euron smirked. Well, I planned on revealing everything in the first place. You don't have to be so prickly, Leticia. That is your stance. I don't plan on taking the same approach. Well, you came along according to my will, so it is already a done deal. Since you stayed silent on the issue, you've tacitly agreed to my agenda. Sometimes I have an urge to beat you, and I'm having a hard time holding myself back right now, Euron. The fact that you are able to hold yourself back like this means you possess a sound mind. Anyways, him, if you don't want to talk, you can give a cursory introduction. I used to be a dragon demon king worshipper, and I betrayed them. Euron didn't hide anything about his past. He told them how he came to be a dragon demon king worshipper, then he talked about how he escaped from their brainwashing. He spoke how he chose the road to being a traitor. Chiron, who had been listening to the story, furrowed his brows. That just sounds too absurd. An unknown voice appeared suddenly in your dreams, and it started guiding you. This was the reason why you betrayed the dragon demon king worshippers. Do you really want me to believe such nonsense? I know it is a hard to believe tale. However, it is the truth. If it wasn't for the dreams sent by my guide, I would still be a dragon demon king worshipper. I was made to be loyal through the brainwashing, and I prayed each day for the revival of the dragon demon king. Sometimes officers would come to speak to us about the dragon demon war, and I was moved to tears by the stories I heard. Does the dragon demon king worshippers really live like that? Do you think I'm joking? I'm not. This was especially true at these institutes, which fostered the children. They were very thorough in observing these types of formalities. Moreover, everyone considered it to be normal and natural. From a very young age, we were instilled with the ideology of the dragon demon king worshippers, and anything that didn't fall within this ideology was considered to be wrong. Moreover, one could make a fanatic through brainwashing. It was almost impossible to reverse this process. Yet the dragon demon king worshippers weren't satisfied with just that. There are tears to being a dragon demon king worshippers. In the end, dragon demons are on top, the dragon magens are in the middle, and the humans make up the floor. However, they never fully trust a human. This policy may have arose when they suffered defeat at the hands of the humans. This was observed when Azel battled and ultimately killed Duran. Duran had dedicated his life to the worship of the dragon demon king, and he had distinguished himself numerous times in battle. He was a human, who was allowed to live inside the plains of darkness. However, his advancement ended there. He received very little support compared to the dragon demons and dragon magens. Currently, no, humans, amongst the dragon demon king worshippers possess dragon demon key. Humans aren't allowed to go through dragon slayer's ritual. Only humans and dragon magens could enter into a dragon slayer's ritual. However, the dragon demon king worshippers refused to set up a stage where a human would be able to go through the dragon slayer's ritual. Our story strayed a little bit off topic. Anyway, they weren't satisfied with a thorough mind control regiment. All their foods were drugged. This drug was moderately addicting, and a specific smell could put the subject into a state of trance. During the indoctrination of the children, the children was put in a trance state, and the worship of the dragon demon king was imprinted deep within their subconsciousness. It's a heinous act. However, it doesn't end there. All children went through a monthly verification process to see if the ideology had taken hold. In the process, the children's minds were thrown open to be manipulated by magic. Childhood are a time when these children are supposed to develop self-identities. However, they were already in the inescapable grip of the madness. I was like that. When I first dreamed of my guide, I wanted to kill myself. Why? Guilt was the main reason. As a dragon demon king worshipper, 
I thought I had committed an egregious sin. I believed I was being successfully tempted by an evil being. This was why he told no one about the dreams. In the end, it had been a wise decision for him to do so. If he had told the instructors, Urine would have immediately been labeled as a failed product. He would have been transferred over to a division where they would have experimented on his body. When I had the dream for the first time, it was weird. The things I considered to be obvious no longer seemed to be so obvious inside my dreams. As he kept having these dreams, the ideas put into his head was accepted as being illogical. This was the effect of the dream. The ideology ingrained in him felt natural as breathing. However, the ways of the dragon demon king worshippers felt weird inside his dream. A fissure appeared inside his mind. As he kept dreaming about the guide every night, Euron started to see the madness that was slowly eating him alive. He shook from fear. It took me ten years for me to bring myself to escape that place. As a dragon demon king worshipper, I was already a broken product. However, my guide inside my dream gave me methods, which allowed me to hide this fact. At an early age, Euron was classified as a candidate for becoming a magician. He learned magic from childhood. His instructors were thorough in teaching Euron about practical black magic. There were also children, who were taught traditional magic, since they would be sent to infiltrate the outside world. However, Euron wasn't part of that group. During all of this, Euron was simultaneously being instructed by the guide inside his dreams. He learned magic that weren't taught by his instructors. After ten years, Euron far outstripped his instructors. He developed into being a magician able to rival the dragon demon officers from the plains of darkness. I never found out the identity of my guide. I still do not know. In truth, I am not totally comfortable with the guidance I received. The guide taught me how to call and control a demon. However, at the very least, I don't think the guide is a demon. It is still a possibility. The demon race possesses knowledge of unknown origin. Their goal is to lead humans to destruction using this knowledge. Azel spoke. Not many people knew about the demon race. Unless one was a black magician, there was no need for one to approach the demons. However, during the dragon demon wars, Carlos had approached the demon race to gain a power that'll destroy the hopelessness hanging over the world. The knowledge he had gained had been worth the risk. Euron let out a bitter laugh. Still, if it wasn't for my guide, I would have never found myself. I would have wasted away as a tool for the dragon demon king worshippers. This is why I trust it. Even if my guide was a demon working towards my destruction, I am still thankful. I was given an opportunity to perish as a human. After he spoke, Euron hesitated before he put a disclaimer to his statement. Ah, of course, if it is really leading me down a path of destruction, I'll direct my hatred and resentment towards it with my last breath. Azel let out a laugh at those words. Euron clear his throat before he spoke again. Hum hum. The guide inside my dream said I'll meet the man of my destiny here. It said that this person would remind me of Azel Karzak, who had defeated the dragon demon king. It seemed my guide was right. Azel Karzak. Azel let out a bitter laugh. If Euron found out he was the actual Azel Karzak, he was curious as to what kind of expression would appear on Euron's face. Azel spoke. In truth, your story is highly suspicious, and it has a lot of holes. The only part that is trustworthy is the fact that you opposed the dragon demon king worshippers. I know my story is hard to believe. I don't particularly like conspiracy theories, but this might have all been scripted by the dragon demon king worshipper. Isn't that so? You opposed Niberus, and you almost died in the process. However, that can be faked. However, the dragon mage and offices were almost wiped out by you. I'll point out that fact as a point in my favor. Maybe, they underestimated me. Moreover, during the Dragon Demon War, the Dragon Demon King even threw his children away as bait if the battle was important enough. It isn't too far-fetched to think that the Dragon Mage in offices were used as baits. If you are so highly suspicious, him, there is no way I'll be able to earn your trust. In the first place, I knew the story of a guide within my dreams sounded baseless. Euron let out a bitter laugh. 
After staring at Euron for a brief moment, Azel asked a question to Laura. What do you think, Laura? You are asking for my opinion. Laura was taken aback. Why would he ask for her opinion in such a situation? The reason being Azel could now tell if Laura was speaking a lie or not. Her words would give another data point, which Azel could use to come to assess the situation. Chapter 108. The one that chose the name Soaked in Sin. Part 4. Laura spoke. First, everything he told you was the truth. They really gather humans, and brainwash the human to make them into members of the organization. Yes, it isn't something I saw myself, and I haven't participated in it. However, I do know it has been going on. It is as he said, everyone within the planes of darkness has an inherent distrust of humans. The humans are viewed as beings that will eventually be ruled, but since they can't be trusted, the normal convention is to train them thoroughly. These humans are molded into tools, and one of the more popular strategy is to infiltrate the human society using them. They won't be detected by the guardian shadows if their identities as dragon demon king worshippers was never exposed. Azul's body shook from rage. It wasn't enough that they were manipulating the world from behind the scene. They were trampling the rights of humans. They took away innocent children, and their human nature was destroyed to make tools that will move to their whims. This was something they hadn't even dared to do during the Dragon Demon War. No, maybe, they had no reason to try this during the Dragon Demon War. This wasn't an open warfare being waged against the humans. They had created a secret society within the darkness, and as they bided their time, they were making the world sick. This was why they were using such methods. Moreover, if they focused their plan on only the dragon demons and dragon magen, they would run into the problem of being short on manpower. This was why this method was so effective for them. After looking at him for a brief moment, Laura continued to speak. The existence of Euron Rizester was a highly sensitive issue amongst the senior officers. It was such a problem that we were pitted against each other in a race for his capture. From the information I received, he had already destroyed over ten secret facilities, and he had killed a lot of Dragon Demon King worshippers. He even infiltrated the developmental institutions to assassinate the trainers. We also received reports that something incomprehensible was occurring. I'm guessing you are talking about my work in undoing the brainwashing done to the specimens used for experiments. Euron glared at her as he spoke. Laura received his sharp gaze, but she nodded in an indifferent manner. Yes. I've heard there had been several incidents before. This was why the risk posed by you was upgraded to the highest category. It was the dreams from the guide. Him, I'm able to transmit the dreams I receive from my guide to other people. This isn't just a one-on-one -on -one event. I'm able to sync the dreams of large number of people. The only limitation is the fact that the people have to be within the range of my magic. Is this some kind of a dream technique? Azel intruded into the conversation. In the past, Azel had manipulated Anora's dream after she was overwhelmed by a frightening experience. Spirit order, dragon arts, and magic. They all possessed techniques dealing with the mind. One could use these techniques to plant illusions using dreams. There were even techniques that allowed one to control the mind of others. Euron gave a reply. I think it is something similar. I don't know about the other institutions, but the children being used in experiments. These children do not know their fate even when they are about to be slaughtered. Without the children's knowledge, they judge whether if the children are suited to become their tools or not. The children, who are considered to be disqualified, suffers a fate worse than death. Euron had attacked locations where they used children for black magic experimentation or as sacrifices for summoning the demons. When he destroyed the facilities of the dragon demon king worshippers, he was able to gain information regarding such sites. Euron couldn't ignore it. But, maybe if we, Euron, I told you to shut your mouth in regards to that issue. Euron was about to speak words expressing his regret, but Leticia shot back at him with cold words. In the end, Euron hadn't been able to save a single specimen being used for experimentation. Only the two of them survived the escape attempt. Euron had instigated their escape, Yet all of the children, who had been used in the experiments, had died. I'm sorry. Anyways, 
I sometimes wonder if the guide is watching me even at this moment from nearby. If a powerful magician was watching over me to talk to me through the dreams, it would be easier for me to accept this situation. I don't feel any gazes on us. Azel mumbled those words as an afterthought. Leticia reacted to his words. Are you saying you mastered the gaze detection? That means you learned it too. That is surprising. In recent times, the only ones to master that technique are the dragon demon king worshippers residing within the plane of darkness. She continued to speak. Anyways, I agree with your opinion. I've traveled with this guy for only a month, but I've never felt any strange gazes on me. So does this mean you weren't comrades with Euron prior to a month ago? I didn't know him at all. I had come across a facility of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. I was about to attack when I encountered him. Since our goals coincided, we decided to work together. I was unlucky. Leticia grumbled. After the conclusion of that particular task, she had been dragged into Yuren's absurd stories about his dreams. After looking at her for a brief moment, Azel spoke. As I said before, I don't like conspiracies. Him, Yuren and Leticia was puzzled when Azel spoke those words out of nowhere. Azel continued to speak. It is inevitable to keep thinking up conspiracy theories to come up with an explanation. I don't like conspiracy theories, so let's not talk about my suspicions for now. I'll just keep my eyes on you all. What the hell? Euron couldn't hold back his laughter. As he laughed, Euron spoke to Azel. Let us cooperate with each other for a while. We can share information regarding the Dragon Demon King worshippers, and we can pool our strength to fight them. Thank you. I'll work hard not to disappoint you too much. You better. If you betray me, I'll cut you down. Azel let out a cold laugh as he spoke, and Euron gulped. Soon Azel turned to Laura as he spoke. Well, I'll take my time in talking to both of you. I still have questions I have to ask this person here. You guys can listen in. I also want to ask you another question. If you truthfully answer my question, I might think about answering one more of your question. You probably won't give me a proper answer. It depends on the question. At Laura's grumbling, Azel answered in a sly manner. Anyways, I've always been curious about one thing. Why did you guys try to kidnap the Dragon Demon Princess and the Dragon Demon Prince of the Rulan Kingdom? Ah, is it true that you guys think they might be blood-related to Atain? That's correct. How did you? I gave you the clues. I thought you intentionally dropped the clue, so I could figure it out. If that wasn't your intention, you were very careless. Until that moment, I have never failed before. I never planned for the eventuality of me losing. Laura still had a blank expression on her face, but she was acting a bit coy. It made her seem young. Azel asked her a question. So the two of them are blood-related to the numerous offsprings left behind by Atain. It isn't a certainty. The senior officials of our organization believed that the current generation of the Rulan Kingdom's royal family show the clearest characteristics that indicated that they hold the blood of Atain. In the Dragon Demon royal family, it was very rare for the Dragon Demon Princess to become the next Dragon Demon Queen. The Dragon Demon Queen usually was a Dragon Majin or a Dragon Demon married into the royal family. When the Dragon Demon Queen has children and the children grows up safely, the Queen is given a different title, and she is allowed to live a new life afterwards. Then a female dragon magin or a dragon demon from a different family was picked to become the next dragon demon queen. The current dragon demon queen was a retired guardian shadow. She was the daughter of a family totally unrelated to the dragon demon royal family. However, unbeknownst to her, she was a descendant of Atain. However, there was another reason why the dragon demon king worshippers were targeting the children instead of her. I don't know everything. But the current Rulan royal family has a very strong trace of Atain's blood. Basically, Atain and Saiga were a product of two of Atain's descendants marrying each other. They had special characteristics present his descendants, and they were worth monitoring by those in the plane of darkness. The fact that they possessed dragon demon magic compared to other dragon magians and dragon demons was a huge indicator. Azel furrowed his brows. I see. Still, I don't see why that would merit the targeting of those two. I wouldn't understand it if they were direct descendants, 
but there are several generations gap. Why obsess over descendants so far removed from the direct line of descent? They are ingredients that'll be used to complete the king's bowl. Him, Laura looked at the puzzled Azel, and she casually dropped a shocking truth. The official up high believe that the king's revival is imminent. They just need the bowl that'll hold the soul of the king. The king will once again be born into the world. The Rulan Kingdom's dragon demon princess, and the dragon demon prince were chosen to be the materials that'll be used to make this happen. What? Azel was struck dumb by the statement. It wasn't just him. Everyone gathered there was also struck dumb. Leon was a keeper of the prophecy. The undead Zeta followed him around, and Zeta was one of the sleepless guardians. Basically, his memory as a human was muddled it couldn't be helped. It was similar with the evil spirits. Undeads had a hard time remembering anything other than memories of deep attachments. This was also the reason why undeads lose their minds, easily, and they step into a path of destruction. The memories of sensation one felt in real life is forgotten, and one's reasoning skill starts to slip in a sporadic manner. The loss of one's reason lead to insanity. In terms of those problems, Zeta and the other, sleepless guardians, were very special. They lost many memories, but they remembered how to fight. Moreover, the memories after they became an undead was crystal clear. They had lived as undeads for several dozen years, yet their sense of reason remained intact. Of course, one of the memories that remained intact was the memory of how they died. Zeta was also murdered by the demon king worshippers. His whole life was destroyed then he lost his family. In the end, his life was also taken. However, there was a difference between Zeta and the other guardian shadows. Keeper of the prophecy Leon witnessed Zeta's end. Zeta had received a critical wound when he attacked the dragon demon king worshippers in an act of revenge. Leon had shown up with the other guardian shadows, and they had been a step too late. Leon asked Zeta a question as he faded away from life. Do you want revenge? Do you want it even if you be tormented, and you will never find peace again? He hadn't even needed to think over his answer. He made a contract with Leon, and he had forgotten his name. He became a being, who was fueled by grudge. He became Zeta. Chapter 109, the one that chose the name soaked in sin. Part 5. Afterwards, he had killed countless dragon demon king worshippers. Leon wandered around the continent as he located the dragon demon king worshippers, and he assassinated them. While doing so, he kept hope for the day when the prophesied person would show up. In the past several dozen years, Leon escaped numerous near-death experiences. Usually, the keepers of prophecy prioritized keeping themselves alive instead of assassinating the dragon demon king worshippers. Their existence was solely for the prophesied being that'll show up one day. However, Leon possessed a deep grudge that caused his rationality to dim. This was why he often walked into danger. Just like now. Leon. Zeta held Leon in his arms as he called out Leon's name. However, Leon had lost consciousness, so there was no response. A cloud of dust was rising in front of them. An explosion of great power had blown away a portion of the forest. Zeta had rescued Leon with exquisite timing, yet Leon's body had been torn into shreds. Unfortunately, I won't be able to say my goodbye to you. I'm dead, yet I have grown somewhat fond of you. Zeta put Leon on the floor as he spoke. Could you give him a message for me, Zerez? I would have said to tell him yourself, but I can't say such heartless words. All right, what message do you want me to deliver to him? Please thank him on my behalf. That'll be enough. Understood. I'll be sure to deliver your message. Zerez was breaking out in cold sweat. He had almost died earlier. He was almost swept up in the explosion. If the dragon demon undead Delta hadn't put him on his shoulder and ran away, he would have been dead. Delta spoke as he tossed Zerez on the ground. I'll let Theta accompany you. Will that be enough for you to run away with Leon? Er, uh, you treat Leon with care, yet you just throw me around like a sack. Why is there such a difference in how we are treated? You should place a hand over your heart and ask that question to yourself. I'm sure you know the answer. Anyways, I want you to run away as fast as you can. 
I know you are weak enough to be blown away like the flame of a candle facing a wind. However, you are very good at running away. Hmm however, I need to point out that a versatile mage like me should stay behind instead of the two sword swinging brute. The undead magician Theta spoke in a crooked manner. Delta gave a retort. It doesn't matter, who stays behind. We won't be able to buy much time either way. I think a versatile bastard like you should be detached to the group running away. Delta couldn't finish his words. An explosion rang out from the other side of the forest. Qua the cloud of dust parted, and a powerful seismic wave came towards them. A terrifying impact rammed into the barrier put up by Theta, and an explosion occurred. Delta spoke. See, I want you to take the kids, and get lost in a versatile manner. Understood. Since you're already dead, I won't have the chance to meet you again after your death. I hope you travel to a good place. What kind of a farewell is that? I have nowhere to go after this. Delta let out a hollow laugh as he turned away. Theta used his magic to lift Zerez and Leon. He was about to get out of there at high speeds. Delta mumbled to himself. The number of guardian shadows left is 62. No, there are 61 left. I think it'll be best for us to gather all of them before they all disappear. What do you think? I agree. Zeta and Delta could identify and order the nearby Guardian Shadows. When the battle started, there had been around 100 Guardian Shadows gathered here. They had been confident that they would be able to kill their enemies, since Zeta, Delta and Theta was present too. However, they were sorely mistaken. There were much more enemies than expected. Moreover, there was a ridiculous monster amongst them. The violent gust of wind pushed away the cloud of dust. A silhouette of a person appeared from within the dust. No, it wasn't a person. The two thick horns on his head gave away that he was a dragon demon, but this wasn't the issue. It wasn't right to refer to a dead corpse as a person. Hoo hoo. Jeez. You guys are the guardian shadows. I've heard a lot about you guys, but you guys are more annoying than I had imagined. The being that was confronting the guardian shadows was the same as Delta. He was a dragon demon undead. However, one could tell at a glance that he was different from Delta. The evil energy of the black magic flowed around him. He wore black armor above his bones, and he looked similar to a skeleton knight. However, his size was much bigger. It made one wonder if he was really a dragon demon. He was almost three meters tall. Moreover, his armor was twice as thick as a normal armor. He moved wearing an abnormally bulky armor and he was like a small moving mountain. He was imposing. His hands held a large battle hammer. The head of the hammer was three times larger than a person's head. The shaft was almost two meters long. The very thought of a human wielding such a hammer was preposterous. Its outer appearance was also bizarre. It was as if it was carved out of ivory. The head and the shaft had same texture and color of white. Moreover, only one side was designed for impact. The back of the hammer was intricately carved with the face of a man. Anyways, I have business with the live ones, yet only the dead ones stayed behind. I guess I'm not popular. Aren't you also dead, Ragus? Delta took a dig at the other being. The large undead dragon demon was one of the four dragon demon generals, who had followed the dragon demon king during the dragon demon war. He was the hammer that swallowed the scream of the land, Ragus. After he died during the Dragon Demon War, he kept existing by becoming an undead. The bizarre battle hammer was a symbol of Ragus. The Dragon Demon weapon was called, the Seal of the Broken Soul. Ragus laughed. I guess so. Well, I'll let the living handle the living. How about we settle our business amongst the dead? Ragus hadn't come here by himself. In the first place, the Guardian Shadows had come here, because there was a large group of Dragon Demon King worshippers gathered here. It seemed they purposefully revealed their location to lure in the Guardian Shadows here. Ragus spoke. You guys chase after ones that ran away. Ragus Nim. We can't. Dragon Demons and Dragon Magians appeared from within the Dust Cloud. Each of them were officers within the Plane of Darkness. They all possessed great power. If this was a normal circumstance, they would take orders from no one. However, even if he was an undead, Ragus was basically nobility to them. 
This is my first time being inserted into a live battle. However, by looking at what I was able to do for a warm up earlier, it proves that you guys don't have to worry about me. Rest easy. Moreover, it'll be much easier for me to use my power if no allies are nearby. Understood. Well, then, the dragon demons and dragon magens followed Ragus's will. They left. Theta and Zeta tried to stop them, but in a flash, a terrifying energy surrounded their bodies. It was the power of a black curse, and it felt as if an invisible hand was pressing down on them. In fact, the black curse became denser as time passed, and it started to exhibit physical effects. The black magic, which maintained the undeads, started to clash with the new magic as black sparks erupted. Theta and Zeta was slowly being pushed back. Normally, they possessed powers much greater than an undead, yet their combined power was being pushed back by Ragus. Him, Zeta stepped forward to swing his sword. When he swung his sword, a black wave erupted to cut the power that was pushing him backwards. When the gridlock was broken, Zeta quickly sent 30 guardian shadows after their enemies. Then he asked Ragus a question. How did you know we'll come here? This was a trap from the start. Ragus and the officers from the Plains of Darkness had been waiting for them. The appearance of the officers were considered to be a possibility, but the existence of Ragus had transcended expectation even for the Guardian Shadows. I never expected the four great dragon demon generals to be this strong. Was he stronger when he was alive? Or did he get stronger after death like us? The Guardian Shadows were strong. Each Guardian Shadows possessed a very threatening amount of power, but their powers increased rapidly as more gathered in a single location. Then there were the beings that existed to command the Guardian Shadows. Basically, the existence of Theta and Zeta, who were the sleepless guardians, had a big synergistic effect on the Guardian Shadows. This was why they hadn't been afraid of the officers from the Plane of Darkness. If Ragus wasn't here, the Guardian Shadows would have won. However, Ragus's power was beyond imagination. When Ragus swung his seal of the broken soul, the mountaintop was blown away, and the several hundred meter stretch of trees were uprooted. In terms of destructive power, it was akin to fighting a dragon. Still, he isn't at a level where we can do nothing to him. Still, it is unfortunate that we'll cease to exist after this. There were a total of eight keepers of the prophecy. Aside from their newest member Zerez, every one of them possessed, sleepless guardians. If two keepers of the prophecy and their sleepless guardians were gathered in the same location, it would be possible to stand up against Ragus. At that point in his thought process, Zeta became suspicious. No matter how he thought about it, this was too weird. Ragus was an ace card that had been hidden up until now by the Plane of Darkness. The fact that he had shown up in front of the Guardian Shadows meant that there was something here that was worth revealing the secret. The Plane of Darkness didn't really know about how the Guardian Shadows were structured, but they knew that the Keepers of Prophecy were special. If they could lure and kill all the keepers of the prophecy, maybe they might have thought it was worth the risk. Still, how did they track the keepers of prophecy? They would have needed the precise location to set up this trap. When he asked this question, Ragus didn't even bother hiding the information. It is simple. We can tell when our own people are killed. We just tracked you guys through that. So all the men we killed arriving at this location were intentional sacrifices? No it isn't anything like that. We were practical in our use of data. We just matched your whereabouts with the deaths. Dragon Demon King worshippers were scattered all over the world. However, the information gathered in their deaths were gathered, and sent to the Plane of Darkness. Ainsera was encased within the Great Darkness, and it was possible for her to connect to others linked to the Great Darkness. They could be anywhere on the continent, and Ainsera would be able to contact them instantaneously. This network allowed her to gather and analyze information. She was able to respond to any situation in an abnormally fast manner. The Keepers of Prophecy had appeared when the Plane of Darkness tried to kidnap the dragon demon Prince Saiga. Afterwards, a great amount of effort was put in to keep track of the Keepers of the Prophecy. The result of this effort allowed Ragus to ambush the Guardian Shadows. Ragus placed the head of the Seal of Broken Soul on his palm as he spoke. Him. I guess I don't have to ask this question to the living. 
You guys might know about it too. What are you talking about? I have only one question I want to ask you guys. He asked the question as blue flames ignited from the eye sockets of Regus's skull. Carlos. Where did you hide that tough to kill human? Chapter 110. To the land of the demons. Part 1. There was always an end to every fight. Countless wars ended to become a part of history, and some of them became legends that people remembered for all times. The Dragon Demon War was the largest war recorded in history. The people, who were living through it, felt as if they were in a never-ending hell. The act of being alive each day was painful, and the world was filled with the laments of the despairing people. However, even this long war had to come to an end. People ran forward as they burned all their reservoirs of energy to be able to see the end. When the end started to come into view, everyone became disconcerted. It was the night before the final battle. Azel and Carlos were sitting in front of each other. An important fight was ahead of them, so there was no alcohol being shared between the two. No one would have blamed them if they had hit the bottle to fall asleep amidst this tiring war. However, the two of them were placing their fate on the impending fight, so they didn't want to do anything they would regret later. The elders would laugh if they could hear my words. Carlos let out an embarrassed laughter. I didn't expect to live long enough to see the end of the war. You should never repeat those words to the elders. Azel smirked as he rebuked Carlos. At that point, it had been 17 years since the Dragon Demon Wars had erupted. However, it wasn't as if the world had been peaceful before the start of the Dragon Demon War. Wars used to break out in various locations, and the fights had escalated. However, at some point, Atain named himself as the Dragon Demon King, and he started a war to conquer humanity. Azel and Carlos had spent most of their lives in hardship and frustration as the Dragon Demon War had started in their childhood. For the two of them, the Dragon Demon War had always been in the background of their lives. They couldn't imagine what they would do when the Dragon Demon War came to an end. They hadn't even dreamed about such possibilities. Carlos spoke. I won't. I don't want to hear what they have to say. But, I understand what you are feeling right now. Right. However, all of that. It'll only be possible if we win tomorrow. The stage of the final battle was set. The Allied forces had surrounded the final stronghold. It was where all the remaining Dragon Demon King's army was gathered. They had surrounded the Dragonhorn Fortress. After the long era of darkness, it was almost a miracle that the Allied forces were able to gather hundreds of thousands of fighters. There had been too many deaths, and there were too few children born and raised during this era. The warriors continued to fall in battle and the ones that weren't warriors had to become warriors. They had no choice if they wanted to survive. Now the end was in sight, and they all gathered to see the end of this war. Carlos spoke. He wasn't really speaking to Rizel. It was as if he wanted to hear himself speak. We can win this. No, there is no way we will lose. I know. The Allied forces had methodically piled up victories, and their enemies were cornered now. In terms of numbers, the Allied forces had an overwhelming advantage compared to the Dragon Demon army inside the Dragonhorn Fortress. Normally, one would count this as a victory. However, they couldn't do so, because Dragon Demon King Atain was waiting for them inside the fortress. All our preparations are complete. You just have to defeat that bastard. In the final battle, Azel would have to fight one-on-one -on -one with Atain. This was the plan concocted by the leaders of the Allied forces. While the large army lay siege to the fortress, an elite force would infiltrate the castle within the Dragonhorn Fortress. They would create a situation where Azel and Atain would be able to fight one on one. The reasoning behind this plan was simple. If Atain wasn't tied up in a one on one battle, the Allied forces wouldn't be able to hold up against Atain's attacks. It would be calamitous. Atain was ultimate magician. Atain was able to casually do tasks that defied all magical intuition and magical theory known to this world. If an archmage of Atain's caliber was able to engage the large army, all the high-ranking magicians would be tied up in trying to stop Atain. This was why someone had to get close Atain, so he wouldn't be able to pay attention to the battlefield. However, 
Only a very small elite unit could infiltrate the castle when two large armies clashed. This elite unit would have no choice but to fight Atene while surrounded by their enemies. If the Allied forces wanted to win this war with the limited resources they possessed, they needed a viable challenger who will be able to last against Atene in a one-on-one -on -one battle. It didn't matter if this person didn't win. The most important part was to stay alive until the outcome of the war was determined. There was also a simple reason why Azel had taken on this mission. It was determined that only he would be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Atene in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Atene was the ultimate magician, yet at the same time, he was in possession of numerous dragon demon weapons. Normally, a dragon demon or a dragon magian chose to either wield magic or a dragon demon weapon. The techniques for both discipline arose from the same root. This was why they had similar special characteristic, yet the techniques was markedly different. This was why if one chose to train both paths to the extreme, one became stuck somewhere in the middle. One wouldn't be able to become good in either disciplines. However, Atene was special. He was a transcendent magician, and at the same time, he was a terrifying warrior. Carlos spoke. It'll be okay. Atene is a terrifying existence, but you can win against him. You've already done it before. I was able to strike him, because I ambushed him. It had been possible, because Rishu had acted in an unpredictable manner. This is the first time I'll fight Atene in a fair fight. Rishu was Azul's fourth teacher. He wasn't affiliated with either the Allied forces or the Dragon Demon King's army. He had instigated a fight with Atene, and when Rishu was in mortal danger, Azel had entered the battle. He was able to grievously wound Atene. Carlos spoke. It'll be different this time. You have something that'll put you on equal footing with Atene. Atene possessed 13 dragon demon weapons. Each of the dragon demon weapons possessed earth-shattering power, yet he was able to use several dragon demons at the same time. If Atene brought out multiple dragon demon weapons to use large-scale magic, he was unstoppable. He was able to create consecutive phenomena that was akin to natural disasters. It would smash the battle lines of the allied forces. From the allied forces' perspective, they had to make sure that Atene didn't enter into the battlefield. There were numerous beings, who possessed multiple dragon demon weapons. These weapons could be transferred to others. However, there were only three beings, who were able to summon multiple dragon demon weapons at once. It could be done by Atene, Azel and Duke Kwa Nidal. Duke Kwa Nidal was a veteran knight, and he was the Allied Force's best technician. However, his power was lacking compared to Atene and Azel. Duke Nidal possessed four dragon demon weapons, and he could summon two at the same time. Azel was the same as Atene. He possessed thirteen dragon demon weapons. These were keepsakes left behind by his dead comrades. The dragon demon weapons had been transferred to him by them. Suddenly, Carlos grinned. Truthfully, I'm envious of you. What are you talking about? You will be on the brightest stage and you will have the most important part to play in it. After tomorrow, the bards in the future will sing about the hero Azel. I'll probably be relegated to one of your nameless comrades, who stood next to you as you killed Atene. Now that I think about it, it feels like I'm receiving the short end of the stick. Geez, we still haven't fought the battle yet. Why are you talking about the distant future? It'll happen. We'll become legends tomorrow. The world doesn't revolve around certain people, but tomorrow. For one day, the world will revolve around us. Azel looked at him for a moment, and he put on the same grin as Carlos. Yes, I'm sure it will. It was the present. Dragon Demon War had been over for 223 years. A cold silence had descended inside the ruins of the Count Kazark's castle. It was because, the blonde-haired Dragon Demon Girl, who had her whole body restricted, had spoken the truth. The Dragon Demon King's revival was imminent. This was a belief shared by all Dragon Demon King worshippers. They believed time was just something that had to be endured, and their belief would be proven true. The great Dragon Demon King would return to this world, and he would change this world into the way it should be. The existence of this belief was the reason why the worship of the Dragon Demon King hadn't died off. Within their religion, 
They believed the dragon demon king was able to transcend the providence of this world. It had been 223 years since his death, and he was about to revive. It was occurring as prophesied. The dragon demons within the plane of darkness was sure of this truth. You guys. When he heard Laura's story, Chiron spoke as if her words was preposterous. You guys really believe it is possible for a dead being to come back to life? Are we talking about making an undead through Black Maggie? Or will he come back to his original living body? When our king was alive, he was basically like the living history of this world. He was an existence that had transcended the common sense of magicians. If you had the chance to see the relics left behind all over the world by him, you wouldn't think returning from death to be particularly difficult for him. You've already seen the result of magic that's akin to a wish. You have seen the guardian shadows. They're an example of how illogical it can be. At the very least, you guys seem to believe it. I guess it makes sense. The belief in his revival had basically kept you guys going for 200 years. However, no. Wait a moment. Azel cut off Chiron's words. He asked Laura with a serious expression on his face. How long until Atain revives? Azel, you guys went to the trouble of kidnapping dragon demon royalty from outside. At the very least, this means you don't have the people you need inside the plane of darkness. Or maybe you guys failed in making something for him. Is that right? Azel, do you really? Are you actually taking her seriously? Chiron asked the question as if he couldn't believe what he was hearing. However, Azel didn't even turn around as he answered the question. Yes, I don't know if it is possible or not. However, I had a friend with excellent judgment speak regarding this problem. He said it was possible, so I trust him. The worst possible outcome may be staring us in the face right now. If we don't believe it, we might be hit in the back of the head when we aren't looking. It would be better to be safe, and look back at this event in dejection and relief. Last time, Carlos had appeared in Azul's dream, and he left a message saying Atain might be able to revive. This was why he believed Laura's words. Whether it was the past or now, Azel always trusted Carlos in regards to any topics related to magic. Azel spoke. In the Dragon Demon War, Atain died, and his corpse was destroyed. Is this why he is looking for a different vessel? Was his soul preserved? In the final battle, Azel was thorough in destroying Atain's corpse. He didn't want to leave open the possibility of Atain coming back as an undead. Laura tilted her head. You speak as if you've seen it. That is none of your business. It doesn't matter if we have the corpse or not. In truth, we are trying to gather ingredients to create his vessel, but that might not even be necessary. What do you mean? The various magic left behind by him inside the plane of darkness is still active. The most astonishing one is the one that'll carry out the revival ritual. Laura had seen this magical model once. The revival ritual was to take take place in the deepest part of the dragon demon castle. There was a spring of darkness refined by magic underground, and the revival ritual was ongoing inside this abyss. This process hadn't stopped for the past 220 years. Euron asked a question. Is it some kind of a soul return technique? No, it is something different. It isn't something as crude as that. If it was the soul return technique, there's no reason why he would have used up such a vast amount of time. The soul return technique was a type of black magic. It used a different method as the undead spell to bring back the dead. The soul was kept from moving on, and it was put into a different vessel. It could be put into an artificial body, or one could erase a stranger's mind to create a vessel. This was a workaround method for a revival. However, the probability of success for this method was very slim. The dynamics of magic only allowed a soul to unify with one's own body. This was why most chose to bring a person back as an undead instead of using the soul return technique. Moreover, even if the method did succeed, the result never turned out right. There wasn't a single case in history, where the soul hadn't suffered damage or degradation. This was why even if one was successful in putting a soul into a vessel, a large number of unpredictable problems followed. Laura spoke. The heads of our organization hadn't been trying to prepare the dragon demon princess and the dragon demon prince as a vessel. 
They weren't trying to pull off something akin to the soul return technique. Then why? Chapter 111. To the Land of the Demons. Part 2. We just hoped they could be used as ingredients in forming the vessel of the king. What do you mean? The king's body is being slowly formed within the abyss. If what Ain Sarah Nim says is true, the king's body will recover to the one he had when he was alive. He's going to restore an already destroyed body. His body will return to its previous form. When the restoration of the body ends, an incomprehensible method will be used to put the preserved soul into the body. It'll be a complete revival. Laura had checked, and a significant portion of Atine's body had already been restored. It was a bizarre sight where the body was floating in the darkness, and there were gaps in the body. However, as time passed, the gaps were being filled in. We studied and analyzed his magic for a long time. However, no one was able to discern the true nature of the spell. There were several hypotheses formed, and one of them was about using those with blood ties to the dragon demon king as a form of fertilizer. It was hypothesized that sacrificing those with certain strong characteristics would accelerate the recovery process. Basically, the dragon demon princess and the dragon demon prince would be carved up for the parts needed for Atain to recover his body. It was a ghoulish plan. Azel and Chiron was taken aback. You've all lost your minds. I knew your organization was never sound of mind, but I'm speechless. You guys were going to grind up Arietta and Saiga. They would have been used as nutrients, so the dragon demon king could make his body. You all deserve death. Chiron grinded his teeth. His anger was renewed when he learned what they were going to do with his students. Azel asked a question. I'll ask again, since this trash of a plan failed. It didn't fail. However, it did fail in its outcome. Are you trying to play a trick with words? We failed in kidnapping the dragon demon princess and dragon demon prince of the Rulan kingdom. However, the candidates that could be used for this plan wasn't limited to the two of them. Basically, other chosen candidates, who checked off the same characteristics as Arietta and Saiga, was kidnapped from other places. They were sacrificed to accelerate the revival of Atain. Laura spoke in a dispassionate manner towards the angry people around her. However, it was a failure. We couldn't comprehend the king's magic, and it was proven that we couldn't interrupt the process. That is a stroke of good luck in the midst of misfortune. So how long do we have until Atain revives? I don't know. This is something every follower of the king wants to know. The only thing we can be sure of is the fact that the day is close at hand. The recovery has advanced far enough to assure this. I see. So we have to do something before that happens. Azul's expression darkened. If that bastard really revives to his former self, there is no way I'll be able to stop him right now. At the end of the Dragon Demon War, Azel had to hold out until the outcome of the war was determined. However, he had exceeded expectation by defeating Atain. However, there was no way he would be able to win against Atain right now. The fact that his overall power level had dropped wasn't the only problem. If he put in time and effort, he was sure he could exceed the power he had in his prime. However, he could do nothing about the dragon demon weapons. Azel could recover his sword that splits the heaven, but the other twelve dragon demon weapons given to him by his comrades was gone forever. Moreover, he had been able to gather so many in the first place, because it had been the dragon demon war. Everything he was able to achieve was through blood and tears. After thinking it over, Azel shook his head from side to side. He asked Laura a question. I probably should have asked this in the beginning. Why did you surrender to me? That was the only way I would have survived the situation, and I wanted to observe you. Weren't you someone important in the plane of darkness? Your action was so foolhardy that I can't comprehend it. My position is worthless to me. I'm just a tool that's being used to further their ambitions. Laura spoke with a much colder voice. One could clearly make the distinction with her words from before. The king's revival is approaching, and the people, who were close to the king in the past, is impatient. This was why the Ornsaurus tribe unleashed such madness to acquire the perfect successor. They wanted to bask in glory next Atain after his revival. This goal drove them nuts. I wasn't born into this world through a normal process. They had wanted the perfect successor, 
so they created me through magic. I'm a doll they created. Countless siblings of mine were created for this purpose. All of them were killed through this experiment. Everyone was at a loss for words. The dragon demon worshippers were like human nobles. They put a lot of meaning behind bloodline and race. However, they went so far as to commit those acts. Laura spoke about her past in a calm manner to her audience, who were unable to speak. She told them about how she was born, and what she had to go through to become the heir of Ornsaurus. Her life story was long. There was no way her life could be described as being humane. Unlike the despairing nature of her situation, she spoke in such a serene manner. Laura gave her confession, and it captivated her audience. I became the heir of Ornsaurus, because I was the last one standing. I was created for this role, yet I never wanted it. This was a truth that Laura had never been able to tell others. Her family and close acquaintances didn't know about how she felt. She would have never imagined in a million years that a time would come when she would be telling her secrets to her enemies. However, she felt unusually relieved. Laura looked straight at Azel. I was born to be the heir of Ornsaurus, and I've lived to fulfill that role. I never thought about anything else. I never even thought about being anything else. After losing all her siblings, she had become the heir of Ornsaurus, and she no longer had any aspirations. She had just followed orders to achieve the wishes of her creators. She had merely been a doll following instructions. However, a strong desire was kindled when she saw Azel. This was a first for her. She wanted to observe him. She wanted to know more about him. These desires made Laura throw away all the shackles that had restrained her. She had lived up until now to bring others' wishes to reality. This was the first time she acted from her own desire. This was why she was willing to risk death to see this through. Laura looked at Azel with determined eyes as she spoke. I want to be by your side to see who you are, and what you will be able to accomplish. To achieve this goal, I'm willing to give you Ornsaurus's dragon weapon. One didn't need an elaborate ritual to pass on one's dragon demon weapon. It was the same when Liglan gave Azel one of his twin swords. When Liglan transferred the weapon, he had to suffer through losing a part of his soul forever. The process of giving the Vitans chalice to Azel was simple and short. Azel asked her a question. Are you okay? I'm a bit dizzy. Laura furrowed her brows. It felt as if there was a hole inside her chest. It felt empty. She had lost a presence that had been within her, and the sense of loss was bigger than expected. Azel spoke. A magical vacuum occurred where the dragon weapon used to occupy. It'll become better as time passes. He wasn't surprised at all as he received the Vitten's chalice. Laura asked him a question. Have you received a dragon weapon from someone else before? That's a secret. However, I am well informed about the process. You never give me a straight answer. You only ask me questions without a straight answer. At his words, Laura's expression slightly changed. It was a very small change, so it was hard to detect. However, if one was observant, one could see she was sulking. Laura spoke. Then I'll ask you another question. Is your dragon weapon perhaps the sword that splits the heaven used by Azel Khazar? Do you even need to ask that question? Dragon weapons are born with an innate name. The name can't be changed even in an attempt to hide its presence. As expected, she received the answer to her question, yet it didn't settle the confusion inside her head. Her confusion deepened. What was the identity of this man? Could a human really live this long? The problem was the fact that Azel was human. It didn't matter what method one used. It was impossible for a human to live this long. I'm pretty sure I heard the descendants of Kazark was completely wiped out. If one looked at this realistically, Azel Kazark probably went underground to prepare for the eventual return of the rooted forces of the dragon demon king. She guessed Azel Kazark passed down his dragon weapon through his descendants. However, her heart didn't allow her to believe in those conjectures. Maybe his plans weren't disseminated to us. Did it fail? Azel's words were causing confusion within her. It was true that the upper classes of the Plane of Darkness didn't tell the young generation everything. They left out a lot of information. She wondered if the truths she knew were actually lies. Azel asked her a question. 
So how were you able to inherit the Vitans chalice? Ha! Huh. Ormsaurus died at the hands of Carlos. However, he didn't die immediately on the battlefield. It was assumed he was able to retreat before he died, and he was able to pass it on his dragon weapon to his successor. However, Baldazark was killed, and his body was destroyed. So how was weapon passed on to his successor? Azel had killed Baldazark with his own hands. In the battle, Baldazark had used his dragon weapon called, Bleeding Star. There had been no chance for Baldazark to transfer his weapon. However, I'm pretty sure his descendant had used the Bleeding Star. Even in Laura's case, it was weird. Even if Ormsaurus was able to transfer his dragon weapon before death, wasn't the heir before Laura killed by the Guardian Shadows? How did she receive her dragon weapon? Laura spoke. The dragon weapons of the four dragon demon generals was preserved by the king's magic. While the magic set up inside the dragon demon castle is active, those dragon weapons will never be lost even if the owners died. Him. Azel wasn't surprised. He had an inkling that this would be the answer. Carlos was successful in preserving my dragon Macon. So of course, Atane could do it. Carlos was well qualified to be called an archmage. But in the case of Atane, it was hard to stick that title on him. Atane was a transcendent being, and archmage was an insufficient descriptor. If Carlos could do it, Atane could probably do it also. Is this restricted to only the dragon weapons of the four dragon demon generals? Yes, no one has been able to replicate the effect of this magic. Therefore, if I die, the Vitans chalice would be returned to the plane of darkness. I believe so. What if I transfer it to someone else? It won't return until the wielder dies. I see. When it becomes ownerless, the item is sent to a set location, and it is stored. Azel furrowed his brows. He tried to approach the Vitans chalice, which resided inside him now. During the Dragon Demon War, he remembered the nightmares caused by the Vitans chalice. Ornsaurus was a mage, and his power even without the dragon weapon made him a walking disaster. However, in terms of using the dragon weapon, he was superior to Atain. He never imagined that someday he'll be able to use Ornsaurus's dragon weapon. This was why they said anything could happen over time. He couldn't even see an inch further into his future, and it was marvelous. I don't see any problem with it. Chapter 112, To the Land of the Demons. Part 3. Azel thought about letting Chiron have the Vitans chalice. However, if Laura held bad intentions, Chiron wouldn't be able to fight back against her. Chiron had no experience in dealing with the dragon weapons. In contrast, Azel already had his dragon demon weapon, and he had a wealth of experience in inheriting dragon weapons from others. Even if Laura held evil intentions as she passed on her Vitans chalice, Azel was confident that he'll be able to deal with it. I don't think she has any wicked intentions, but it isn't something I can be sure about. He had put a shunt in Laura's energy pulse, so he knew she didn't hold any treacherous intentions. He also knew that the truths she spilled was all true and heartfelt. However, a person's heart was fickle. One could read a certain degree of emotions, but it was impossible to know the entirety of a person's heart. This was why he had to be cautious. Still, this is a troublesome item even for me. I'll have to conduct an extensive research. I guess it is understandable since the original owner of this item was a magician. Moreover, all the descendants were also magicians. I can see why it is more compatible with magicians. After he made sure the Vitans chalice settled into his energy pulse, Azel spoke. However, you weren't able to use it properly. I've never heard such an assessment before. This was the first time in her life where someone told her she was found wanting. Everyone said she possessed exceptional talent, and they complimented on her use of the dragon weapon. In terms of controlling the dragon weapon, she was graded more highly than Kieran, yet she was being criticized by Azel. Azel spoke. Well, I guess it is true that I've only seen you use the Vitans chalice using a defensive strategy. The fact that you were able to rescue Niberus using Vitans maze was praiseworthy. From what he remembered, Vitans chalice wasn't terrifying, because of its defensive capability. The true fear came from its attack capability. On the battlefield, 
Onsaurus used Vitan's maze to destroy the battle lines of his enemies. Sometimes, he isolated troops in a pocket dimension where he held a decisive edge to overwhelm and slaughter his enemies. He also warped space to redirect a portion of the army. It caused a great confusion when troops were suddenly traveling in different directions. Imagine, if you will, mounted soldiers charging at full gallop towards their enemies with their lances raised. What would happen if the direction of their charge was flipped? Moreover, what would happen if distance could be contracted? The mounted soldiers would have no choice, but to charge into their allies. This was why Ornsaurus made his enemies shudder in fear. He was someone to be avoided. The most terrifying part is the, the goblet that contains the heaven's tears. It was also the nickname of Ornsaurus. He created a huge distortion in the sky, and the sunlight gathered at a single focal point before being shot. It took a long time to set up this technique, but if it was allowed to be shot, it caused devastation. Laura was confused as she asked a question. You. It seems you know more about the Vitans' chalice than me. During the Dragon Demon War, Onsaurus was killed by Carlos. Atain used an extraordinary magic to preserve the Vitans' chalice with magic, and his heir was able to inherit it. However, Onsaurus hadn't been able to teach his techniques to his heir. The descendants had to research about Onsaurus through records. This was especially true for Laura, since her predecessor was killed by the Guardian Shadows. His research had not been passed down to her, so Laura was at an acute disadvantage. When he heard her explanation, Azel nodded his head. I see. I can see why you were deficient in terms of techniques. These techniques go through trial and error before the correct permutation was found. It would be quickly taught to the air, so the next generation could research and further develop the technique. However, this had not happened. Of course, Laura would be way behind in how she handled the Vitans' chalice compared to Ornsaurus. Azel spoke. I'll have to slowly research about the Vitans' chalice. Him, Euron and Leticia. I have a question for both of you. It seems you like asking questions to others as a hobby, while not answering other people's questions. Leticia spoke in a sarcastic manner. Azel grinned as he let the comment pass over him. If you think it is unfair, you should take the initiative in the conversation. You are a shameless man. I've heard that a lot before. I know your end's situation, so let's put that aside. Why are you fighting against the Dragon Demon King worshippers? I started fighting him around seven years ago. You've been fight them for quite a while, yet you aren't a Guardian Shadow. No, now that you brought it up, are you a member of the Guardian Shadows? I'm not, but this guy is one of them. Azel pointed towards Chiron. Leticia looked at Chiron with interest in her eyes. I see. Anyways, I've faced off against the Guardian Shadows as enemies before. However, I've never accepted him as allies. Why is that? I used to be a Dragon Demon King worshipper like Euron. As I expected, Azel had on an expression as if he had known this. Leticia asked him a question. Did you foresee my answer? I confirmed you used to be a Dragon Demon King worshipper right now. However, there was a commonality between you and Euron. The energy of black magic was deeply ingrained in them. Leticia wasn't a magician. She used the dragon arts, yet she possessed the energy of black magic. It was an uncommon characteristic, so he hypothesized that she used to be a dragon demon king worshipper in the past. Leticia nodded her head. You are quite perceptive. It is a bit creepy. Yes, it is as you've guessed. In the past, I was made to be a dragon demon king worshipper, and I was experimented on through black magic. In the end, the experiments pushed me into betraying them. What kind of tests? I'm not obligated to tell you that. All right, you said you were made. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit more about that? Him. Leticia furrowed her brows as she revealed her displeasure at Azel's inquisitive questions. She realized she had made a mistake in speaking so much about herself. My story is similar to the one told by the heir of Ornsaurus. In my case, I was from Almeric's faction. The Almeric tribe was like the Ornsaurus tribe. They wanted an outstanding heir, so they chose a method of madness. Leticia had been one of the candidates competing to become the heir. She was disqualified from a test, and she was thrown away to become a testing subject for black magic. 
I believe I've told you enough. As she spoke, Leticia's eyes were tumultuous as if she was ready to fight if Azel asked any more questions. Azel no longer asked prying questions. I've asked you enough about that topic. I'll ask you a different question. You are still curious about something. I'm curious about a lot of things. Aren't we both curious about each other? I'm pretty sure you haven't satisfied my curiosity yet. If you answer this question, I'll give you a chance to ask me a question. You are very adept at dangling a bait. It really makes me want to beat you to death. Thank you for the compliment. I'm curious about the identity of your master, who taught you the dragon arts. Him. Leticia's eyebrows rose. She had never expected this question. Why do you want to know that? I'm pretty sure you didn't learn it from the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Isn't that right? You are correct. After I escaped from the grasp, I met my master. I trained under him from two years. How did you know? I saw how you handled the dragon arts, and it made me think that I might know your teacher. A person you might know. It might be possible. Leticia didn't look too surprised by his assertion. She spoke. My teacher. He is a dragon demon named Jissel. I don't know about his origin nor his age. He used to live in a small village in the eastern portion of this country. He used to. He no longer lives there. After teaching me for two years, he left that place. I'm not sure where he is now. Him. Does the name ring a bell? No. I don't know that name. Moreover, he used to live with humans. Yes. He lived there, while he had his identity as a dragon demon out in the open. Yes. In the beginning, the people of the village was reticent, because he was a dragon demon of unknown origin. Moreover, he wasn't a noble. However, he actively helped out in solving troublesome problems around town. He also played with the children. It naturally led him to accept him into the fold. It seems I was mistaken. Azel had a suspicion. He had thought the man was using a fake identity. However, the only thing similar was the fact that that both were dragon demons. Jissel lived amongst the humans. The biggest difference was the fact that Jissel went out of his way to help humans, he even played with human children. He didn't resemble the dragon demon he had in mind. Leticia asked a question. Who were you looking for? His name was Rishu. Azel briefly thought about his past as he spoke. He was the dragon demon, who taught me how to wield the dragon's power. The party camped for the night in the ruined old castle, and they had decided to leave before the sun rose in the morning. Chiron was a bit confused by Azel's decision. I thought you would want to stay here a little bit longer. I want to do that, but... Azel looked at the ruined castle of Karzark, and he let out a bitter laugh. If I gave myself up to my memories, it'll be a never-ending process. I saw what I came here to see. He found out everything he wanted to know. When he came back to this land again, he would chase out all the groups associated with the darkness. He'll make this land habitable by humans. In truth, he wanted to comb over the land. He thought maybe Carlos might have left behind something here. However, he erased such desires. It wasn't, because Euron and Laura said this land was being watched by the plane of darkness. If Carlos had left something behind, this land wouldn't still be the land of demons. Moreover, the descendants of the county of Kazakh wouldn't have been wiped out. I've revealed my whereabouts to the enemies, so we can't just sit around here. I see. Azel had been blacklisted by the Plane of Darkness, and they were keeping an eye out for him. On top of that, the traitor Euron was with him. They had blood in their eyes for Euron, so, of course, they wouldn't stand by and do nothing. Moreover, even if I wanted to search this place, this is the territory of dragons. Many dragons made residence in the county of Kazakh. Aside from the several dragons, who had raised the county of Kazakh to the ground, more dragons had migrated to this location as time passed. So, one was in danger of fighting dragons if one explored this lands. However, Azel was about to say something, but Azel hesitated. He looked at the gloomy skies with surprised eyes. Chiron asked in puzzlement. What's wrong? Wait a moment. Instead of answering, Azel exited the castle. He climbed the walls, and he looked to the eastern sky atop a spire. Then he looked at the western portion of the forest with a mesmerized expression. Azel mumbled to himself. 
It is still alive. There was a mountain peak on the other side of the dark forest, and a being was taking flight into the air. The sun hadn't risen yet, so one could only see a silhouette in the dark. It looked like a bird, but Azel knew it wasn't one. No bird this large existed in this world. Flying dragon. As the sun came up, a being that was several times larger than the birds of praise was seen. It was almost impossible to believe such a large creature could fly. It flew over the old ruins of the Kazakh castle. He brought up a scene buried inside his mind. Near the county of Kazakh, there used to be three dragons. One of them used to be a flying dragon. It would fly towards the east to hunt, and when the sun sets, it flew back into the mountain. Azel and the whole county of Kazakh started and ended their days watching this sight. Point one for a brief moment, Azel's eyes met the flying dragon's eyes. The flying dragon was flying several hundred meters up in the air, but both knew that they were looking at each other. Azel lost the ability to speak as he started at the flying dragon. It was impossible for a human to understand what the dragon was thinking. The flying dragon kept its eyes on Azel as it circled around the Kazakh castle once, then it flew towards the east. Ha ha! Azel unconsciously let out a laugh when he saw the flying dragon fly into the distance. Ha 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 ha! Everything he had known had been destroyed, yet, the flying dragon had remained the same. It was a welcome sight. He was so happy that it felt as if tears would fall from his eyes. Chapter 113 to the land of the demons. Part 4. No one could comprehend Azel's actions. However, Azel didn't explain himself. The only one, who could question Azel's choices, was Chiron. However, he decided not to ask Azel anything. Many parts of Azel was a mystery to Chiron, but it seemed he had decided to just observe Azel. Chiron asked a question. So, where do you plan on going next? After Azel came to the county of Kazakh, he never spoke about his future plans. His head had been filled with the idea of reaching this place. I'm not sure. I might. Azel did have a plan in mind. After he woke up in this era, he always thought about what he should do. 220 years had passed, and he wanted to find a survivor. He wanted someone, who he could talk to about the old days. He didn't want to find such a being, because he wanted to fill the emptiness caused by his longing. There must be someone out there that could fill in the blank that had been caused by his sleep. Moreover, he needed allies, who were like himself. He needed beings, who would fight alongside him. Unfortunately, the only survivors he confirmed were his enemies. He even checked with Chiron. No one, who went through the Dragon Demon War, was still alive on his side. He even read official accounts that confirmed the deaths of all the dragon demons from that time. Their deaths couldn't be solely blamed on time. The dragon demon king worshippers might have made sure that they didn't survive. Anyways, Azel only had one hope he could cling to. I'm going to the Alberton Forest. Hmm, perhaps. Are you talking about the land of the demons on the east of the continent? Chiron asked in surprise. Land of demons Alberton Forest. This was before the fracture of the Nadic Empire. This storied land of the demons rebuffed any attempt of human invasion. Numerous dragons took residence in this land a long time ago, and even at the height of the Nadic Empire, they didn't dare to make this place their territory. Azel nodded her head. Yes. Why are you going to such a faraway location? Moreover, the only information known about that place is the fact that it is dangerous and the place is full of dragons. I'm going to go meet a dragon. Him. Chiron's eyebrows rose. It wasn't just him. Everyone looked as if they couldn't understand Azel's decision. Laura asked a question. If you plan on doing the dragon slayer's ritual, you don't have to go there. There are plenty of dragons elsewhere. That isn't it. Actually, I might as well do the dragon slayer's ritual, since I'm visiting there. You might as well. Laura was dumbfounded. Even in the plane of darkness, the Dragon Slayer's ritual was only performed by those accomplished in terms of skills and achievements within the organization. It was an honorable tribulation where one had to put one's life on the line. She knew Azel challenged and won in the Dragon Slayer's ritual. However, she never expected him to speak so lightly of the ritual. Azel asked her a question. 
How much does the plane of darkness know about the Alberton forest? We don't have a lot of information about that place. We know there are dragons there. And there's a group there, who worship the dragons. There are those who worships the dragons. What do you mean? The one to pose the questions was Chiron. Laura answered him. We don't know anything definite. However, they were very strong, so we couldn't be rash in acting against them. So you are basically saying there is another organization aside from the dragon demon king worshippers and guardian shadows that resides in the shadow of the world. Aren't there also other secret societies and groups of black magicians that aren't affiliated with you guys? There are a lot of them. However, we do use some of them. Azel was astute enough to pick out what Laura had omitted. Is this how you guys are able to operate without revealing yourselves as dragon demon king worshippers? Or are you guys trying to take advantage of the fact that guardian shadows don't intervene unless the dragon demon king worshippers involves themselves? Yes. Moreover, it is an attempt to obfuscate the eyes of the humans. I see. The dragon demon king worshippers would have to be eradicated even in human society. The deep wounds had been created in the dragon demon war. And while 200 years had passed, the wounds hadn't healed yet. This was also why the Dragon Demon King worshippers had worked hard to hide their existence, even when there weren't in any danger from the Guardian Shadows. Chiron asked a question. What do you mean by you are going to meet a dragon? Chiron was having a trouble comprehend what was going on. Azel was speaking as if he was going to go see an acquaintance. However, the only reason Azel had to seek out a dragon was to conduct a dragon slayer's ritual. Azel spoke. You already know why dragons conducts the dragon slayer's ritual. If the dragon wins, it can gain wisdom from the humans. In the past, a lot of humans and dragon magens conducted the dragon slayer's ritual. There were people like me, who were able to take the power of the dragons, to become much stronger. However, there were also losers, who had to give up their wisdom. What are you trying to say? What if, on this world, what if there were dragons, who were able to win numerous dragon slayers ritual. What would have happened to those dragons, who achieved their ultimate wish? The dragon's wish is to gain wisdom. Are you saying a wise dragon resides in the Alberton forest? Chiron asked the question, and his expression indicated that he was having hard time believing the story. Azel grinned. The ruler of the Alberton forest is the only dragon I know, who had freed itself from the dragon slayers ritual. This particular dragon had gained the wisdom it had wanted, so it has no reason to carry out the dragon slayer's ritual. The name of the dragon known by Azel was Alberton. It was a dragon, who had freed itself from its own fate. After leaving the county of Kazakh, they immediately headed east. Chiron grumbled. We left one land of the demons to go to another land of the demons. I feel like an explorer, who seeks out land of the demons. Events somehow turned out like this. Are you perhaps going to another land of the demons after the Alberton Forest? They do sound like attractive destinations to visit. I'll take it into consideration. The continent is large and there are a lot of land of demons. They bantered with each other as the party started moving at an astonishing speed. When they were trying to find a suitable place for a lunch break, Laura asked a question. She sounded fed up. Do you guys always travel at this speed? Before you guys joined us, we traveled much faster. The party had been traveling for four hours, and they were traveling in a straight line at 60 kilometers per hour. It didn't matter what the terrain was like. They were traveling at a surprising speed. But while they were coming to the county of Kazakh, Azel and Chiron had traveled at 300 kilometers per hour. Basically, they were traveling at a very leisurely speed right now. Euron looked as if he couldn't believe that statement. You traveled faster than this. That sounds preposterous. Euron was a magician, so he was able to use flight magic. He wasn't affected too much by the terrain. It wasn't as if the terrain had no effect on him. If one flew higher, one needed more skill, and the magical energy was consumed at a faster rate. He had been flying over mountains, lakes, forests and plains for the past four hours. They were traveling in a straight line to their destination at 60 kilometers per hour. It was pushing urine to his limit. His magical reserve was being squeezed dry, and it made him wonder if he was better off running on the ground. 
He was so tired that he didn't think he could travel anymore. However, they were actually traveling at a slow pace. Chiron spoke in a nonchalant manner. We are just matching your speed. Do you realize how far the Alberton Forest is? Are you perhaps thinking about running all the way towards the Alberton Forest? You are going to run from the Midwest of the continent to the eastern portion of the continent. What other method is there? If you are suggesting we ride horses, it is a non-starter. Horses are too slow. If you can't even keep up with this pace, we can go our separate ways. I'll just drag Laura along. Laura was having a much easier time keeping up with them compared to Euron. Azel still had a shunt in her energy pulse, but he allowed her to use her magical energy. He could monitor her in real time, so he could seal her magical energy at any time. Laura spoke when she heard Chiron's words. I've seen files that said the dragon sword duke transcends common sense. You are amazing. Does the plane of darkness really view me like that? What else do they say about me? You are known as someone who hasn't learned the forgotten secret techniques. However, you were known as someone with abundant power, so if possible, we were instructed to avoid you. Before he met Azel, Chiron hadn't been able to learn any secret techniques. However, he was someone that was still feared by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. He may be a blank slate in terms of skills learned, but he had developed his powerful Dragon Demon magic to the extremes. Moreover, he had been able to make the Dragon Sword through his own research. He was able to reach a frightening level by combining his technical sense of manipulating the dragon demon magic and his fearsome battle capabilities. Chiron grinned. I see. It is an old assessment of me, but I'll take it as a compliment. After meeting Azel, Chiron now knew secret techniques. His overall fighting power was much higher than before. Even Azel remarked in admiration at how fast Chiron was able to learn techniques. He had been a master for over 100 years, but he was able to absorb Azel's teaching as if he was a young man in his growth phase. He was growing at a very rapid pace. Laura spoke. Our agents couldn't track you, so we thought you had some kind of high-speed transportation device. However, you were moving in such a primitive way. The Guardian Shadows were a big mystery to those in the Plane of Darkness. Therefore, whenever they didn't understand something about the Guardian Shadows, they assumed that the Guardian Shadows were using some special method. When it looked as if Chiron was using some kind of abnormal travel ability to move around the continent, they were suspicious as to whether the Guardian Shadows had a mode of transportation similar to the Road of Emptiness. Chiron asked in puzzlement, Road of Emptiness, it is a legacy left behind the king. Laura described the Road of Emptiness. Chiron was astonished. You are able to jump space to get to various locations on the continent. Such ridiculous magical device exists. So this the reason why you guys are so elusive. Is it nearby? Azel, who had been listening silently, suddenly intruded into the conversation. Laura tilted her head in puzzlement. I'll have to look at a map. Why? We'll have to modify our course. While we are heading towards the Alberton Forest, we'll attack as many way stations connected to the road of emptiness. At those words, Laura's eyes turned round. She never expected him to attack these locations as soon as he heard about it. Laura spoke. It would be pointless in eliminating all the troops guarding the road of emptiness. It can't be used by outsiders. That is unfortunate. However, I think it'll be worth it to just destroy it. You should refrain from doing so. Euron butted in. When Azel looked at him, he spoke. The Road of Emptiness is a legacy that is controlled through the great darkness residing with Queen Ainsera. The mere act of approaching it would alert Ainsera of your existence. This is the reason why Leticia and I never attacked the few way stations we were aware of. Him. Azel furrowed his brows. If it is as Euron described, he had to weigh the benefit of suppressing the enemy's transcendent mobility against exposing his location to his enemies. In the end, which would be more beneficial? I have to think this through. The threat level of the road of emptiness was too high to leave it alone. The fact that they could exchange information in real time was an overwhelming advantage. Moreover, it also allowed the transport of people. This device did not exist in the era of the Dragon Demon War. Him. Wait a moment. 
It meant Attain had finished creating this legacy before he died. So why hadn't he used this in the Dragon Demon War? When he asked about this point, Laura answered. Only a limited number of people can travel through it. The Road of Emptiness had limited fixed destinations it can travel to, and it was impossible to move a large number of troops through it. This was why they formed attack organizations across the continent. The officers were the only ones that would be able to use the Road of Emptiness. Azel accepted the explanation. I see. I'm glad there are such limitations to the device. It wasn't probably known during the Dragon Demon War, but they probably used it to transport small amount of troops. What should we do? At Chiron's question, Azel thought about it for a bit before he made a decision. We'll give up on my idea. If we could use it, it'll be worth attacking the way stations even if we overextend ourselves. Since we can't use it, it would be better for us to operate under the radar for a while. It would be great if we can alert the Guardian Shadows to attack the way station in my kingdom. That I can agree with. Is that possible? Him. In truth, it might be impossible to arrange it right now. They had already crossed two borders, so it would be difficult to get a message to the Rulin Kingdom. They could enlist the Guardian Shadows, but it was uncertain if they would deliver the message. Azel felt regret at the missed opportunity. That is too bad. If we could use it, we could immediately infiltrate the Plane of Darkness. Larua was surprised by his words. Even you will get killed trying to pull that off. I guess so. Azel passively accepted her assessment. The core forces of the Dragon Demon King worshippers were all gathered at the Plane of Darkness. It wouldn't be easy to take all of them down. Still, we have to do something. We have to stop the revival ritual before Atain is able to revive. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm really curious as to who you really are. You can continue to be curious until you figure out the answer. Mini. Laura's lips made a small pout. Chapter 114. To the Land of the Demons. Part 5. I was awakened after a very long time, so I went out to enjoy a fight. Yet it seems the really interesting news was actually waiting for my return. Is it true that the heir of Ornsaurus betrayed us? The amused Ragus asked the question. He had died once to become an undead, but he had not fallen into depression like the other undeads. Instead of despairing, he remained cheerful. It made one wonder what his personality was like when he was alive. He was one of the four dragon demon generals, and there weren't many figures he admired in this world. The dragon demon king's first wife, Ain Sarah, was one of the, the rare ones to hold his esteem. That is right. How did that come about? I have no idea. In the first place, I could never tell what that child was thinking inside. Maybe, the Ornsaurus tribe is at fault for improperly educating her. Him. I shouldn't bother you by pressing for more details. I'll ask my subordinate about it. You are unchanged. I'll accept that as a compliment. I was resurrected from death, yet I remain unchanged. Isn't it splendid? Ragus barked out a laugh. When he was alive, Ragus was very informal with his subordinates. He joined the rank and file to drink alcohol, and in recent days, he enjoyed gossiping and playing around with the servants. In the past, Ain Sarah had been very overt in showing her displeasure with his overall attitude. However, her attitude was completely different now. She had told him he had remained unchanged. However, her voice and expression remained indifferent. She didn't show any emotions. Ragus spoke. I think the queen has changed a lot. A lot of time has passed. I don't think that's the only reason. This is a tribulation I must endure. Ain Sarah knew very well what she had lost. However, she didn't have any emotions left to recoil at her change. Her soul was nothing but a thick husk. She only wanted to achieve her heart's wish. She prioritized her task above all else. Ragus just looked at her. He was an undead, so at a time like this, he was able to hide all emotions. It was an unpleasant sight, but Ain Sarah just accept his scrutiny. She was like an unfeeling doll. In the end, Ain Sarah asked a question. What result were you able to achieve through the fight? Him. The fight was very good. It was beyond expectation. As expected, the king's magic is incredible. I thought it was an absolute travesty when I realized I was an undead. However, since I've woken up, 
I'm liking this body more and more. It is a bit troubling. That's fortunate. Your existence has already been revealed to the guardian shadows, so I'm not going to be conservative in how I use you. I expect your active participation from now on. If I can run amok, I'll welcome it. This is why I spurned the courtship of the netherworld to come back here. You'll have plenty of opportunity to do so. Also, did you find out anything about Carlos? Unfortunately, I couldn't force those bastards to speak. We'll have to wait for the trackers to bring back some useful information. Regus had put down a trap for the keepers of the prophecy. He had done it to find out more about Carlos. However, Delta and Zeta got in his way until the end, and they didn't divulge any information. Ain Sarah spoke. However, I'm skeptical. I don't think the sinner Carlos is still alive. In all these years, the great darkness was never able to find his trace. I don't know if he is alive. However, I'm sure he exists somewhere in the world. In my opinion, the Guardian Shadows are a strong candidate. You are saying he might have become an undead. Yes. My opinion was reinforced after I met the Guardian Shadows. They were almost a complete product just like me. Moreover, is something bothering you? Regus stopped speaking for a brief moment as he fell into his thoughts. Ain Sarah queried him. Regus organized the thoughts floating around inside his head before he spoke. Him. It is nothing. I'll speak to you about it once I get a firmer grip on this idea. Anyways, it is my opinion that the magicians, who are able to pull this off, is uncommon. This is true even if one considered the magicians across the ages. From the moment Regus was awakened, he just knew Carlos was alive somewhere in this world. A Tyne's magic was like a divine revelation, and this truth was delivered to Regus. When this information was disseminated, the planes of darkness was turned upside down. At the same time, they devoted all their efforts into finding any trace left behind by Carlos. I'll see myself out. Regus did a courtly bow, and the gesture did not look right on his bulky body. Afterwards, he left Ain Sarah. When Regus exited the Queen's room, Regus saw an old dragon demon with grey horns waiting for him. The old dragon demon approached him, and the old dragon demon gave back the massive battle hammer to him. Regus hadn't been able to take his weapon into the meeting with the queen, so he had left it behind. The queen has sacrificed a lot of herself. We exist now, because of her sacrifice. The old dragon demon named Chains had a cold expression on his face. He was Regus's lieutenant during the dragon demon war. Now he was one of the influential being that ruled over the plain of darkness. However, when Regus awoke as an undead, Chains insisted on assisting Regus. Suddenly, Chains spoke. I never expected all of this to take this long. I agree. When I heard that it was 223 years since the king's death, I thought it was a joke. It took so long to raise an undead like me. I guess it means the capabilities of this body should be excellent. Still, I'm not sure what to think about all of this. Regus had awakened as an undead in recent days. He was brought back through the magic of the dragon demon king, so he was a very special undead. He was an undead, yet his memories and his thought process remained crystal clear. He wasn't swept up by the madness. Even his five senses remained. Regus was dead, yet it almost felt as if he was still alive. The fact that he was having a difficult time differentiating between the two states was confusing, yet he liked having such a dilemma. Now that he was awake, the plane of darkness took it as a sign that the king's revival was near. It seemed he was tied to the ritual of revival that was ongoing in the basement of the dragon demon palace. Chains spoke. By the look of you, I think it was well worth the time. If one looked only at my battle capabilities, it definitely was worth the time. While he was giving his reply, a question popped up inside Regus's mind. Those bastards were very similar to me. This was the fact that he had refrained from telling Ain Sarah. The Guardian Shadow's undeads felt somehow very similar to him. Are those bastards related to the king's magic? Well, the king was very lax about protecting his magic. There's a chance that someone might have developed a similar magic using the remnants of spells left behind by him. If not, did Carlos really become involved in their creation? After thinking about it for a brief moment, Regus opened his mouth. 
You look really old now. A lot of time has passed. 223 years wasn't a short amount of time even for Dragon Demon. At the time of the Dragon Demon Wars, Chains was a young man. Now he was a white-haired old man. It really drove home the fact that a lot of time had passed. In truth, Regus was very surprised that Chains was still alive. Chains wasn't a first-generation dragon demon, yet he had lived well past 400 years. You should be letting the young ones do all the work, while you play around. Why did you come running to me? You should have sent your decent subordinates to me. I've raised several promising ones. I'll introduce them to you soon. As expected, you probably don't want to do all the odd jobs at your old age. Isn't it to be expected? I've advanced enough in my station where I'm able to put my nose in the air. You are still the same. Such a long time had passed, yet you are the same. I like it. Regus was elated, so he tried to hum. However, the sound of air leaking out was heard, and a dark energy of the curse was dispersed. He couldn't make the sound he wanted to make. Naturally, he tried to click his tongue in dismay, but he didn't have a tongue. It was impossible. This body is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece, yet I have a long way to go before I accept it as my own body. It isn't a hindrance in battle, but I'm not satisfied with that. The skeleton cackled as his shoulders shook. I want to eat meat dripping with blood. I'm sad, because it is a dream that is forever out of my reach. Well, it's all right. I'm sure there are other edibles that are considered to be delicacies for the undead. Maybe, I'll go look for that. If you want something, I'll help you acquire it. I'm just saying anything that crosses my mind. Him, you still haven't answered my question. I have two reasons. One is an official reason, and the other one is a personal reason. Tell me the official reason first. While you were gone, I've advanced enough in my station where I'm now in charge of leading a faction. It isn't something too impressive. It pales in comparison to your achievements. However, now that everyone is saying the king's revival is drawing near, I have a chance to secure a foothold with you. I'm just a walking corpse now. What benefit will you gain by sticking by me? I don't really have anyone else I can carry favor with. I see. All right, so what is the personal reason? My life isn't fun anymore. Him, I usually hide here with a devious smile on my face. I just plot against the humans, and I find such work to be boring. If I'm with the general, this old man will have a chance to jump into a fight where my blood will boil. That is very. You aren't really acting your age. Now that I think about it, I remember the common criticism against you was the fact that you didn't act your age. Ha, huh. now that you've aged a little bit, you are trying to act cheeky towards me. I'm already dead, so who care what my age is? After Balun's death, no undead counts their age. Balun, him, ah, I guess kids from these days won't know about him. I'm not of the younger generation, yet I do not know about him. You would have known his name if you've lived 400 years longer. This was in the distant past, and the bastard had numerous bouts with the king. He fought against the king. That is news to me. Well, there are countless beings that were killed by the king. Currently, the name Atain is officially entered into the public records as someone against the world. However, at one time, he was considered to be a hero, who had saved the world. These kinds of events happened quite often throughout history. Regus went over the past events. Before he was killed, he had lived a very long time. He was basically a walking history book. He was born to no parents, so he was a first-generation dragon demon. He had transcended mortality to live a very long life. At that time, I wasn't serving the king as a dragon demon general. Yes, I was a companion of the wise, yet whimsical magician named Atain. Chain's ears perked up. He was of an age where he told the younger generation about the old stories. However, at that moment, he felt as if he was thrown back to his childhood. He had listened to the stories from the adults with a twinkle in his eyes. The king, Almeric and I got together to carry out this task. Truthfully, I didn't have a great relationship with Almeric during that time. Him, I'll skip that part of the story. At the time, we weren't even acquainted with Ornsorus and Baldazark yet. Anyways, 
It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Balloon was the worst foe we've ever encountered. He was that powerful. He must have been one of the first generation dragon demon. No. He was a human. To be precise, he used to be a human. A human. A human was a threat to the three of you. You sound skeptical. You should keep in mind that we lost to a human in the dragon demon war. That is true. Well, Balloon wasn't a living human being. The king designated him as being the first to deny death. He was also called the originator of the black magicians. Balloon was a being who had lived for a very long time. Countless beings lived on the surface of the world, yet he was the first to deny death. He had raised himself as an undead. Basically, undeads didn't exist before Balloon. According to our king's words, most of the necromancy skills that exist right now was cultivated by Balloon. My god, such a being existed in this world. He existed. There is a first for everything. Balloon was as unique as the first king anointed by the dragon demons. At the time, Balloon wanted to change the world. He theorized that the pain one received over the course of one's life happened, because one was alive. This was why he wanted all the beings on this world to transcend life and death. In some aspects, he was a bigger calamity to the world than Atain. However, in the end, Atain and his companions was able to take him down. After he finished his story, Ragus suddenly remembered something. Come to think of it, I heard some of our kids were betrayed. What happened? The surviving members of each tribe devoted their efforts into developing the future generation. This resulted in the current young generation being quite skilled, even though they are inexperienced. However, it seemed the mental aspect of their education was deficient. I don't want to hear about the boring details. Would you like to hear about the child who betrayed us first? Or would you like to hear about the children, who were beaten to a pulp? Tell me about the one that betrayed us. How inhospitable were we to her that a child of that station abandoned everything? Why would she run away? Him. In truth, she wasn't treated well. This is especially true for the Ornsaurus tribe. They are out of control. In what way? I don't know the full story. This was all gathered through rumors. Chains was a survivor of the Dragon Demon War. So he was one of the heavyweights that ruled over the Plain of Darkness. However, during the Dragon Demon War, he had merely been a lieutenant serving under Ragus. This was why he had less power than the survivors with blood ties to Ornsaurus and Baldazar. This was why he could only rely on information gathered from spies and rumors to discern what was going on in the different factions. The great darkness within Ainsera united the Plane of Darkness under the same banner, but factions within the Plane of Darkness weren't unified. The Ornsaurus tribe conducted countless tests and rituals to be able to artificially create a perfect heir. It is rumored that the betrayer Laura Ornsaurus was the product of their efforts. Him, they did something that insane. Regus was surprised. Regus was one of the main principals, who helped Atain, light the world on fire through war. However, even he was taken aback by Chain's story. If it is true, it was stupid of them. The child was made using their blood. Basically, they put forth a doll made through magic as the heir of Ornsaurus. Him. Ragus expressed a really complicated, yet subtle feeling. The beings, whom he had fought with against the world, were showing signs of madness. It really hammered home the fact that a lot of years had passed. In regards to that story, I'll hear the details later. What about the kids, who were beaten up? They, after a short amount of time, Ragus heard the full story from Chains. The light within the eye sockets couldn't hide the surprise and interest he felt. Chapter 115, Guide's Gift. Part 1. Every night Euron Rizester went to sleep, he always had a dream. The guide in his dream had approached him one day, and now he always had a dream every night. Now he couldn't remember a time when he didn't have a dream. In the end, you met your destiny, Euron. At a glance, Euron could tell he wasn't in reality. He could see numerous fragments of memories connected to each other and the guide's words came to Euron in this chaotic space. The guide's voice allowed Euron to be able to think clearly, and a sense of calmness was promoted from within. The dream of the guide was different from a lucid dream. However, his consciousness wasn't fully awake. 
He couldn't remember all that went on within his dreams. It was similar to a half-asleep state. He was asleep, but he was conscious of what was happening around him in reality. It felt as if someone was whispering into his ears. Ah, it was as you said. The man makes me think of Azel Kazark from the legends. Right, the heir of Ornsaurus suspects that Azel Kazark is the original Azel. Well, that isn't possible, but he does make one think it is a possibility. It had only been several days since Euron had met Azel. However, Azel became more remarkable as Euron continued to look at him. It was as the guide had said. Euron thought Azel really might be able to open up a path that will allow him to bring down the Dragon Demon King worshippers. He will show you the answer. I only tell you what you have to do, but he will the one to lead your destiny. If he is the descendant of Azel Kazark, our meeting seems very fateful. After 220 years, the descendants of the hero Azel Kazark and Archmage Carlos Rizesta had met. If the two of them allied with each other to eradicate the evil left behind by the dragon demon King Atain, how poetic would it be? The guide spoke. It is destiny. Your relationship with him has to proceed forward, so you have to be on his good side. The road will open when you gain his trust. I'll work on it. This is why I am here. Euron was having a nightmare even though he wasn't asleep. If he spaced out for a brief moment, nightmare-like thoughts plagued him. There were people out there, who were deprived of their lives like Euron. The dragon demon king worshippers turned people into tools, and the fact that they were suffering even now was horrifying to Euron. Then there were the children he had tried to rescue. In the end, they had all died, and he could still hear their screams. He had driven him towards their deaths. You did your best. However, the result was the worst. Euron. I know. It is useless to blame myself. Leticia already nags me about it so much that I'm fed up with the topic. Euron shook his head from side to side. He had a sad smile on his face. I have to help him to end all of this. Even if I die, it is my duty. He had walked through the long darkness to find a person, who might become the light of hope. Euron had to earn Azel's trust at all cost. He had to become Azel's companion. The guide's voice remained silent for a brief moment before it spoke again. All right, I'll give you knowledge that'll allow you to gain his trust. Is there anything else I can do except fight by his side? Of course. Time is precious right now. At this moment, the world is going through a sudden change. There is too little time left to build trust and camaraderie through human interactions. What is happening? You already have the answer. Is it the dragon demon king Atine's revival? When Euron asked the question, he felt a peculiar reverberation. Dragon demon king Atain. He said this name countless times before, but he now suddenly felt a weird sensation. Before he became preoccupied with this point, the guide continued to speak. That isn't the problem. Then what is it? This will cause the plane of darkness to move in earnest. I'm not sure what you are trying to say. Think this through Euron. You have to come up with the answer for yourself. You can't just expect me to feed you all the information. If not, you'll just become my puppet. This is why I'm conflicted. If you were a demon trying to destroy me, you wouldn't say stuff like this to me. Maybe, this is all part of my design. Ah, all right, good. Euron compiled the information available to him, and he came up with several possibilities. The plane of darkness had countless schemes ongoing on the continent. In the past 200 years, there had been several changes of generations. Each change of generation provided an opportunity for the dragon demon king worshippers to worm their way into the human society. They haven't revealed themselves. They might after a time's revival, but they don't have the power to pick a fight with the world. The plane of darkness hid in the shadow of the world as they schemed. They did this, because they didn't possess the power they once possessed in the dragon demon war. In the past, they had enough forces to take over the world. Of course, if they concentrated their forces now, they would be able to fight and win against a single country. However, their existence would be revealed to the seven kingdoms in the process. No, the whole world would become their enemy, and only ruination awaited the dragon demon king worshippers. If that is true, the only thing I can think of is the fact that they want to sow chaos from the shadows. 
That is what they've been doing up until now. What has changed? Him. I'm not sure. Their goal was to make human society diseased. Will they instigate a war between humans? That is one of the right answers. Really? Well, I guess that is within their capability. It would be crazy for the plane of darkness to reveal themselves and go to war with the humans. However, they had infiltrated all the ranks and classes of society, so it was possible to engineer a war. However, that isn't all there is to the plan. No, the fact that a war will start soon is correct. War is the most violent way to exhaust the power of humans. It isn't just about a fight between humans. There are other beings aside from humans. So they'll try to bring beings from other races, who aren't affiliated with the dragon demon king worshippers, into a fight with the humans. That is also another correct answer. They've been conducting numerous experiments. For example, are you talking about the Grand Alliance of Darkness that popped up in the Rulan Kingdom? Yes. The Grand Alliance of Darkness had threatened the Rulan Kingdom around 30 years ago, and they had been created by the Plane of Darkness. The strong and wise mutant orc named Dakon had been made with evil magic. It had been surprisingly easy to gather monsters by propping Dakon up as a leader. The winds of change will blow over the world. Be prepared for the ensuing chaos. The guide had told Euron a surprising amount of information. If the guide's words were correct, he could buy Azul's trust with it. The guide's words had never been wrong before. Suddenly, Euron asked a question. I never expected such an arrangement to exist. It is amazing. Anyways, isn't it time for you to tell me who you are? It would be meaningless to tell you. Why? You'll forget it once this dream ends. The answer will come to you at the right time. But, the dream ended there. Azul's party was moving at a much slower pace than they had originally planned. A week had passed, since they had left the county of Kazakh. Currently, they had decided to rest at an inn. Chiron grumbled. We should have already covered twice the distance by now. That magician moved like a snail. Are you trying to kill me? If so, you should just tell it to me straight. Euron grumbled. If one was looking at a map, they were traveling in a straight line at 60 kilometers per hour. They were traveling at an incredibly high speed. It defied common sense. If a layman saw Euron fly, one wouldn't understand how difficult it was to fly through the air. Flight over a long period of time required the extreme consumption of magical energy, stamina and willpower. It was very remarkable that a young man like Euron was able to keep up with the pace. In terms of innate magical energy, Laura was more outstanding than Euron, yet even she was exhausted. Leticia, who trained in the dragon arts, was keeping up, but it hadn't been easy for her. However, I can't deny this is good training for me. Normally, Regular magicians never thought about using flight magic to travel a long distance at high speeds. The reasons were as previously stated. Those reasons also applied to Laura. She was demanded to do tasks that she had never been required to do before. She could feel herself improve. On the first day, she had been completely gassed. She needed to be carried by Azel to the next town. However, she was now reached their next destination under her own power. This will be most effective when I have to run away. Leticia had to expend quite a lot of energy when she had to run away from Dragon Demon King worshippers in the past. However, she never overdid it, because she had to preserve her battle capability. However, if she was put in a similar situation, she would now have an easier time evading her trackers. Leticia made a remark to Azel. I never knew the human body could move so well. Even if he was a spirit order practitioner, the way he moved was absurd. Azel was equipped lightly, but he carried all the baggages needed for the trip. He ran across mountain and forests, while carrying such a burden. Chiron smirked at her words. If my friend wanted to, he could travel much faster than me. In truth, I'm slowing him down. If I'm grabbing at his ankles, you guys are like balls and chain on his feet. Him, what are you saying? you'll have a chance to see it later. Even I don't dare to imitate what he does. Azel was able to teach Chiron a lot of techniques. However, Chiron wasn't able to learn, incarnation, which allowed one to create a clone of substance. In the first place, it was a skill incompatible with him. Chiron had rarely used the cloning technique before. 
This was why Chiron couldn't learn the long-range flight technique devised by Azel. Chiron spoke. You are doing pretty well in keeping up with us, Leticia. I've always preferred to run on my own to feet. However, I've never experienced traveling long distances day after day like this. It is hard for me to see you guys as being sane. Leticia shook her head from side to side. Chiron looked at her with interest. He didn't know what the Dragon Demon King worshippers did to her. However, she possessed more Dragon Demon magic as a Dragon Magian compared to most Dragon Demons. She was the most talented female practitioner of the Dragon Arts he had seen in his lifetime. If you are overflowing with energy, why don't we spar? Azel doesn't play with me anymore, so I'm a little bit bored. You are old, yet. You are overflowing with energy. Even as she said those words, Leticia looked interested. It would be a lie to say she hadn't wanted to fight him during the week-long travel. Euron spoke as he saw the two of them exit towards the backyard of the inn. Ah, youth, you are the youngest amongst us. Laura, who was lounging around, spoke. Chapter 116, Guide's Gift, Part 2. After Azel left the county of Kazakh, he hadn't sparred with Chiron. The reasons were simple. He had to constantly monitor the magical energy shunt that he had placed inside Laura. Then there was the need for him to deal with the dragon weapon, Vitin's chalice. As expected, an item infused with magic is troublesome for me. The distortion of space wasn't the only function possessed by Vitin's chalice. Variety of magical spells were infused into this dragon weapon. All dragon weapons from magicians were like this. Niberus possessed the Book of Darkness, and it also was infused with magical spells. When one inherited a dragon weapon from a magician, a magical spell one wasn't skilled enough to use through one's own skills could be used if it was infused into the dragon weapon. However, Azel wasn't a magician. It would have been great if he could use it by providing the magical energy. This particular dragon weapon wouldn't activate automatically. The magic spells infused into the Vitin's chalice were linked using a high-level method. All these magical spells were easy to use only if one was able to use this link. This really is a tool for a magician. It is incompatible with me. Azel grumbled to himself. Laura, who was observing him from the opposite side, was dumbfounded by his words. It has only been several days yet you've already mastered the Vitten's maze. If it has nothing to do with magic, it isn't a problem for me. Azel was learning the functions of the Vitten's chalice at a surprisingly rapid pace. He had already learned the Vitten's maze, and he was successful in partially forming the, the goblet containing the heaven's tears. However, he couldn't use any of the magic infused into the item. This was why he couldn't even operate it at half its capacity. So are you experienced in dealing with a variety of dragon weapons? Are you interrogating me? If you are really the Azel Kazakh, I might be. Laura had those intentions, so she didn't deny it. Azel spoke. Have fun speculating. Laura had a sulky look as she closed her mouth. Azel smirked as he looked at her. Anyways, this girl. Does she really have no ill intentions towards us? If one inherited a dragon weapon from a wielder, who had ill intent, it was basically like keeping a bomb inside one's body. This was why Azel was constantly monitoring the Vitten's chalice to see if any changes took place. If he was hit in the back of the head, while his guard was down, it would be the end of him. However, a week had passed, and there was no signs of trouble. In the case of the Vitten's chalice, the item did seem discontent at being owned by Azel, but it didn't show any signs of putting up a fight or cause him harm. Him. The dragon weapons all possessed a sense of self. This was why the Vitten's chalice knew about Azel's existence, and it did harbor a feeling of hesitancy towards him. Every time he perceived the Vitten's chalice, its feelings were sent towards him. However, at the same time, dragon weapons were tools. Once the proper process of being transferred to a new owner occurred, the dragon weapon became subservient. The feelings about the past was less important. The new owner was the most important being to the dragon weapon. Azel suddenly spoke. This might be a bit abrupt, but your disguise is flawless. Laura looked like a human woman right now. Instead of wearing a dress that made her look like a daughter of a noble, 
she wore a simple traveler's clothes. Moreover, she had hidden all the special characteristics of a dragon demon. Her appearance was eye-catching, but in the end, she looked like a human. Azul's eyes could see through the illusion, so he could see her real self. However, there was something he couldn't detect. What method are you using to hide your dragon demon magic? Even Laura's dragon demon magic was completely hidden, and even a person with highly developed senses would see her as a human magician. Laura answered him, I used magic. Was it a spell developed within the plane of darkness? Yes, I see. You guys have to hide within human society, so I'm guessing the disguise has to be airtight. The fact that you guys were able to develop a spell that is so easy to learn is impressive. What do you mean? All the Dragon Demon King worshippers seems to be using that particular spell. Ah, I guess the only ones who have to hide their Dragon Demon magic are the top tier troops. Maybe it is a difficult spell to use. It is very difficult. Ha! Huh, it is a very difficult magic for the rank and file to use. Azel shook his head in disbelief as he asked the question. Let me stop you right there. How difficult is it? For example, could a member of the Dragon's Shadow pull it off? Dragon's Shadow? Which Dragon's Shadow are you talking about? Laura tilted her head in confusion. Azel furrowed his brows. There are more than one organizations like the Dragon's Shadow. At the very least, each country has one. It is unusual to see more than two in a country. The organizations on the bottom all have similar names. Basically, one or two of the lower organizations could gather enough high-quality fighters to contend with a fighter like the Dragon Demon Princess. Are you sure these are the lower-end organizations? These are the organizations at the bottom of the totem pole. Didn't Euron Rizester tell you about them? What are you talking about? There is an apparatus with the plane of darkness that churns out fighters. These are certified fighters, such high-quality troops can be developed so easily. Azel was surprised. Laura spoke. The number isn't that high. I wouldn't call the process to be easy. They keep sorting them. Each members are chosen for a role most suited for them, and they are developed. When you say they are specialized. So a fighter, who has the same level of fighting capability as a magician, only knows about fighting. The fighter's knowledge about magic and how to respond to magic is much inferior to the magician. Yes, such a method. Him, it is unacceptable. In an army, each soldier learned a specialized skill. For example, let us say there was a knight, who was excellent at horsemanship, archery and closed combat. An archer in the army would be at the very least on par with the knight in terms of shooting a bow. However, the archer would be worse at everything else. It wouldn't even be comparable. This was how the Dragon Demon King worshippers were developed. The rank and file magicians were specialized to be only used in battle. They were given all kinds of inhumane drugs. Rituals were used to bring up their magical energy. On the surface, they looked like high-level magicians. However, if one looked at their overall abilities, they were incomprehensibly weak. Laura spoke. The rank and file members uses a device. There is a device that allows one to hide one's dragon demon magic. Yes. Do you have one? At his question, Laura shook her head from side to side. According to her explanation, the act of learning it was the difficult part. However, once one learns it, the magical consumption of the spell wasn't that high, and it could be maintained indefinitely. This was why most didn't feel the need to learn the magic. They preferred to use a one-off magical device that could replicate the same effect instead of going through the difficult process of learning it. However, there were always problems with magical devices. Different magic magic spells could clash, and the capacity of magic it could hide was a limiting factor. This was why it wasn't too wise to use magical devices as a quick fix. Azel queried, Still, I placed magical shunts inside you so it should be restricting your use of magic. Are you sure you can keep up with us? You really are like a magician. Laura replied with an off-the-wall answer. When Azel looked puzzled, she spoke. The way you maintain the magical shunts, and the methods you use. I'm starting to think you are actually a magician. Spirit order is merely a different facet of magic. In truth, Azel's spirit order techniques was completely off the beaten path of common sense. 
he was able to change the properties of the magical energy, and certain techniques he used was able to be controlled from a distance. If one compared him to a regular spirit order practitioner, he was a transcendent warrior, who used a power that was closest to magic. Azel spoke, it is hard to do it only with magic possessed by a human. However, once you know how to wield the power of the dragon, it is possible. If a spirit order practitioner wanted to move forward into the ultimate stage, one had to eventually complete the dragon slayer's ritual. Dragon demon magic had many use if one was able to acquire it. There are less constraints when dealing with magic. This was the conclusion he came to when he studied the fundamental phenomena behind raising and controlling magic. If one possessed dragon demon magic, one could circumvent the steps needed to use magic. However, it wasn't an exaggeration to say the dragon demon magic was mainly used to make dragon demon key. Magicians had no other use for the dragon demon magic. By comparison, spirit order was a technique that promoted the use of the senses. Dragon demon magic had a special characteristic of being able to bring an image into reality. Spirit order was able to take advantage of this fact more so than magic. Laura spoke. I never knew that. If it is as Euron said, the humans in the plane of darkness aren't allowed to conduct the dragon slayer's ritual. They have no spirit order practitioner, who possess dragon demon magic. It is understandable that you do not know about it. Azel had learned this very useful information. At the very least, there was a huge restriction placed in how the dragon demon king worshippers developed their spirit order practitioners. Azel spoke. Anyways, I guess I didn't answer your question again. It's all right. Laura spoke as she looked up at the empty air. I'm used to all of this now. I thought you've never moved in this fashion before. I'm not talking about that. Laura was talking about the restriction caused by the magical shunts in her energy pulse. She thought about her past as she spoke. While I learned how to use magic, I went through a lot of hardships. At times, they put curses on us. We had to face dangerous situations, while our abilities were compromised. As she went through such training, her siblings started to die one by one. Laura had also escaped from the throes of death several times. Azel had thought she had experienced forceful restriction of her magic as part of her magic training, but he never expected this. He was at a loss for words. However, Laura didn't show any signs of anxiety as she talked about her past. Suddenly, there was an odd light in her eyes. Her expression hadn't changed much, but he could feel that she was feeling a complicated emotion. This feels strange. What do you mean? I'm conversing with someone about my past. I never expected it to feel like this. You've never talked about it with anyone. I never had anyone I could talk to. Somehow, this feels embarrassing, but it isn't a bad feeling. Laura closed her eyes as she spoke those words. The next day, the party decided to change course. It was at Yuren's request. The guide has a gift for you, and he told me where to find it. You keep saying that. Do you really think you can entice me to go with you with those words? I don't know what else to say. Aside from that, I do have other useful information. Euron told Azel about the plane of darkness, who was about to sow chaos in the human world. Azel and Chiron furrowed their brows. They are capable of pulling off such a plan. However, the source of this information is a bit. Sadly, I don't have any other explanations for this. Euron let out a bitter laugh. He felt sad every time he had to explain about his guide. It would have been better if he was a man of faith. He could just say God was guiding his actions. However, he couldn't do that. Euron spoke. All the high-quality information I know was revealed to me by the guide. I was a candidate in the development center, so I didn't know much about anything. Him. Laura. I do think this this relationship is quite peculiar. After betraying the dragon demon king worshippers, Euron had been actively trying to help Azel. His words had a ring of truth to it. This was why Azel was trying to confirm the information with Laura. She had been a high-ranked officer in the plane of darkness not too long ago. It was a highly ridiculous situation if one organized the information. Laura spoke. Chapter 117. Guide's Gift. Part 3. Laura spoke. He is speaking the truth. 
Are you saying the dragon demon king worshippers will try to start a war between humans? Everything he said was true including that fact. Are you talking about the part where he said the plane of darkness was plotting to let human society descend into chaos? It is like what happened in Euron Rizester's past. When Euron was young, he was disguised as a street urchin. His mission was to assassinate a well-off old couple. The dragon demon king worshippers had wanted the blameless old couple dead, because they wanted control over a particular neighborhood. A reasonable offer to purchase the couple's house had been turned down, so the dragon demon king worshippers had used a dirty method. These types of method were used to create a foothold that allowed the dragon demon king worshippers to burrow into human society. They interfered with the succession of countryside nobles to swallow these noble families whole. They also dominated the underground criminal organizations in order to spread drugs. Azel furrowed his brows. Drugs. Urine was the one to answer him. It is an effective way to corrupt humans. It leads to a diseased society. The drugs manufactured by Dragon Demon King worshippers are strong and cheap. This is why it is widely circulated amongst humans. Azel was struck dumb. He had never thought about such things. Laura continued to speak. The presence of the Guardian Shadows restricted their activities. However, this was also the reason why their methods to influence humanity diversified. Before the Guardian Shadows made their presence known, the Plane of Darkness had been able to be very bold in carrying out the plans. They were able to embed spies into the main nobles families and the royal family. It had been a dark times where they were even able to influence, who took the throne. This all changed when the Guardian Shadows appeared. People with rank and power like Chiron were recruited, and the activities of the Plane of Darkness were restricted. In the beginning, the Plane of Darkness were unaware of the existence of the Guardian Shadows, so countless plans had been wiped out in its entirety before they knew it. Laura spoke, the time before the Guardian Shadows existed. Basically, these methods were never used before the vast darkness. Truthfully, if the vast darkness worked according to plan, we wouldn't have needed to wait for the revival of the king to Wait a moment. Azel had not interrupted her words. It was Chiron. He asked with a trembling voice. Are you trying to say? The vast darkness was an artificial disaster caused by the dragon demon king worshippers. Laura tilted her head in puzzlement at his words. She was still expressionless, but the gesture looked as if she was asking how he couldn't have known this fact. Yes, that's. In a flash, a dull sound rang out in front of Laura. Chiron's hands were already right in front of Laura's neck. He had been about to snap her slender neck, but he wasn't able to. Azel had stopped Chiron by grabbing his wrists. Duke. Chiron was glaring at Laura as if he wanted to kill her on the spot. For a brief moment, he had lost all rationality. Chiron had lived through the vast darkness. Azel spoke. The fact that I have to defend her is funny, but she wasn't even born during that time period. Please cool you head. I'm sorry. Chiron apologized with a trembling voice as he withdrew his hands. The vast darkness was a nightmare he would never be able to put behind him. He was called the Dragon Sword Duke. He was a hero within the Rulin Kingdom, yet he had been helpless against the vast darkness. This truth had made him despair. People mourned as others died in pain. There was no way the diseased people could be saved, so he had to keep making agonizing decisions. It had been a horrific era. Azel spoke to Laura. Continue. Yes. Laura's voice shook slightly. It seemed she had been frightened from what had just happened to her. The vast darkness is one of the king's legacy. Attain. That is preposterous. Why do you say that? If he had such a thing, why didn't he use it in the Dragon Demon War? I saw the records. At the time of the vast darkness, Everyone was helpless against the spreading plague until Bayon came up with a cure. The king hadn't left it behind for it to be used as a weapon. What do you mean? There are records left behind by Ornsaurus in the Plane of Darkness. The Ornsaurus stored the records as if they were holy scriptures. There were a lot of them. Ornsaurus had been a magician, so he had enjoyed documenting everything. He had lived for a very long time, so he had written over 100 volumes of records. When Laura became Ornsaurus's heir, she had read all the records. 
This was also a big reason why Laura had become interested in Azel. This happened when the king hadn't crowned himself king yet. The four dragon demon generals and the king were the subject of many legends. Folklores of unknown origin were handed down amongst humans. However, many of these stories were lost during the dragon demon war, the fall of the Nadic Empire and the vast darkness. However, Ornsaurus had been part of all these events, and his records had remained intact. You guys might not believe this, but the king and the four dragon demon generals used to travel around the world, and they had saved a lot of people before the dragon demon war. They had wandered around the world for over a thousand years. They explored uncharted lands, and they fought against beings who threatened the world. They even helped people in distress to become a beacon of hope. In this process, they encountered an enemy who called himself to be the god of pestilence. Are you perhaps talking about a real god? Ornsaurus evaluated that this being had the power and authority to legitimately call himself a god. The being was too bizarre to be thought of as a life form from this world. He was able to control all kinds of diseases. He even used diseases to grant regular humans superhuman strength. These men were made into his apostles. It wasn't hard to see why Ornsaurus had made such an evaluation. The king and the dragon demon generals fought and won against this being. However, they couldn't eliminate the god of pestilence. Surprisingly, the god of pestilence was almost close to being an immortal. He was defeated by the combined might of the king and the dragon demon generals. However, he couldn't be eradicated. Even the weapon he used was like a holy item that couldn't be destroyed. This was why the king had sealed him, the essence of the god of pestilence, and his holy item was sealed by a tyne's magic. It was sealed in a place where human hands wouldn't be able to reach it. It was a frozen land located in the north. It was considered to be end of the world. Basically, it was the plain of darkness. No one could unravel the seal placed on the god of pestilence. However, the idea to use the holy item was developed. However, even that wasn't easy to do. After a very long research conducted by the plain of darkness, they found a way to use it in a limited fashion. The power of the holy item was used to create a cursed disease. It's the source of the vast darkness. If Sage Bayon hadn't appeared, the vast darkness would have eradicated the humans. When the plane of darkness was about to achieve their ultimate goal, Bayon had lit a beacon of hope for the humans. Of course, the plane of darkness tried to eliminate Bayon. However, the guardian shadows appeared out of nowhere, and they rebuffed the plane of darkness. Bion's existence is still considered to be a mystery to those within the plane of darkness. He was a human, who hadn't learned magic, yet he was able to cure the disease. The plane of darkness had made the disease, but even they hadn't known how to cure it. In the end, the plane of darkness couldn't solve this question, and they saw their mounting ambitions crumble. They suffered a big setback. Afterwards, the fierce battle between the plane of darkness and the guardian shadows started in the shadow of the world. The fight was still ongoing. Bayon and the guardian shadows. These two factors made the plane of darkness lose more than they had gained. However, didn't they finish manipulating information using the vast darkness? Manipulating information. I'm talking about the dragon demon key and the dragon slayer's ritual. Then there are the information regarding the essence of spirit order. That was already almost completed before the vast darkness. Him, Laura started talking about the deletion of knowledge, which was conducted by the plane of darkness, to the puzzled Azel. The manipulation of information in regards to the dragon demon key, dragon slayer's ritual and the essence of spirit order started when the Nadic Empire started to crumble. The upper echelon of our organization were afraid of humanity. The knowledge of magic and spirit order wasn't shared like the other disciplines of studies. It was like martial arts where knowledge was only revealed to the disciples of one sect. These were knowledge contained within a closed ecosystem. The closed nature of the information made it very easy for the plane of darkness to achieve their goal. The talented magicians and spirit order practitioners were killed alongside their disciples. Then the plane of darkness deleted their research. These simple steps allowed him to stop the information from being passes on to the future generation. Afterwards, 
A lot of effort was put into cutting off the knowledge of the Dragon Demon Key and the Dragon Slayer's ritual. This task was only possible because of the great darkness within Ainsera. The humans could only exceed the Dragon Demons only if they gained the Dragon Demon Key through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. The Dragon Demon War had engraved a great fear within the Dragon Demon King worshippers, so they devoted themselves to eradicating the knowledge. Azel clicked his tongue. That sounds preposterous. It was true that the Dragon Demon War was a bit of an anomaly. People willingly shared their techniques and knowledge during the war. However, I can see that such practices would have inevitably come to an end. The continent, which had been controlled by the Nadic Empire, had been broken into seven kingdoms. This accelerated the disposition of people to hoard their knowledge. As the number of foes and competitors increased, the worth of secret techniques went up. It became something that wasn't easily shared with others. Azel spoke. Now that I think about it, the Guardian Shadows didn't know about the Dragon Demon Key either. Not all of them knew about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. All the questions Azel possessed now clicked into place within his mind. He realized this was a grand conspiracy of epic proportion that had spanned much longer than a human's lifetime. He sighed. In the end, Azel took Yuren's advice, and they changed their course. The information from the guide wasn't credible to Azel, but he felt the need to learn more about Yuren. This was worth checking out at least once. Yuren looked at the map, and he pointed out the location. The location was quite a way off. At the party's current speed, it would take four days. While they were traveling, Azel felt a bit amazed when he watched Laura. I'm asking just in case. Is washing the dishes fun for you? Laura was washing the dishes. The work of setting up the camp was divided between the party member. This work included preparing the meals and washing the dishes. Laura participated in all the chores except keeping night watch and cooking food. Laura was like a girl from a noble family. She was unaccustomed to doing miscellaneous work. If there were any glasses or vases around, she would have already broken a couple of them. However, items they brought were for traveling. They were either made out of metal or wood. Therefore, she didn't cause any irreversible mishaps. Laura nodded her head. Yes, this. I've never done this before. Of course, as a high-ranking official within the Plane of Darkness, she hadn't had the opportunity to wash the dishes. All the miscellaneous tasks were done by her subordinates. She only had to worry about fighting. It is enjoyable to clean something with one's hands. I. Is that so? Yes. After you became an officer, you never had the opportunity to do any of this. Aside from washing dishes, didn't you clean your room or prepare food? All of that was taken care of by the servants. Him. It was very odd. She had been treated inhumanely, and she had been pushed to the brink of death as she grew up. At the same time, she had been treated like a noble lady by those within the plane of darkness. Laura spoke as she saw her reflection on the bowl she had just cleaned. When I always came out into the world, it was always boring. It is fun now. That isn't something a hostage should say. Azel grumbled. It didn't matter what he said. Laura really looked like a girl really enjoying the trip. In her life, she had never shared her emotions with anyone. She had never experienced this before. In the past, she was always with people, who were separated her by rank. When she lived in the plane of the darkness, she only derived joy from finding old records within the cold yet quiet castle. Moreover, it hadn't been too long since she had asked for stories from the unknown, Elder. She only went outside when he received a mission. Only her subordinates stayed close to her during these missions. She was revered by them as their superior, and they only talked to her about the mission. She basically stared blankly into the empty air to pass time until it was time for her to fight. This was why she liked her current situation. The people around her showed hostility and suspicion towards her. However, they spoke to her as equals, and she actually had people she could spend time with. Since I've been born, I've never spoken this much before. After surrendering to Azel, she had talked a lot. Just from answering Azel's questions, she had spoken more words than she had in the past ten years combined. It was very rare for Laura to converse with someone else. Suddenly, Laura asked a question. Do you think there will come a time when I'm not a hostage anymore? 
Azel looked at her with a complicated expression on his face. As time passed, Laura made him feel off-balanced. As if Laura hadn't expected an answer, she turned away. In the end, Azel couldn't say anything to her back. Chapter 118. Guide's Gift. Part 4. I think it should be around here somewhere. On the next morning, Euron led the party to a cave located halfway up a mountain. The road up was winding, and numerous boulders were piled upon other. It was difficult to locate the entrance to the cave. Him. It's here. I'm sure of it. What's supposed to be here? I don't know. Everyone looked at Euron as if they wanted to hit him. Chiron sighed as he spoke to Leticia. I can't believe you trusted this guy enough to make him your companion. Sometimes I do regret my decision. I'm happy that there are more people, who feel the same way as me. Leticia grumbled. After she started traveling with Euron, she had become frequently annoyed by his attitude. Euron laughed. Ah, well, I just know that something good is here. I don't know how else I should explain this. How unfortunate. I sometimes wish you were a poor speaker. Just shut up, and led us from the front. When Leticia growled her words, Euron shrugged his shoulders. He was there at the forefront of the group as he led the party into the cave. He put up a ball of light that would precede him, then he used his flight magic to float through the air. The guide said there are magical traps here. It'll activate if you step on it, so please avoid doing so. I'm also using a detection magic, but there might be some traps that I might not be able to find. So everyone should be careful. Do you mind if I place the flight spell on all of you? Euron hesitated before he asked the question. The act of placing the flight spell on others could be seen as a precursor for him to double-cross the party. While in midair, the magician had complete control over their subject, so they had no idea what he'll do. However, Azel didn't worry over it. He nodded his head. Do it. Are you sure? My sword is faster than whatever you can do. Wow, that hurts as little bit. I can't say I trust you, because you haven't earned enough of my trust for me to sow. Still, couldn't you have said it in a more roundabout way? Euron grumbled as he placed the flight spell on the whole party except Laura. The party entered the cave, while they floated 30 centimeters up in the air. The cave entrance was very steep. However, after a certain point, the steep slope leveled out, and the cave gradually expanded in size. Azel was astonished. We would have been in deep trouble if we just charged in here. There is unquestionably a lot of magical spells placed in here. Even Chiron was astonished. The magical traps were perfectly hidden. Still, Yuren's detection magic revealed their existence. The spell shouldn't have revealed every one of them, but an incredible amount of traps were detected, while they traveled for 200 meters. This was one thing Azel could do nothing about. If he focused, he could tell that there were magic spells around him, and he could sense that the spells were dangerous. However, he couldn't give any detailed information about the magic spells. He couldn't disable them either. This was the territory of the magicians. I'm pretty sure there are magic spells that aren't reacting to the detection spell. How are you evading those? I have the key spell. We just have to avoid the magic spells that will activate when we step on it. We just have to avoid the area of detection. The rest. I don't think it is easy as you make it out to seem. The guide gave me a sketch of the setup. And he told me the key spell. Azel looked at Euron as if to say he found Euron's words to be dubious. If one thought logically, Euron or his acquaintances had probably made this place. There was a possibility that their party was being lured into a trap. On the other hand, he doesn't look like the type to be good at acting. At this point, he really was curious about Yuren's identity. Actually, he wanted to know the identity of the guide. The party continued forward. There were so many traps that the progress was slow. Still, the tension went down a notch, because they didn't encounter any danger. Is it around 300 meters? This place is pretty deep. It was hard to estimate the distance they had traveled, but Azel knew the exact distance to the entrance. However, his wariness kept increasing. Suddenly, Azel felt a magical energy rise up from within him. Vitten's chalice. Vitten's chalice was reacting to something in his surrounding. It was as if it was trying to tell him something. When Azel focused on the sensation, he became aware of a fact. I see. 
What's wrong? Chiron asked a question as L clicked his tongue. It's very clever. We haven't even descended 30 meters yet. What? Everyone looked at Azel in surprise. Azel looked at Euron as he asked a question. You knew about this. I was curious as to when you were going to realize it. It took me a while to realize it too. I've been trying to access the magic directly to open the lock. How did you find out? The Vitans chalice alerted me to it. If not, I might have either found out about it at a much later time or I might have not known about it at all. What are you guys talking about? Please explain it to us. Chiron was frustrated, so he spoke up. Azel spoke. We've entered into a distorted space. This cave is only 30 meters long, yet the space was distorted to make us go around in circles. It is made in a very clever way. I didn't even feel the trace of this magic. Azel shivered. This place was made by someone with incredible skills. This person was a high rank magician, who was able to manipulate space. It was very rare to see a magician skilled enough to distort a fixed space, and mess with the sense of space. He was skillful enough to make Azel feel as if he had traveled ten times the original distance. He is dangerous. The Vitans chalice was probably frustrated that its owner hadn't known what was going on, so it gave him the answer. At the same time, this put Azel on alert. He hadn't known he was inside a magic spell until he was actually in it. This meant a trap could be sprung without him knowing about it. They might already be in a trap. Azel was about to bring out the Vitans chalice when Euron spoke. You don't have to bring out your dragon weapon. The lock has been released. I just have to open the door, and we'll be able to exit this place. How long has it been since you unlocked it? It's been about 10 minutes. You were watching us roam around. I was curious as to when you'll realize it. I was going to watch you all for five more minutes, then I would have released the spell. Don't be angry. I thought it was a great opportunity to check out the abilities of my comrades. Azel flinched at those words. Euron looked at Azel quizzically, and Azel saw an image superimposed on Euron. What is it? You just reminded me of someone I knew. He had wanted to smack Euron, and his actions reminded Azel of Carlos. Before they became best friends, Carlos always used to test Azel using various methods. Even in difficult situations he could stop at any time, Carlos just observed the situation. He watched to see how far Azel could be pushed, and he spoke in a patronizing manner when everything was wrapped up. At such times, Azel had wanted to beat up Carlos. At that moment, Euron looked like Carlos. The fact that their faces looked similar added to the similarity. Is he really Carlos' descendant? Azel thought about the past, and it happened when he was in a state of confusion. Something suddenly stimulated Azel's senses. Him. At the same time, Euron dispelled the magic that was distorting the space. A haze formed, and the landscape curved to form an entirely different surrounding. This is. Everyone looked at their surrounding in surprise. They were at the end of the cave before they knew it. It wasn't that large of a space, and in the middle, there was a pillar letting out a low blue light. Within it, is that a magical armor? There was a set of white armor arranged inside. Azul's expression turned peculiar when he saw it. This, is this. At that moment, Euron stepped in front of the armor, and he spun on his heels. Then he opened his arms wide as if he was an actor from a theater troupe. He spoke dramatically. This is the gift that the guide wanted me to give you. Do you know what it is? Of course, I have no idea. Well, by the look of it, isn't it a really good magical armor? Him. Azel looked at the armor with a complicated expression on his face. At that moment, Laura spoke up. White dragon armor. Ha! Huh. Everyone turned to look at her. Laura stared at the armor as she spoke. This looks similar to the white dragon armor worn by Azel Kazak. This was the reason why Azel had a complicated expression on his face. This armor looked like the one he had worn during the Dragon Demon War. At the time of the Dragon Demon War, Azel had pretty much worn magic battle gear all over his body. The white dragon armor used dragon's bones as framework. The dragon's scales were melted and it was combined with magic metal. This armor and helmet was made using these ingredients. White dragon armor. Azel approached the armor. 
Then he looked at his surrounding before he spoke. Him. Is it okay if I touch it? All the magic spells were disabled. The armor might be able to determine if a person is worthy to be its owner. It is a magic gear that has self-awareness. Maybe. It's probably not smart. It probably has a faint instinct it can act on. Aside from the dragon weapons, there were magical gears out there that possessed self-awareness. They were able to choose worthy owners. It seemed this armor was such an item. Azel spoke. This isn't the white dragon armor. Ha! Huh, but. It looks the same. Laura titled her head in puzzlement. You've actually seen the white dragon armor before. I've only seen it in the records. It is the same as the one in the recorded image. Chiron butted into the conversation. I've also seen the portrait of Azel Karzak, and the design looks similar. Why are you so sure that it isn't the real thing? The white dragon armor isn't an item that possessed self-awareness. I'm sure about that. The white dragon armor had not been made for Azel in the first place. It was an equipment he stole from his enemy. When he obtained it, he had given it to the smith to resize it. However, there were no other requirements in using that particular equipment. However, it seems someone really made an exact replica of the white dragon armor. Azel carefully picked up the helmet placed on top of the armor. At the same time, something swept over his senses. Him, Azel reflexively tried to shield his senses, but he gave up on it. He realized a magical thought contained within the helmet was flowing into his senses. Him, can you hear my voice? From within Azel, someone's voice rang out. Azel had heard this voice once before. Carlos. It was similar to the thought manifestation of the old Carlos he met inside the ruin of the Balan forest. When Azel saw him, he spoke. You are the one, who left this behind for me. Even after you lost all your hair, you are reliable. If you can hear my voice, the person to acquire this item must be Azel. The thought manifestation of Carlos ignored Azel's words as it spoke what it had to say. Azel realized it when he saw Carlos' behavior. Chapter 119, Guide's Gift. Part 5. It is only a recording. Carlos' manifestation of thought left behind in the ruins of the Balan forest was similar to a ghost. It was able to think and converse by itself. On the other hand, this was just a recording. It delivered Carlos' image and voice to Azel. When he realized this fact, he felt disappointment wash over him. Even if it was a ghost-like manifestation, he had been excited about being able to converse with his friend. That fact that you were able to acquire this. You were able to complete two tasks, and my prediction is heading towards the most positive direction. You were able to find and acquire this item before others could find it. Moreover, you were able to obtain the map from your sleeping place. In the ruins of the Balan forest, Carlos had arranged many things for him within the sleeping place of Azel. However, Azel hadn't been able to acquire anything except for his dragon Macon. It would be useless to point out this fact to the manifestation, since it was only a recording. I don't know how many of them are left. Please try to acquire all of them. I thought about storing everything in one location, but the risk was too high. This was why I placed the items in various locations when I had the chance. In the past, I always wondered why magicians kept creating facilities that would be found as ruins by the future generation. I can now understand why they did it. Carlos' manifestation let out a bitter laugh. Ah, I should tell you what this is. I designed it exactly like your white dragon armor. However, you probably realized at a glance that this isn't your white dragon armor. This was a replica of the white dragon armor. Carlos had made it with the help of his comrades. It was a replica, but it was better than the original. I spent a good amount of money making this. If you sell this, you'll be able to buy a castle easily. Ah, that doesn't mean you should sell it. Only I could have made this armor. It is something you won't be able to purchase with money. Azel couldn't help, but laugh. There were several decades difference between this Carlos and the Carlos he had known, yet Azel couldn't believe how much he hadn't changed. Azel. I hope what I left behind for you will help you face your future tribulations. My body is old, and I regret that I cannot stand by you during your time of need. After fulfilling its task, Carlos' mental manifestation disappeared, 
and Azel's consciousness returned to reality. Azel mumbled bitterly as the white dragon armor easily accepted him with no resistance. Me too. Azel put on the white dragon armor immediately. He took off his leather armor, and he recited the keyword. The white dragon armor broke apart into pieces, and it reformed perfectly around Azel's body. When Chiron saw this, his eyes turned round. Azel. Yes, this is the first time I've been jealous of an item you possess. Hoo hoo. Even if you say such words, I won't be giving this to you. I've been a bit disappointed at the state of my own defense, but now. No, I don't care about that. It is an armor that can be put on and off automatically. What a revolutionary idea. Shit. A full body armor was always terribly difficult to put on and off once knights put on their armor in battle. They kept it on even if they became filthy. When one's bladder was about to burst, knights sometimes contemplated not taking off the armor before going to the restroom. The decision came down to whether the knight wanted to lose his dignity as a human rather than go through the difficult process of taking off the armor. For reference, the original white dragon armor didn't have the automatic equip function. In the past, Azel had used his spirit order's telekinesis skill to take off his armor. His laziness allowed him to grow in proficiency using that skill. Suddenly, Laura spoke. It really looks the same. Him, you look like Azel Kazak. Unlike other people, Laura had actually seen the recorded image of Azel in the Dragon Demon War. Azel already looked eerily like the real Azel Kazak. Now he was wearing an armor of the same design, so it felt as if the figure in the record had appeared in reality. She spoke. Now that I see it, the cape is different. This cape doesn't seem special. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had worn a red magic cape made out of dragon leather. On the other hand, it seemed Carlos had made this cape using magic when he replicated the white dragon armor. It wasn't some amazing object. Anyways, that guy, did his thought process change as he grew older? He made protections against water, heat and even dirt. It would be very hard to dirty this cape since it had been treated with protection magic. Carlos had also put in an auto-equip function for the armor. Carlos had devised solutions that was strangely practical and convenient. In the past, he usually put performance above all else. This had been a common complaint from others when they obtained magical items made by Carlos. It felt as if one was complaining on a full stomach when one was able to acquire a valuable magical item made by Carlos. However, what would happen if a person, who showcases a precision-style sword art, was given a heavy and thick blade for the sake of performance? Of course, people would have no choice but to complain. How dare a mere human try to raise objection to a rare artificer like me? You don't like my magical item? I bet my magical device hates you too. Just shut up, and you adjust to the magical item. If you don't like it, I can give it to someone else. I chose to give it to you and you are rejecting it. I'll strike you off of my waiting list. Let's see if your turn comes up before the damn war is over. Carlos had been like that. It felt weird for Azel when he found out that Carlos took into consideration of the user's comfort and convenience when making this item. Azel suddenly looked towards Euron. What is he? He wondered what the identity of the guide was and why did the guide know about a facility left behind by Carlos. Moreover, how was the guide able to tell Euron about the methods needed to disable the magic spells protecting this place? Maybe, this is Carlos. Did he arrange this too? That thought came to him. Of course, he didn't have any evidence to support it. Still, he looked at Euron, who had stated that he was Carlos' descendant. He looked so much like Carlos that Azel couldn't help but think about Carlos from his lifetime. Euron had a big smile on his face. What are you thinking? Do you like it? Him. Azel had a complicated expression on his face as he looked at Euron. He nodded his head. Thank you. This is the best present ever. At the very least, he liked the present that had been prepared for him, so he was forced to admit it. There was the armor that reminded him of his past, and he had encountered the mental manifestation left behind by Carlos. Their business here was taken care of, so there was no reason to stay long in this place. The party immediately exited the cave. You all came out much faster than I had expected. 
This looked like a well-hidden ruin, so I worried maybe I would have to wait a couple days for you guys to come out. A stranger was sitting on top of a boulder with his chin propped up on his hands. Azel was startled. Who the hell is this? He was most definitely a human. However, Azel hadn't sensed his presence, even though they were only 10 meters apart. The man looked to be in his mid to late 30s. He had long brown hair and a beard. His entire body was encased in metal armor, so he looked to be a knight. The weird thing about him was his eyes. He had his face towards Azel, but his eyes were closed. Before I introduce myself, I'll prove that I don't have any ill intentions towards you. At the same time, the sound of children whispering could be heard in the surrounding. Guardian shadows appeared in various locations. They were wearing white robes, but there was an incomprehensible darkness within the robes. When he saw them, Azel realized something. This bastard is similar to the guardian shadows. Azel was sure this man possessed a living body. However, he was able to thin his presence like the guardian shadows. He was able to avoid detection from Azel's senses. Of course, there was a condition. He had to be still. When the man stood up, his presence could be sensed by Azel. His presence was still weak, but it was detectable. Moreover, he is one of the keepers of the prophecy. Azel could identify a keeper of the prophecy at a glance now. This man was also letting out the scent of dragon demon magic like Leon. He still had his eyes closed as he approached Azel. I'm a keeper of the prophecy for the guardian shadows. My name is Balseru. This is the first time we are meeting face to face. You are Azel Zestringer, who might be the long-awaited figure from our prophecy. I. Azel spoke as he watched him. It doesn't matter if it, it is the dragon demon king worshippers or you guys. Everyone keeps attaching long and annoying disclaimers to my name, but I think I'm getting used to it now. If you don't like it, I'll shorten it. Do you mind me calling you Sir Azel? So should I be calling you Sir Balseru? You can call me whatever you want. It has been 50 years, since I've last worked as a knight. Azel was taken aback by his words. Balseru looked to me in his mid-thirties on the outside, yet he was that old. So you are the same as Leon? Yes. Our time stopped when we became the keepers of the prophecy. It has been a long time, since we've faced our death as humans. You don't look like an undead. I do the work that can't be done by corpses. What do you do? You already know my answer to your question. Basically, you won't tell me anything until you confirm that I'm the prophesied person. Yes. Well, all right. Why did you come looking for me? Are you here to complain about Laura? Azel looked at the nearby guardian shadows as he spoke. They were showing open hostility towards Laura. It was as if they wanted to attack Laura at that moment, and it was clear they were holding back. Balseru spoke. We are very dissatisfied, but we respect your decision. If you are revealed not to be the person in the prophecy, we'll take care of her. Who, at the very least, you should withdraw your killing intent since we aren't here to fight. I feel the same as all the guardian shadows here, and I'm trying very hard not to show it. Your tone of voice makes it sound as if you are trying to pick a fight with me. If it was harsh to your ears, I apologize. This is only an excuse, but all the keepers of the prophecy had lost everything to the dragon demon king worshippers. This is why it is difficult for us to act rationally in front of dragon demon king worshippers. He spoke such words, but his voice was as calm as ever. This dissonance was so stark that it made Azel more wary. It seems I'm making you more agitated by speaking. Let's get to the main reason I'm here. I'm here to deliver an important information. It isn't a guarantee that you'll be able to understand a guardian shadow, so I am here to deliver it. It seemed the keepers of the prophecy were well aware of the fact that guardian shadows were poor messengers. Azel and Chiron agreed with this sentiment a hundredfold. Balseru spoke. The plane of darkness has revived the dragon demon General Ragus as an undead. Moreover, he is powerful. He is on a different level compared to the other undeads. What? Azel was taken aback. However, his shock couldn't be compared to the one he felt after listening to Balseru's next words. He asked us a question. He asked us where we are hiding Carlos. Carlos. It was as if he knew Carlos was still alive in some shape or form. 
Do you have any conjectures regarding this issue? Sir Azel. What are you? Chapter 120. Guide's Gift. Part 6. It had been a while since Niberus had returned to the Plain of Darkness. The wound inflicted by Azel was so deep that it took four days for her to regain consciousness. Even after waking up, she had to refrain from moving. She had to focus only on healing. Two weeks had passed by like that. Niberus was north of the Dragon Demon Castle. She was visiting the resting place of the dead. It was where the truly revered members rested in eternal peace. These were members acknowledged by the Plane of Darkness according to some stories she had heard before. This space had been quite desolate. It was a place where thousand soldiers could hold a parade. But only a few individuals had been buried here. However, one or two headstones were added as time passed. The number of graves placed here grew. Currently, there was still a lot of empty space, but there were 300 headstones here. It wasn't a small number. Niberus was looking for a specific headstone. Dragon Demon Prince's consort Elverize on the bottom, there were flowery words added eulogize the dead. Niberus' mother was buried here. She had been much young than Cybane, and as a dragon demon, she had been weak in constitution. When one was part of the nobility class in the Plane of Darkness, one had to carry out duties that was befitting one's station. However, her mother was unable to do anything. All she could do was wither away in the cold land, which was separated from the rest of the world. Niberus remembered the story told to her by her mother when she was young. This might be silly for me to say, but your father was very prince-like. The humans tell of a prince on a white horse in their stories. Your father was that prince on a white horse. In Niberus' memories, Elvarus had always looked labored and tired. Her weak constitution wasn't the only cause behind this. She had always lived with immense pressure placed on her. She was of high station, yet she couldn't carry out her duties. There was always pressure from the outside for her to bear more children. When she was young, Niberus had lived a carefree life, compared to Kieran and Jeffers. Niberus was only child between Cybane and Elvarus. This was why she didn't have to fight others to ascend to her position as the heir. Moreover, her father hadn't been strict, and he didn't want her to suffer by witnessing death and suffering. Despite this fact, Niberus insisted on living a difficult life even at an early age. Niberus witnessed the elders berate her mother. They didn't hesitate to speak insulting words like how she should be propagating the great bloodline by having more children if she couldn't fulfill her other duties. It lit a fire inside Niberus' young heart whenever she heard those words. The ancient and honorable blood flowed through Niberus' veins. If she proved her ability, she had thought her mother would no longer hear such words. She had thought that. Elvarus spoke. If it wasn't for your father, I would have died much earlier. In the past, I felt as if I was living in a cold prison. However, after meeting your father, I was able to breathe for the first time. Cybane had been a kind man. The marriage between the two individuals had been a pure political match. Cybane had been born before the Dragon Demon War, but Elvarus had been born after the surviving remnant of the Dragon Demon army settled in the Plain of Darkness. There was an age gap of 100 years between the two. Moreover, Cybane hadn't even known what she had looked like until the marriage ceremony was underway. Still, Cybane came to love Elvarus who had become his wife. His love was reflected in his actions. He didn't hesitate to act like a fool just to make her laugh. When Elvarus died, Cybane went missing. When Niberus awoke from her slumber, she had learned the tragic news that her mother had died, and her father had gone missing. Mother, I, I lost the person left behind by father. Niberus spoke to her mother's grave inside her heart. He always tried to give me everything I wanted. I couldn't do anything for him. After she had lost her parents, Niberus' heart had frozen over. She had given her affection to no one. She acted cold and ruthless towards others as she moved towards the power that was her birthright. However, a crack had formed on the cold castle wall that had been protecting her heart. She had lost to Azel in a way that didn't leave any room for doubt, and she had lost Duran. She didn't know what to do right now. Niberus was deep in her thoughts when she flinched. A very bleak energy reached her senses. 
Him. It was a voice that was unique to the undead. It sounded fiendish. Nibiru's eyes turned towards the source of the voice, and she saw a big dragon demon undead, who dwarfed all dragon demons. He was over three meters tall. It seems I've disturbed you. I'm sorry. An undead that looked like a skeleton knight was being very careful with his words. It was somehow a bit gross. However, Nibiru's quickly calmed her agitation as she gracefully gave her greeting. It's nice to meet you. Sir Ragus. The large undead was none other than the legend from the Dragon Demon War. He was the Dragon Demon General Ragus. Ragus had been about to scratch his cheek when his hand paused in midair. Ah, damn it, I can't fix my habits. He had been awake as an undead for a good amount of time now, but the habits he had in life appeared naturally. He awkwardly dropped his hand as he spoke. You are Prince Sibane's daughter. You are Mus Nibirus. Yes, it is a pleasure to meet you. I'm Ragus. This was the first time the two of them had met. However, everyone within the Plane of Darkness knew about Ragus. This was why she was able to identify him at a glance. Actually, I'm here, because I wanted to ask you about something. It seems this isn't the right time to do so. I'll meet you at a later date. You wanted to speak to me. Nibirus looked at him in confusion. What did he want to ask her? Ragus didn't speak as his stride quickly brought him near the headstone. He mumbled to himself. I'm a corpse walking through amongst the graves. It is funny. On the other hand, there are a lot of name here that I know. The first to be buried here were the surviving forces of the Dragon Demon King's army. These were the beings, who died after returning to the Plane of Darkness. However, as time passed, those who died an honorable death in the Dragon Demon War was placed here as a way to respect them. Their corpses weren't buried here, but they felt duty-bound pay tribute to them. The silence went on for a while. Ragus turned away as he spoke. I'm sorry I bothered you. I'll find you again at a more suitable location. No, we can speak. Nibirus also turned away from the headstone as she spoke. Let us have the conversation somewhere else. Thank you. Ragus walked away as he took big strides. He suddenly turned around to look at her. Ah, damn it, I keep forgetting I walk unnecessarily fast. Whether in life or death, that hasn't changed. Ragus had been a mountain of a man, so he walked very quickly with his long strides. In the past, his lieutenant chains had to run to keep up with him. Ragus still had this habit, so even at his old age, chains had to run to keep up with him. Ragus didn't care if a males had difficulty keeping up with him or not. However, he wanted to be respectful towards this young lady. The two of them left the final resting place of the dead, and they started walking. They walked across a large hallway that was flowing with cold air. Nibirus asked a question. What would you like to hear from me? It's just that. I heard you inherited Prince Sibane's Book of Darkness. At his words, Nibirus flinched. Everyone in the Plane of Darkness knew about it, so she didn't have a good reason to react this way. However, she felt a complicated emotion wash over her as she remembered the old memories she had thought about in front of her mother's grave. Ragus spoke. From your report, you weren't able to meet Prince Sibane. Yes, this had occurred before Laura was sent out to kidnap Saiga. Nibirus received orders from her elders to, to search for her missing father Sibane. After she conducted a diligent search, she had found a trace leading her to his whereabouts. However, it wasn't easy to approach this location. It was one of the land of demons. It was a place that was known to be difficult to penetrate akin to the plane of darkness. The elders attempted to send in troops into this land several times to find Sibane. In the end, all of them went missing or they returned as corpses. It was a very dangerous mission. Yet there were two reasons why she was chosen. Nibirus was Sibane's daughter, and she was talented enough to extract herself from danger. However, Nibirus wasn't able to meet Sibane in the end. You probably heard this already. It really was a strange event. A dragon delivered your dragon weapon. I've been briefed on it. It was a water dragon. A water dragon lived in a body of water, and it could freely control the flow of water. This being had appeared in front of her, and it delivered Sibane's dragon weapon to her. It was as if I was dreaming. 
I never expected such a thing to be possible. However, the water dragon retreated, and the book of darkness was passed on to me. I could feel the faint imprint of my father's thought resting within it. It delivered his will for her to take the book. It also told her to return to where she came from. The voice didn't have any substance. It was a feeling that was delivered to her, so it was hard to tell if Sibane was still alive. Still, she felt the urge to follow his instruction. Nibirus returned to the plane of darkness with only the Book of Darkness to show for her efforts. I see. Regus's voice was filled with sadness. Now that he had talked to her directly, he confirmed that Nibirus had not been lying. Thank you for telling me your story. I want to apologize again for disturbing you during such an important time. I'll wait a moment. Nibirus grabbed him. Regus turned to look at her, and she couldn't decipher his emotions. Nibirus asked as she looked into the eye sockets of the skull. Do you know if humans? Humans. I'm talking about the past, when the king conducted his holy war to right the world order. Nibirus hesitated for a moment as she brought up a story regarding the dragon demon war. She had grabbed Ragus on impulse, but she was unsure if she should ask this question. However, her curiosity won out. Did humans use an insulting title to refer to my father? Which insulting title are you talking about? That is, Nibirus hesitated once again. When she heard the title for the first time, she felt so angry that it felt as if her blood was flowing in the wrong direction. She felt humiliated by the fact that she would have to repeat such words with her own mouth. Simpleton Prince. Regus was speechless for a moment. Nibirus was embarrassed as she looked at him. However, she had no idea what the undead was thinking. She couldn't read his expression. After a brief moment, Regus asked in a harsh tone. Who told Miss about that title? Chapter 121. Spectres from the Past. Part 1. The light, which was reflecting off the surface of the water, was dancing on the walls of the cave. The uneven surface of the wall had been created by the hands of nature, and a mysterious sight could be seen as the light undulated on the surface of wall. Leon was watching this sight inside his dream. It was as if he was mesmerized. However, he was aware. He knew he had never been to this place, and he had never seen this sight in real life. So where did this memory originate? Was this an illusion created by his dream? That wasn't it. This sight existed somewhere on this world. He was sure of it. Moreover, another empty seat has been filled. Someone was speaking from within the light. It was a bleak voice. It was as if someone had squeezed the dregs of darkness. It felt as if one's lifespan would shorten just from listening to that voice. How could someone from this world possess such a voice? Leon wondered about this question. However, when he saw the owner of the voice, he forgot to breathe from the surprise. A faint light danced above the water gathered inside the cave. The fragment of light looked like fireflies flying through the midsummer night, but one couldn't see where the light originated. They were so faint that they looked as if they were about to be swallowed by the darkness. However, they were like flowers that wilted in the cold winter air before they bloomed once again in season. The fragments of light were beautiful and ephemeral. In the middle of this view, a silhouette wrapped up in darkness existed. Strangely, Leon couldn't see his face. The fragments of light in the surrounding brushed by this figure, but he couldn't what was beneath the well-worn hood. He spoke. Congratulations. You've been cursed. Leon was more focused on his appearance rather than his nonsensical words. The figure was submerged half in the water, so he looked beyond bizarre. The well-worn robe covered his entire body, and it looked as if something was deeply embedded in its chest. At first, Leon thought it was a sword. However, the end was round. It was a wooden staff with a clear gem transfixed to the end. This wooden staff pierced through the figure's chest, and darkness was emanating from there. Moreover, there was an oblong pillar made out of silver behind its back. Black chains bound him to the silver pillar, and one could see darkness crawling across the surface to form words. Darkness emanated from the characters as if it was a manifestation of a curse. It made Leon's skin crawl. Leon asked a question. Who are you? You don't need to know. He answered. We've never met before, and we'll never meet even in the future. You, 
who wanted to be cursed, will never have the opportunity to meet me if you attain your wish. If you do not attain your wish, you won't have a reason to meet me either. But, you've never been to this place, and you will never return here again. His words rang like thunder in Leon's ears, and the dream ended there. Him, the guardian shadow's keeper of prophecy Leon opened his eyes. He had seen this ceiling for several days, so he was used to it. He blankly stared up at the ceiling, and soon, he realized his body was soaked with cold sweat. I hate this. I always have this dream when I'm in a bad spot. Do you mean your first memory? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't it proof that you are still alive? Why are you here, Brad Jarras? When you acted like a lazy bag of bones by not waking up in the afternoon, the young lady pestered me to look in on you. How did you bewitch her? She is a beautiful lady from a good bloodline. There is something wrong about her being enamored with the likes of you. I don't act arrogant like you. Leon snorted as he got up. He was in a house of a person, who owed him a favor. After suffering a crushing defeat at the hands of Ragus, they had requested help from the nearby guardian shadows to help them evade their enemies. After losing their pursuers, they had come here to rest. Jarrah shrugged his shoulder as if he couldn't understand it. You've been going around acting as an agent of justice. You must have a lot of spare time. Unlike you, the feeling of justice is still alive and well inside my heart. Isn't that a low-quality joke? When I see your ugly mug, I can only come up with low-quality jokes. Anyways, it is advantageous for us to rescue people when we have the time to spare. Currently, we are reaping the reward for what I did before. I can't deny that logic. Should I go around and do some good deeds? With your personality, it'll be impossible. I can't dispute that fact. Him. What do you think he is? Brat. When you say he, who are you talking about? The guy in our dreams. He's probably the guy, who made us into what we are. He's a mage. He's probably someone very talented that remained hidden from the world. Moreover, he probably has a very deep grudge against the dragon demon king worshippers that can't be washed away. My thoughts are a little bit different from yours. You probably tried to come up with an unconventional answer to show off to others. If so, you are barking up the wrong tree. The fact that I can't categorically deny your accusation makes me feel a bit sad. Anyways, what do you think about my theory? What if he's a demon? Jarrah's grumbled. Leon furrowed his brows. Demon. What led you to have to have such a thought? No matter how I look at it, all of this couldn't have been created by a human. The demon race loves powerful souls of humans. Don't they reveal knowledge to humans to lead them to their destruction? Him. Then why would a demon make the guardian shadows? Well, I'm not a magician. I'm not too familiar with the demons. If you think about it, it might be a very clever ploy. The other demons have to work on one subject at a time. Instead of convincing one person to make a contract, I think this demon created a big farm that will bring him a continuous flow of souls to harvest. Him. I'm not sure what you are trying to say. First, the demon race corrupts humans as they lead them down the road to destruction. Let's talk about that point. I'm not sure how they measure how strong a soul is. You speak as if you are some great magician with knowledge about this subject. Well, I learned about it, while I studied about magic. Anyways, humans have a vast quantity of desires, and it's a reason why they fall prey to the demons. When I say desires, there are different types of desires. Most humans desire success in society. Martial artists desire to become stronger. Magicians wants to gain forbidden knowledge that'll put them above other magicians. Those in love wants to possess the subject of their affection. The people with grudges wants revenge. If one looks at the record, the ones with the biggest desires are the ones, who become tempted by the demons. I see. You've studied hard. You should focus on two things. First, a demon has to have a direct relationship with the fallen. The soul can only be taken by the demon, who corrupted the human. Secondly, in the process of corrupting the humans, the demons are negligent in what they give out. Him. I can see what you are thinking. You think a demon created a system called the Guardian Shadows by using humans with deep resentments. So you are saying this system is being used to harvest souls that are about to be destroyed. 
Yes. I call it the farm of ruination. It does sound plausible even if this was something you came up with it. Still, how are you defining what ruination is? In a typical story about the demon race, they are very nuanced in their approach. They make humans abandon morality as the price of success. One by one humanity is stripped away from the human, and it leads to the fall. In my opinion, that is an interpretation created, so it can be easily digested by the masses. Not all relationships that existed between humans and demons were known to the world. In the end, the process doesn't matter. They just need to bring about a result that fits the word, ruination. You have a point. If the contract only says, ruination, the word could be up for interpretation. If you put it that way, your argument does seem to have some merit. Even if it is true, it has nothing to with us. Right, it was the same for all the keepers of the prophecy. They didn't care how they had acquired their power. It didn't matter if their power was given to them by a magician using a forbidden technique or an evil magician aiming for their souls. If they could eliminate the dragon demon king worshippers from this world, they would willingly hold hands with the devil. Leon spoke in exasperation. How bored were you? You studied about the demon race to come up with this nonsense. Moreover, even if your theory is true, it wouldn't explain the prophecy. I don't know why the demon race wants the human souls in the first place, so I can't explain that. However, that information is already known. Ha! Huh, this is the problem with a non-mage like you. It isn't as if you are great at spirit order either. Why don't you go into a mountain to train? You should train as if your life is on the line. If I could have gotten stronger doing that, I would have already become a legendary swordsman. I thought you just didn't put in the effort. You should look at Azel Zestringer. He was able to catch a dragon after training in spirit order for half a year. If everyone could do what he did, dragons would have already gone extinct early on. Well, let's stop talking about useless topics. So why do demons collect human souls? Do you know about the origin story of the dragon demon race? They were born from the union of the de-imwitted dragons and the cunning demons. Yes. The answer is right in front of you. The dragons wanted knowledge. What did the demons want? Him. They wanted the dragon's power. As expect, you are dumb, brat Jarras. Since you were spouting some plausible conjectures, for a moment, I thought you were smart. I was foolish for thinking that. The demons desires substance. They thirst for the opportunity to be able to live in this world as true inhabitants of this world. This fundamental reason makes the demons act in such an irrational manner. In what way? They hate the living, yet they thirst to live amongst the living. This thirst was the impetus for them to join with the dragons to create the dragon demon race. Then they started working on obtaining human souls. I understand the first part of your explanation, but you are losing me towards the end. What difference does it make for them to possess human souls? Will they be able to live their lives as humans? That I do not know. Hey, I just know that demons get some sort of satisfaction from gaining a human soul. If you want a more concrete answer, you'll have to risk your life to deal with the demon race. Or you can steal knowledge from the black magicians, who have gained some result from researching the demons. Why did you say steal? For a magician, knowledge is life. Moreover, the black magicians have no problem throwing away morality and duty of being a human. That is why one has no choice, but to steal the information from them. Him. Leon asked a question, while Jarrah's thought about what had been said. What do you think about him? He made us. You aren't talking about him. Do you mean Azel Zestringer? Yes. I have no idea. In the beginning, the evidence pointed him out to be the prophesied being. However, if what we learned from Azel Zestringer is true, it isn't too hard for humans to obtain the power of a dragon. You say it isn't difficult, but you aren't able to do it. Maybe you should just fall on your sword in shame. Humph. Anyways, there were other humans like Azel Zestringer before the Guardian Shadows were created. This is why our initial criteria for finding the prophesied being won't prove that he is a unique existence. Unfortunately, you are right. However, he is special. He is like a demon. In what way? We don't know his identity, and he is overflowing with knowledge of unknown origin. Moreover, 
All the knowledge he revealed was being treated as something sensitive in nature by the dragon demon king worshippers. Him. When you put it like that, I do see the parallel. Do you think he is the person mentioned in the prophecy? Yes. Have you completely made up your mind? Not yet. However, the more I see of him, I feel a sense of longing. Me too. It is as if I've seen him somewhere before. It might be the fact that he looks almost identical to the portrait of Azel Kazak. That might be it. However, there is an echo of a longing inside me for him. It is as if I'm meeting a long-lost family member. Him. Did you live so long that you've become crazy? Did you remember something about your family? Unfortunately, I can only remember that my sister's death was incredibly sad for me. Aside from that, I remember nothing. Leon let out a bitter laugh. He was sure he had a sister he had treasured. He would have given up his life to protect her. However, he had been helpless to save her as he watched her die. The grudge he possessed allowed him to become the guardian shadow's keeper of prophecy. As a price for becoming one, he had lost all memories of her. He couldn't even remember her face. The only thing left was the occasional sound of her laugh that tickled his ears. This sound was the only connection he had to his memories, and it allowed Leon to hold on to his humanity. I don't know what Balseru is thinking. I'm not sure either. I've never been able to discern what Alpha is thinking. Balseru was the keeper of the prophecy, who went to seek out Hazel. He was their leader, and he was given the code name Alpha. This didn't mean he was the first keeper of prophecy. The very first Alpha had perished, and Balseru smoothly assumed that position. He was considered to be unique even amongst the keepers of the prophecy. Leon was supposed to go, but he had received a severe injury. Alpha had gone in his stead. He went to confirm an important fact. Alpha hadn't moved even when they had mobilized a dragon to test Azel. So Leon wonder why Alpha insisted taking on this task. However, Leon predicted that the meeting between Alpha and Azel would be an important watershed moment. Maybe we are all. The end to our existence might be getting closer. I hope you are right. Still, I don't think your expectations will come true. Jarrah's grumbled. Chapter 122. Spectres from the Past. Part 2. Azel was now completely acclimatized with the dragon weapon named Vitten's Chalice. He didn't feel any discomfort at the prospect of using the Vitten's Chalice in battle. He even sparred Chiron who had become frustrated at his absence from the sparring sessions. Leticia spoke. It was frightening and unbearable to see a man-child, who's over 100 years old, throw a tantrum. Thankfully the nanny came back from his vacation. Ha ha ha. I thought you enjoyed it. I won't deny that fact, but that man doesn't need to know the extent of my enjoyment. Leticia snorted. Chiron sparred with Azel until he was exhausted and he went away to wash himself. From that point on, Leticia started to spar with Azel. Azel had focused his attention on Vitten's chalice for a good amount of time, so he was a bit impatient at that moment. The sword lightly exchanged blows with the spear as if they were probing each other. Then their exchanges kept increasing in speed. The speed had increased so much that a normal person wouldn't be able to follow what was occurring. Then they released their magical energy. A battle between Spirit Order and the Dragon Arts had started. As they were exchanging mental waves in a remarkable manner, Leticia let out a sharp stab with her spear. When it looked as if her cross spear was about to clash against Azel's dragon sword, Azel accelerated as he tilted himself. He used his shoulder armor to hit the shaft of the spear. As the spear was thrown off its path, he stopped on a dime to do a roundhouse kick. His attack had totally caught her by surprise, but Leticia remained calm. She jumped into the air as she avoided the kick. Her body spun in the air as she aimed for Azel's head with the part of her spear, which held no edge. Instead of deflecting or dodging, he dashed towards her again. At the same time, his body blurred. She faced with two opponents coming at her from both sides. She couldn't differentiate between the clone and the real body. I was wondering when you'll use that. Are you planning on attacking in earnest? A white frigid energy rose up from Leticia's body. She knew Azel's clones possessed substance. This was why it was pointless to waste energy in figuring out which one was the real one. 
She'll just seal the movement of both of them. The cold air exploded forth, and the surrounding froze. Leticia was about to retreat backwards as she used a linked attack. However, she saw something unbelievable before she could do anything. How did you do that? Azel had pierced through the cold air, and the tip of his sword was right in front of her nose. She had just caused the explosion of cold air, so she assumed she had bought a moment of reprieve. When she started to move, he took her by surprise. She had experienced all sorts of hardships through battle, yet she couldn't do anything against his attack. Azel spoke as he put away his sword. You didn't try to discern which was the real body. You were decisive, but you shouldn't put too much trust in your area of effect attack. A tough opponent can just brute force his way through, and an opponent with good senses can read the flow of power to avoid it. You still haven't answered by question. It was simple. I knew your dragon arts had the property of coldness. I just needed to change the property of my magical energy to match yours. This was the same as the insulation method he used against an opponent, who enjoyed using electric attack. He wrapped himself with magical energy, which had the property of coldness. An attack of this strength wouldn't be able to harm him. Leticia flinched in surprise when she heard Azel continue to speak. You shouldn't use this method against high-ranking magicians. You probably had a lot of fun using it against spirit order practitioners and the dragon arts practitioner. Moreover, there are others out there that can change the properties of magical energy like me. Azel's voice emanated from behind her. Soon, the Azel in front of her dissipated, and she was struck dumb by a realization. Incarnation. I've heard about it, but now that I've experienced it for myself, it leaves me flabbergasted. Azel had pointed his sword in front of her face, yet it had only been the clone created using the Dance of Shadow. He had also used this method against Niberus before. His clone possessed the property of the element used by his opponent. While his clone conducted a surprise attack, he hid his real body in an attempt to find the next opportunity to attack. Azel spoke. I guess not many people uses this technique anymore. Is this the same in the plane of darkness? It holds true there to my knowledge. I wasn't able to climb too high in their hierarchy, so I can't be sure. Him. Even during the Dragon Demon War, there were hardly anyone who used the incarnation technique. A much smaller pool of people were able to use it in a proficient manner. Aside from Azel, there had been only three people who were able to use incarnation in a proficient manner. There was the Alliance's best technician and Verton Knight Duke Qua Nidal. The rest were Almeric, who was one of the four Dragon Demon Generals, and Dragon Demon King Atain. Well, it was a technique that was very discerning on who could use it. Aside from the difficulty of the technique, there were other criteria that determine which users could use the technique. Even if one was able to do the incarnation, it didn't mean the user was always stronger than the others. Azel spoke. Anyways, now that I've fought you, it made me feel more confused. What are you talking about? Your dragon demon key is really. It's similar to the one I know. Didn't you say your teacher was a dragon demon named Rishu? Yes. He was my fourth teacher. You had a lot of teachers. There were five in total. Well, it is a bit dubious to call that old man a teacher. Azul's fourth teacher was dragon demon Rishu. Rishu's status was a bit ambiguous, since he was neither an enemy nor an ally. Then there was Duke Kwa Nidal. He was Azul's fifth and last teacher. Leticia asked a question. You said the dragon demon named Rishu taught you how to handle the power of dragons. What did you mean by that? Is it my turn to receive questions from you? If I don't start getting some answers in return, it feels as if I'm sustaining too much of a loss. I'll acknowledge that. Him. Rishu was a first generation dragon demon. A first generation dragon demon. Those who walk on this land without parents. I guess some call them that. They possess peerless power when compared to the other dragon demons. From Azul's memory, no one was more powerful than Rishu in terms of dragon demon magic. If one was measuring only the quantity of dragon demon magic one possessed, even dragon demon King Atain was weaker than Rishu. Rishu's use of power was almost identical to the dragon's, so he didn't have to use techniques of the dragon arts. He could use his will to wield his power, 
and he was able to produce calamitous results. Isn't he the type of being able to wield his power using just his sense? He was. Well, when he acted as a teacher for me, he learned a lot of technique from me. Afterwards, he changed a lot, but his fundamental characteristics remained the same. Did he use a weapon? No, he always insisted that his body was the best weapon for him. Yes, the difference becomes more stark as you speak. From my memories, I've never seen my teacher use powerful dragon demon magic. He might have been strong, but he never revealed it to me. Moreover, he never wasted his power unnecessarily. For example, he gave me a drill where I had to receive drops of water. You participated in a drill where you had to receive drops of water. It is a training where I stab quickly with my spear. The blade of spear won't disperse the falling drops of water, and my spear would receive the drops of water intact. This is only possible if one is able to finally control one's magical energy. Why are you making such an expression? No, it's nothing. Him, you said you learned how to control the power of dragons. What does that entail? It is as the words imply. Originally, humans do not possess dragon demon magic. Isn't that right? Of course. When a human awakens to one's magic, one develops a new sense and power. One has to through a lot of hardship to train it. Let us say one trains in the magical energy until it's like controlling a limb. What if this existing power if changed into a completely different power? What will happen? Him. Leticia spoke after thinking over his words for a moment. Your senses will become confused since it's used to handling normal magical energy. That's right. This is the inevitable trap for those who gain dragon demon magic through the dragon slayer's ritual. On top of that, it isn't as if one's magical energy converts into dragon demon magic in an instantaneous manner. The properties of magical energy slowly takes on the properties of dragon demon magic. This adds to the difficulty. If one thinks of developing magical energy as growing a new limb, then the magical energy changing into dragon demon magic is like one's limb turning into something different and weird. Of course, the performance of this limb is better, but what if an extra joint, a finger or the range of motion appears? Even now Azul's magical energy had not changed entirely into dragon demon magic. From Azul's experience, it would take at least two more dragon slayers ritual to completely change his magical energy into dragon demon magic. He would have to go through the process of completely processing the power of the dragons. If one is sloppy in the process of gaining dragon demon magic, one's own senses could become out of joint. What would you do if that occurred? I would try to expand my normal senses, and I'll put my effort into learning how to wield a new weapon. It is as I've said before. You are very outstanding in terms of understanding techniques. Don't treat me as if I'm your student. You are only a young human. It was an innocent compliment. Anyways, that's the problem. When one obtains a new power, one had to maintain one's prior senses as one expanded control over the power. This allows one to be able to take advantage of the merit of the new power as one became stronger. However, it isn't enough. The feel of the techniques has to be built back up from the bottom. When he obtained the dragon demon magic for the first time, Azel had used the dragon demon magic to increase the efficacy of his techniques. For example, when he normally tried to make a flame sword, he coated his magical energy over the blade. This was done so his blade wouldn't lose its edge from the fire. Then he had to make sure a constant energy was provided as fuel for the flame. He had used a combination of these two magic conjuration to form the flame on the outside. However, after he acquired the dragon demon magic, he could directly create a flame over the sword. Rishu asked me why I used such an idiotic method. When Rishu saw the result of Azel's technique, he had a puzzled expression on his face. He asked why Azel hadn't created a flame that doesn't damage the edge of the sword. It sounded ridiculous. What do you think about his idea? From my point of view, he gave a logical response. Of course, it is possible to do that. This is the difference between someone who was born with the dragon demon magic and a person who had acquired it. Would he really be able to create a flame that burned one's target, while the blade remained unburnt? The users of magical energy thought about protecting the item before setting the item on fire. 
On the other hand, the users of Dragon Demon Magic just made a flame that didn't burn selected targets. It sounded ridiculous, but one could create this phenomena using just one's will. One could use image making to achieve the desired result. Rishu taught me about my problems, so I had to rebuild my techniques from the ground up. While I was doing this, Rishu learned as many systematized techniques he could. Basically, it wasn't a one-sided relationship. Are you saying you guys were each other's teacher? It was like that for Rishu and the old man, who was my fifth teacher. Azel smiled as he reminisced over the past. His fifth teacher was Duke Kwa Nidal. At the time, he was known as the living encyclopedia in the world of spirit order. He possessed expansive knowledge, and at the same time, he had the skill to utilize all the techniques. At the time, Azel had been learning any techniques he could scrounge up. When Azel met him, he was able to find learn about the frightening power of learning techniques, while having a clear-cut route to his skills. As recompense, Azel taught him about handling dragon demon magic. Kwa Nidal was advanced in age, so he had been very set in his ways. However, he was able to gain enlightenment. He even came up with the technique where one was able to use multiple dragon demon weapons at the same time. It had been something only the dragon demon King Atain could do up until that point. Azel didn't give much details on Kwa Nidal to Leticia. Still, she was surprised just from the fact that he had been a better technician than Azel. They are quite interesting figures. Could you perhaps tell me what the dragon demon named Rishu looked like? Chapter 123 Spectres from the Past. Part 3. They are quite interesting figures. Could you perhaps tell me about what the dragon demon named Rishu looked like? His hair color was very unique. It was a metallic blue color. It isn't a color that appears normally amongst humans. No, it is hard to find such coloring even amongst the dragon demons. What about your teacher? He has black hair. He definitely isn't the one from my memories. Still, the more I see of your dragon arts it reminds me of Rishu. This also applies to your training method. Him, I'm talking about the training method where one receives the drops of water. I taught Rishu the drill. Of course, I told Rishu to do it with his kicks. What an interesting coincidence. Well, it is a training method easily devised by anyone. I guess it can happen. Moreover, Rishu could have taught the drill to someone else, while Azel was asleep. Maybe Leticia's teacher learned it from Rishu. Still, Azel couldn't stop thinking about it. Leticia's martial arts, the way she used her dragon arts and the basic philosophy she followed was almost identical to the last time he saw Rishu. If she was completely unrelated to him, she wouldn't make him have such a visceral reaction. Of course, it could just be a coincidence. Azel let out a bitter laugh. He was obsessing over this problem, because he wanted to meet Rishu if he was still alive. Rishu was a dragon demon, who hadn't paid attention to the dragon demon war. If one factored in the fact that he was a first-generation dragon demon, he could still be alive. Azel wanted to meet him. Azel had been thrown into the future by himself. It was a span of 220 years. Of course, he would obsess over someone, who had lived in the same era as him. Azel's party was moving at high speed. It had been 10 days since he acquired the white dragon armor. The party followed the guide's instruction and they traveled in a straight line for 400 kilometers. They were able to find another ruin left behind by Carlos. At this point, Azel's emotions was so complicated it was beyond expression as he looked urine. After the white dragon armor, I expected to find some kind of amazing magical instrument. It's a skill manual. The item preserved in this ruin was a form of training method. Carlos thought manifestation gave an explanation. The old man Nidal gave this to me for safekeeping instead of leaving behind a will. He said you didn't wake up before his death, so he said he had one. He wants you to come to his grave later, and he wants you to declare yourself the loser. At that moment, it felt as if Azel's blood was flowing backwards. Unfortunately, he didn't have a place to vent his anger. That old man is really. The relationship of Azel and Kwa Nidal could be described as them being each other's teacher. Their first meeting occurred when they were at a drinking party. As soon as they met, they started speaking words in an attempt to annoy the other. 
It escalated into them exchanging blows with their swords. After the end of the fight, they acknowledged each other. They had given recognition to each other for their skills, but they hadn't developed a close relationship. They didn't become comrade in arms. Kwa was the one who started it. On the next day, he came looking for Azel, and he showed off a technique in front of Azel. Kwa sneered as he spoke to Azel. You are gifted for someone so young, but I bet you can't do this. You are a valuable talent of the Alliance Force, so if you bow down to me, I might teach you this technique. Azel had become angry. He had lived through all sorts of hardship, and he had learned all kinds of techniques from his four teachers. These were skills that couldn't be replicated by others. He immediately showed off a technique as a counterattack. I acknowledge that your techniques are incredible. However, the times are changing, old man. If we are talking about the latest techniques of spirit order, it should be of this caliber. If I learn such an old technique, it'll be a net loss for me. However, I have respect for someone that still fights by dragging along his old body. I'll accept the unequal exchange as a sign of respect for you. Shall I teach you what I just did? At that point, the two of them had become angry again. Another fight was inevitable. Afterwards, the two of them tried to outdo each other using all of their might. Every day they kept showing off techniques that would have have made the eyes of normal spirit order practitioners spin. They also argued about martial arts and tactics in battle. It was a petty battle for one's pride, but everyone was flabbergasted when the two of them rapidly increased their skill through these fights. When the Dragon Demon War ended, Azel had won. At the time, they had pretty much bottomed out on what they could show each other, yet Azel had been able to get the final word by teaching Kwa for the last time. His nose had been in the air, since he had won. However, he never expected such a counter-attack after 220 years. Shit, that old man didn't grow up even at his deathbed. Moreover, this is cheating. He didn't make this by himself. He couldn't pay back the old man back for sucker punching him like this. Unlike what he was feeling, the skill manual possessed a very surprising content. I never expected such a method could be used to produce Dragon Demon Key. Azel had explained how to produce Dragon Demon Key to Chiron before. It was something that arose from oneself through spirit order, dragon arts or magic rituals. Humans and dragon magians could accelerate this process through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. There were two ways to shorten this process. First, one could receive help from other dragon demons or dragon magian, who already possessed dragon demon key. This helper had to sacrifice one's own power by pushing it into a person to create dragon demon key. The second way was to use the corpse of a dragon. There was a lot of power stored within the corpse of a dragon. One could bring out this power to accelerate the production of dragon demon key. The manual was talking about a variation of the first method. This training method is a win-win proposition. Originally, the high-ranking spirit order practitioner or magician, who possessed dragon demon magic, had to sacrifice their power by pouring it into a person. However, if he followed the training method in the manual, both sides would benefit. Carlos had constructed a magical circle, and this device would provide the magical energy. This process was used alongside dragon demon key, and it strengthened the dragon demon magic. The participants continuously went through a cycle of acceleration, circulation and amplification. The participants would receive more output of magical energy compared to the amount they put in. Moreover, the person without the dragon demon magic could gradually acquire it. Anyone could come up with this idea, but I would have never expected it to be such a complete product. Moreover, this method increases the dragon demon magic by such a large quantity. This training method was a fusion of spirit order and magic. Kwa Nidal probably came up with the idea, and Carlos took steps to flesh it out. The sensitive part of the process would have needed to have gone through countless experiments to iron out the kinks. Azel immediately gathered his party members, and he tried out the training method. He brought out the sword that splits the heavens and the Vitan's chalice. He recruited Laura to participate alongside the two dragon weapons and the result was. Everyone became surprised at the efficacy of the method. This is incredible. 
Azel was astonished. The efficacy of the training method increased depending on the participants. Aside from urine, everyone either possessed dragon demon key or they were born with natural dragon demon magic. At this pace, I might be able to summon the sword that splits the sky without an aid. I won't have to summon it through the dragon sword. It even accelerated his digestion of the dragon's power he took using the dragon slayer's ritual. Laura spoke. It seems I have the least to gain here. She barely gained anything from this training method. In truth, the vessel that holds her power within her body was almost complete. She would continue to grow in terms of becoming more proficient in technical aspects of being a magician, but she shouldn't expect her dragon demon magic to grow much. This was the same for Chiron. This training method could only accelerate the process of him making his own dragon weapon. Azel spoke. I don't think so. Why? You'll be able to make your own dragon weapon. Laura's expression turned a bit peculiar. Azel asked in puzzlement. What's wrong? It is nothing. I just never thought about it. Ha! Huh. I've always only thought about becoming the inheritor of the Vitten's chalice. If one became the heir of Ornsaurus, one had to inherit the Vitten's chalice. This was why she hadn't even had the choice of making a dragon weapon through putting in her own effort and time. Laura mumbled to herself in a dumbfounded manner. I see. I can make my own dragon weapon. It was an obvious truth, so he found it amusing that she had just realized it. Laura burst into laughter. Azel grinned as he asked her a question. I can't believe you hadn't thought about that. Did you never get to make decisions for yourself? Yes. Not at all. If I look hard enough, I could find minor decisions I had made before on my own. However, all the big decisions were made by my family. Laura hadn't been ordered to look for it, yet she had looked through the old records during her own free time. She also chose to look up and speak to the nameless elder. She had made her own decisions in those instances. Still, even as she had those thoughts, she knew her freedom of choice had been within the restrictions placed on her by her family. She wasn't told what she could do during her free time, but she was told which activities were forbidden to her. If I think about it, the only real choice I made in my life was to follow you, as El Zestringer. You are making a strange expression. What? Laura had spoken those words as she tilted her head. Azel furrowed his brows. Laura started to speak again. I know I'm putting you in a tough spot. I'm not sure why you are feeling that way. Did something within my story make you uncomfortable? Is that how I look to you? Yes. I see. Azel let out a bitter laugh. If anyone else other than Laura had seen his expression, they would have been able to identify the expression on his face. Azel had been feeling pity towards her. She can't even identify. I guess she really did only live her life as a tool. As time passed, he didn't know how he should treat her. It made him confused. Moreover, Laura wasn't the only one where he didn't know how he should act. Wouldn't it be better if you just followed us out in the open? I can rent you a room. Azel had approached a man camping 100 meters away from the inn where Azel's party was staying. The man wasn't asleep. He was sitting in front of the campfire as he ate the soup he had made. He was the Guardian Shadow's keeper of prophecy. After their first meeting, Balseru kept a fixed distance away from Azel's party as he followed them. Unlike the other Guardian Shadows, he didn't mask his presence. However, when he didn't move, his presence disappeared like a ghost. So there were times when Azel almost lost track of him. Balseru spoke. Thank you for the suggestion but I'll have to decline. Why? Are you afraid I'll stab you in the back? No. I don't want to stab you in the back. What do you mean by that? If I'm close, I'll be able to see the members of your party. It'll be hard for me to suppress my killing intent. I know myself too well. He spoke those words, but Balseru's expression and voice didn't show any signs of emotion. His lack of emotions was almost at the level of Laura, and it felt as if there was a big gulf between them. Suddenly, Balseru spoke. Him. I have to thank you for giving us the information. We are putting it to good use. Have you destroyed some of the waypoints for the road of emptiness? Currently, we destroyed two locations. My comrades will probably attack the rest in between their travels. Azel and Chiron told Balseru about the road of emptiness. 
The guardian shadows were unreliable as messengers. But this wasn't true for the keepers of the prophecy. Balseru contacted the keepers of the prophecy scattered all over the continent, and they confirmed if Laura's information was true. Then they started their attack. Azel wondered out loud. You guys were only able to take down two. I thought you guys are able to swiftly exchange information. Still, there is a limit on how fast we can move. You have already seen this, but there are some keepers of prophecy, who aren't that good in a fight. Don't you guys have the members of the Guardian Shadows? Why don't you ask them for cooperation? Are you perhaps trying to prevent them from finding out about the keepers of the prophecy? That isn't it. We live different lives from them. They are in a delicate situation. What do you mean by that? Chapter 124. Spectres from the Past. Part 4. What do you mean? They are living their lives as members of society, so there are cases where we can't mobilize some of our members. For example, what happens if there was an uprising of monsters in a certain region, and it required the member to take care of the region for an extended amount of time? Him. This truth could be discerned by looking at Chiron and Biorin. The Guardian Shadows had a preference for picking members, who had influence over society. In terms of martial prowess, they didn't need much help, but they needed members, who could carry out their work as members of society. In recent days, everyone is tied down in taking care of their own responsibilities. Anyways, we are doing our best. I see. So why do you keep following me? Are you trying to confirm that I am the person from the prophecy? That is one of them. So that isn't your only aim. What other goals do you have? If Regus does show up, I'm pretty sure he will appear in front of you. I look forward to it. You look forward to it. Azel furrowed his brows. If it was as Balseru had said last time, the Keepers of Prophecy had fought with Regus's undead form, and they had been crushed. Yet Balseru was looking forward to it. Will you be able to defeat Regus's undead form? If not, are you planning on fighting Regus with us as a united front? Since he is an undead, I'll be able to take care of him by myself. Azel stared at Balseru. Something really bothered Azel about him. He knew the other man was a spirit order practitioner, but Azel couldn't read the depth of his power. Normally, he would consider such a person to be formidable. However, Azel couldn't make the call yet. He had a weird feeling about Balseru. Balseru spoke. However, yes, if there are others aside from the undead, it might be hard for me to defeat them. In such a situation, I would like to work with your party. At the very least, when we are fighting the Dragon Demon King worshippers, we can be sure that we are allies. Let us do that. Still, our movements haven't been revealed to our enemies yet. Maybe, if you are thinking about the possibility of me leading the enemies to you, I won't. I don't do such acts. Him. I've shown myself the least amongst the keepers of the prophecy. They probably don't even know what my code name is. You code name. Now that I think about it you guys use the ancient alphabet like Delta and Theta. What is your code name? Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Xi, Omicron, Pi, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon, Phi, Chi, Psi and Omega. The keepers of the prophecy used the 24 ancient alphabets, which existed before the legend of Babel, as their code names. It was also letters frequently used by magicians when they conducted a magic ritual. Balseru answered, I'm Alpha. If you are Alpha, you are the first letter in the ancient alphabet. Is your code name related to seniority? Yes. Are you allowed to just give out such answers like this? We decided we could tell you a certain amount of information. I'm thankful that you hold me in such high regards. So you are the first amongst the keepers of the prophecy. Doesn't that contradict with your previous story? Which story? You said you quit being a knight around 50 years ago. If you became a keeper of the prophecy at that point in time, you became one during the great darkness. Doesn't that mean you became one much later than Leon? Correct. Then your story doesn't match. I inherited the code name when the original Alpha died. My memory of that person is fuzzy, but I think he was my uncle. You think. What do you mean by that? I don't remember much from before I became a keeper of the prophecy. 
It might be the fact that my body had suffered through death. I believe it is the cost for being revived as a keeper of the prophecy. Him, it seems Leon hadn't discussed this with you. All the keepers of prophecy used to be humans. We are existences that were raised from the dead. You guys were raised from the dead. Do you really want me to believe such nonsense? I understand it sounds preposterous. Still, is it so absurd when one takes in the fact that we don't age? Him, the dragon demon king is a murderer, and we were killed while holding a grudge against him. At the moment of our deaths, the nucleus of the magic making up the guardian shadows made contact with us. We were revived, or that is what we think happened. We were revived from death by some means or other. Some means or other. Aren't you guys being a little bit too loose on the facts? Those of us, who were originally magicians, are divided in opinion. We aren't able to come to a consensus no matter what. The non-magicians amongst us just accept the situation as is. In the end, the only thing that is important to us is the slaughter of dragon demon king worshippers. We don't care about anything else. Ha! A forced laugh leaked out of Azel. This guy was really an absurd bastard. He kept revealing incredible facts, yet he was serene. It was as if he was talking to a neighbor about an unimportant matters. You said you lost your memories. Yes, I have no memories of my previous life. We only know about the reason why we are doing these tasks. Aren't you, at the very least, suspicious? About what? Aren't you suspicious of that fact that someone might have manipulated all of you? They had no memories of their past. They had no idea who had made him that way. They didn't even know what criteria allowed him to become keepers of the prophecy. They were completely ignorant of their own situation, yet they followed the truths that came to them on an instinctual level. They had become the embodiments of revenge. They possessed the body of a human, yet they had given up being humans. They devoted themselves to eradicating the dragon demon king worshippers. Aren't you suspicious about the possibility that this is all a fabrication made through magic? I never thought about it. You expression is asking how I can be so foolish. You speak as if you can see me. I can see you. Even though you have your eyes closed. I'm not blind. Even if my eyes are closed, it doesn't interfere with my sight. Anyways, that is how it is. When we became the keepers of the prophecy, we were given an offer by an unknown being, and we made a choice. We remember making our choice, so we have no doubt. Is that really enough? Yes. Do you want us to become suspicious of the process? Wouldn't that in turn make us deny our own existence? I have no desire to do so. Are you afraid of doing so? No. I just. I believe in the evidence provided by my hatred. Hatred. Funnily enough, I can't feel anything. This conversation I am having with you feels like a daydream. However, when he was in front of the dragon demon king worshippers, he could feel that he was still alive. The hatred he had for them burned. It awoke him to the fact that he was still alive and breathing in this world. Azel now identified the madness he had felt when he saw Leon. These people really had lost everything. The elements that used to make up the identity of these people were all snatched away by the dragon demon king worshippers. The only thing left behind were empty dolls that were driven by hatred. Who made this system? The curiosity he felt for this truth was almost unbearable. How much enmity did the creator of the guardian shadows have that he went down this ruthless road? Balseru spoke. This is my warning to you, Sir Azel. Regus will come looking for you. How do you know this? According to Laura, there is someone amongst them that has the ability to find you. At the very least, we know that fact. You speak as if you are a soothsayer. I'm something akin to that. What? When Azel became surprised, Balseru answered in a calm manner. Amongst the 24 keepers of the prophecy, only two of us has a fixed role. Alpha and Omega. The name has nothing to do with when we became a keeper of the prophecy. The one named Omega can catch a glimpse of what the plane of darkness is doing. They keep track of their members through the being, who resides in the great darkness. We are able to learn about what power they possess and what they are going to do. Basically, you are using their information network against them. It isn't as clear-cut as you make it out to be. In truth, it isn't that helpful. We don't know the content or the timing of the information we will receive. However, 
Once we learn of an information, we are sure of its veracity. I always have this thought. Azel was astonished. I can't tell if you guys are amazing or extremely poorly run. The world is an inconvenient place where there isn't a clear-cut answer. Balseru answered in a disinterested manner. As soon as Azel walked away, Balseru spoke as he looked between the trees. You should come out now, Omega. He is far away enough. Still, I'll be discovered if I'm not careful. Soon, a voice of a young girl could be heard. Accompanying a rustling sound, a girl appeared from between the trees and bushes. If Azel saw this sight, he would have been shocked. She had been so close, yet she had been able to evade Azel's senses. The girl looked to be 15 or 16 years old. From her appearance, she didn't look too special. Since she had been hiding in the bushes, she was dirty. Her hair was tied in twin tails, and her hair was disheveled. She had a plain-looking face with freckles. The only thing unusual about her was her green eyes. She was looking straight at Balseru's face, yet her eyes were out of focus. It was as if she couldn't see. Moreover, her sense of presence was absent like Balseru. It was understandable to see why Azel failed to notice her. Balseru spoke as he filled a bowl with soup. Does it matter if he finds out about you? At the very least, we aren't enemies with him right now. Still, he really hates us. That is true. I don't like being hated. At the very least, I don't want him to look at me like that. I'll decline. Is it because he might be the person from the prophecy? Yes. Omega took the bowl of soup from Balseru as she nodded her head. Omega's eyes were out of focus, so it looked as if she was looking into the empty air. However, she had no problem receiving the bowl. If he is the person from the prophecy, I have to give my everything to him. I don't want to do something like that to someone that hates me. I think every one of us are already hated by him. That is why I won't show myself until it is necessary. Unlike you, I don't move in a herd with the other keepers of the prophecy. I don't want him to hate me as an individual. Omega drank the soup after she said those words. Balseru spoke. You still cling to your romantic ideals. Unlike you, I even lost my name. Omega Kamli spoke about her loss. It didn't matter what order she joined as the keeper of the prophecy. She was given the last code name. Of course, she didn't remember her past, but she also didn't remember her name. Balseru spoke. Well, you'll find out about it soon enough. How do you know this? I just have a hunch. You are speaking as if you were a soothsayer. I don't know about anything else, but my hunches are almost always correct. It has been so for 50 years, so you can put some trust in it. Is that why you gathered everyone? Yes. Balseru nodded his head. This was the end to the conversation between the two. Within the silence, it was as if the two assimilated into the landscape. Their presence were buried within the stillness. Chapter 125. Spectres from the Past. Part 5. The plain of darkness was large. It was a land of demons unsullied by the hands of humans. Within this vast piece of land, the Dragon Demon King worshippers had gathered around the Dragon Demon Palace left behind by Atane. They used the castle as base as they expanded outwards. They had used humans slaves to build buildings, and now there was a small kingdom within these lands. This place was a frozen land. Unless there was a good reason to live here like them, no one would live in such an infertile land. No one would want to build a civilization here. Everything was frozen year-round, and when there was a blizzard, even those with superhuman powers declined to travel far. The snow was coming down. If one looked out into the plain of darkness, an incredible amount of snow had fallen. It made one's jaw fall wide open. If someone tried to walk through this, the person would become a snowman within dozen steps. However, there was someone walking through the snow right now. It was an odd sight. The person buried under the one meter of snow wasn't human. A being that looked like a pile of snow was plowing forward. You were cute, Ragus. There was a faint illusion-like figure floating around the large pile of snow. The silhouette of a person within the falling snow made the figure look like an ice fairy. Ragus, who had become a pile of snow, gave a reply. Cute. What about me is cute? The fact that you don't know you are cute makes you more cute. 
I think you became cuter in death. If I wasn't married to the king, I probably would have wanted to be in your embrace. Alas, it is a dream that can never be fulfilled. Too bad. Your thoughts has become more unfathomable after death, Queen Kealia. Him. I thought about it for a long time, but I want you to drop the formality. Don't call me by my title as queen. I've been dead for a very long time, so I don't want to be called by my title as queen. The white silhouette chortled as she laughed. If one looked at the figure bobbing up and down in the snow, one would see a 14 or 15 year old girl in human standards. However, she had white blonde hair that looked to have been melted out from the snow, and one could see a bolder grey coloured horn protruding from between her hair. Her ears were long and the back of her hand had a slate grey coloured dragon demon stone. It was the same colour as her eyes. Regus brushed the snow away from his face as he spoke. Then what do you want me to call you by? Just call me Kealia. In exchange, I'll call you Opa. What do you say? It is such an attractive offer that I won't be able to say no to your request. All right, Kealia. Yes, Regus Opa. Oh, that has a beautiful ring to it. Still, you really do speak a lot for a dead person. This is especially true compared to when you were alive. Your guess is as good as mine as to why. Anyways, you are the only one that can see and hear me. The best way to drive away loneliness is to talk. Couldn't you choose to speak to others even if it isn't me? I have to use those opportunities sparingly. If possible, I have to keep my existence a secret. That is why I have to think hard on who I can converse with. It is coming into sight. Suddenly, Regus spoke. He could see the majestic sight of the dragon demon castle across the hill. Kealia had been one of queens married to the dragon demon king Atain 220 years ago. She looked at the dim figure of the dragon demon castle as she asked a question. Is that place similar to the towns we saw along the way? It is worse. I see. Ain Sarah Uni was always a strict person. She has become much more rigid in her ways, so I can see why things are like this under her rule. You are still calling her honey. Of course. She hates it. You are still quite twisted. The fact that you haven't changed even in your death is a good thing. The fact that Opa can say such words makes you sound more twisted than me. Anyways, we fought to create a really boring world. The king had wanted this, and I wonder if I automatically agreed to it just because he wanted it. Please don't speak such words in places where others can hear you. Many people within the castle worship him as if he was a god. A god. I'm not thrilled about that either. Well, I always did hate all of them. Now that I have no responsibility I can be free to show my disdain towards them. Kealia laughed like an immature human girl. For a while, Regus had left the dragon demon castle, and he had toured the plane of darkness. He had wanted to see how much the world had changed, but his real goal was to find Kealia, who was stuck to him now. Atain had prepared a contingency plan for her too. The plane of darkness had been isolated from the world 220 years ago. It was a microcosm of the world they had wanted to create through the Dragon Demon War. The Dragon Demons ranked at the top, the Dragon Majin was placed at the middle, and the humans were placed at the bottom. The atmosphere around such a society wasn't anything too special. The religious zealots had made a deep impression on the society, and the human societies were seen as replaceable spare parts. No, in truth, everything had become worse. Atain had become deified, and the zealots had created an excessively static society. As time passed, an irrational madness was being added to the mix, and the members of the society didn't resist against it. They silently conformed to it. Everything was always the same. We all despaired at that fact. In truth, I thought it sounded like a pipe dream even in the past. First, the dragon demon race are in the wrong right now. They took only the parts they liked about the king's ideals, and they made their own extreme interpretations. Kealia knew the entirety of Atain's plan, since she closely aided Atain. She understood him. This was why she knew that the system adopted by the current plane of darkness was far from what Atain's plan intended. She sighed at this fact. When one makes a group, it is the nature of life to divide the group based on their merits and demerits. 
The dragon demons are clearly superior to the humans as a species. It is logical to put them in the ruling class. This would control the ambitions of the dragon demons, since they would have to carry out an increasing load of tasks to maintain the society. This in turn would develop respect for them from the members of the society. In this society, humans will all be considered to be equal. They won't have to go through the pains of dealing with differences in station, wealth or physical stature. There would be no reason why humans would look down on other humans. This was the basic outline of Atine's plan. At a glance, the society built within the plane of darkness looked similar to his plan. However, it was completely different once one saw the details. In the current plane of darkness, the dragon demons held the same position as human nobles. They held most of the power, and they considered humans to be of low rank. Human were considered to be inferior to them. Even worse, the dragon demons further divided themselves based on bloodlines and origin. In doing so, they were acting in the same way as the humans. Atain hadn't chosen the ruling class for this purpose. The only part that coincided with the original plan was the fact that they were running the society. Still, now that she thought about it, the ruling class consisting of the dragon demon race was an illusion that couldn't exist in the real world. I'm curious about something, Opa. What is it? During the war, didn't we believe this was the answer that would eradicate sadness from this world? We did. When Kaalia talked about the boring world, she was talking about societal structure of the plane of darkness. It was devised as an answer to Atine's plan for an ideal society. It was also the result of his followers interpreting his words as they pleased. Atain and the dragon demon generals had thought this rank structure would eradicate all sadness and tragedy from this world. Had they been wrong, Kaalia sat on Regus's shoulder as she mimed putting her chin on her hands. Do you think things would have been different if the king won and he had a direct hand in ruling them? I'm not sure. In the end, if the king was able to realize his goal, I don't think it would have turned out all too differently. Do you think he would have acknowledged his failure? I thought I knew everything about the humans, yet I didn't know anything about them. This is why I will try to learn about them from now on. The king spoke those words. He was so grand. Him, every work he undertook was incredibly large in scale. He achieved great achievements, yet his mistakes were big too. He also caused a lot of harm. This was why I thought he was a bit cute. I'm not sure how you can come to such a conclusion. It's all right. You can continue to not understand me. This is why Opa is a cute person. Regus brushed off the snow on his head as he asked the question. I have a question I want to ask you. What is it? How did you die? Him, I lost in a fight. Opa died before me. So why are you speaking to me in such a tone? Queen Ainsera told me about it. While they escaped from the Dragonhorn Fortress, you went missing along the way. What happened? Jeez, that Uni is really. Kaalia pouted. She threw her body into the air as she spoke. I just hated everything. You hated everything. I wanted to quit everything. I was originally a human. At one time, I thought the human race was the worst, but it was true that there were some I liked amongst them. Kaalia's eyes unfocused as she looked towards her past. She was a Tyne's consort, but she had also been one of his disciples. This was why she was a very special existence amongst the entirety of the Dragon Demon King's army. I continued to do work I hated, because of my station. We fought to erase the sadness from this world, but it looked as if we were causing more people to cry. Azel Opa told me that. Azel Opa, are you perhaps talking about Azel Kazark? Regus was surprised as he looked at Kaalia. That's right. He didn't want me to call him Arjusi, so I call him Opa. You called him that. I wasn't able to call him that in front of him, but that is what I called him inside my heart. Azel Opa. The fact that I had to fight a life and death battle with him made me very sad. Ha! Huh, I didn't know you two had such a relationship. No one knew about it. Him. I never knew you had a hidden story such as this. It is quite interesting. A woman is supposed to have a lot of secrets. I would like to hear the long version of it later. All right. What did he say? He asked me how high I had stacked the mountain of corpses with my hands. He asked me if I knowingly did what I did. It is something we commonly hear. 
isn't it? If it was anyone else, I would have ignored it. However, when that opa said those words, it stabbed right through my heart. He had the eyes of a real hero. He looked like someone who had immediately ran forward to save the world that had been broken by us. At that moment, I realized I shouldn't continue to do what I hate when I could see the result of my actions. Kealia continued to float in the air as she gathered her knees to herself. She spun in the air as snowflakes blew around her. Did you lose on purpose? I didn't lose on purpose. Are you sure? Geez, Opa, you were defeated by him too. So why are you asking such a question? Him, weren't you supposed to be special? At the time, Azel Opa was ridiculously strong. Even the king lost in a bout with him. I didn't lose on purpose. I'm a bit suspicious about that point. You didn't see the true power of Azel Opa. After you died, he continued to grow at a frightening pace. I admit his growth speed was extraordinary. Well, all right, let's set that aside. You didn't have to go missing and die by yourself, right? You speak the truth. However, our defeated army were basically in a trance. It was as if everyone had gone half mad according to the, the words they spoke. I became annoyed when I heard them, so I got out of there. Then I died. If I look back on it, it was such a dumb way to die. I do regret it a little bit. I've thought about it, and I should have come to this place. I should have exited after I secured my safety. However, at the time, I didn't have the presence of mind to. It was only when I died that I came to my sense, and I heard the king's will. So that is how you were able to jump 220 years like me. However, why have you taken on such a form? I didn't want to become an undead. I told him I would hate to become a skeleton. I threw a tantrum saying he should respect a girl's wish. That sounds absurd, but at the same time, it is so like you. He wanted to overwork me even after death. Shouldn't I be able to get my way in such matters? The sound of air exiting Ragus's skull could be heard. It seemed he couldn't break the habit of laughing as if he was still alive. Suddenly, Kealia asked a question. Do you really think Hazel Opa is alive? Maybe. How could this be? I know. I have circumstantial evidences, but I am having a hard time confirming it. If you are planning on meeting him, please arrange it so I can talk to him. I'll go meet him looking very beautiful. I hope you aren't planning on telling me you won't lending me your power when that time comes. I'll think about it. Ah, I'm already dead. I'm free from all obligations. I can choose to help or not. Even the king gave me leave to do what I want. That hopeless guy. Ragus grumbled. Kealia put her face next to his as she spoke. So when are you going to meet him to confirm it is him? Since he exited the reaches of the information network of the plane of darkness, I had to use my own method. I'll be able to find his whereabouts soon. I look forward to it. Ah, what face should I put on when I meet him? I don't care if you don't help me, but please don't betray me. I'll be wounded. I'll see how Opa acts. Kealia stuck out her tongue, and she disappeared as if she melted into the thin air.